a tihe mauri ora. A ko hera taunga ararau, ko hera taunga haukanui, ko hera taunga te haro o te kahu, ko hera taunga takate noa, ko hera taunga ringa hora. A ko te amorangi ki mua, ko te hapae o ki muri, kei te tūturu tanga mahi pono o te Māori mana motohake. E te tū mai ki tēnei te mihi kia kotou, nau mai, haere mai, piki mai, kake mai. Mauri o mai ki tēnei tō koutou whakaaro, ki rangi nui, ki papatūanuku. Kei te hauron te tanga mo tēnei o nga atua, tō kerua. Ka potu mai tāne nui arangi, kei te piki aia ki te rangi tū hā-hā i ngā tihi o ngā manono i roko hine a te rā nei i matu a kore anake. Kei te piki aia ki te kete o te wānanga, ko te kete uri, ko te kete tuatea, ko te kete aranui. Ka tiritiri a ka paupau a, ko papatūanuku, ka putu mai te ira tūna, ki te whai au, ki te au marama, hara mai te toki, haumie, huie, tae ki e. Ah, kei te tū mai ki tēnei te mihi ki tō tātou matanui te rangi, he mihi ki te atua, ki te runga rau. Nāne e homai, nāne he tango, he kroria tō i ngā tapu i ngā wākato. Kei te mihi mo tēnei i ngā mate o te tau o te mārama. Kei te tangi mata, kei te tangi rata, he poroporo āki, he whakaeke mai, ko rātou. E te tūtaki nei i te arai o nga tipuna o nga mātua. Moi mai rā, haere, oki oki. Huri noa, te hunga ora, kei noho mo te nei, nau mai ano ki a kota. E te mihi ki a kota, te nga koe e te kauni hera mo te kora mātua, te nga koe Sandra. Ko kota, nga rangatira kei mua mo te nei, te kore rotia mō tēnei rā. E mihi kaua na kia kotau. E nui ki tēnei te api he tjeki mō tēnei papatūanuku. Kei papatūanuku, kei te naro o papatūanuku, kāre he tipuranga mō tēnei tō tātau whenua o putei ki tēnei o ngā rākau hua whenua hahanoe, hahanoe. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. E mihi ki a koutou mō tēnei wā. Kā rero, e mihi mō tēnei e whakatau, e whakarite, e wātea mō tēnei te tīmatatanga, tō tātou hui huinga mō tēnei rā. Te rā whakanui mō tēnei te kōrero, tia o mātou, kua tā mai, ki tēnei rā. Nā reira, e rauranga tērā mā, Nā whaea, nā tangata mō tēnei. Hei te mihi mō tēnei, e taku hoa kei mua mō tēnei. John, te nā koe. E taua wā, ko koe tēnei, e hoa, māua mō tēnei. Kare e inu haurangi mō tēnei, ki au, kau ko John, ko porangi mō tēnei. E inu. Nā reira, John, hei te mihi kia koe. Ko koutou, ko tā mai, ki tēnei rā. Nā reira, he rauranga tērā mā. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ki oro tātou, katoa. Kei te karakia mō tēnei, te himene, he honere, he kroria. He pūmari e tū. He honore. He kororia mga rongo ki te whenua Whakaaro mai e ki nga taunga takatoa Ake ake, ake ake Amine Te atua Te peringa Toku oranga Toku oranga 
no tata e to mata matu te rangi. E te tū mai ki tēnei tō pōna no te aro aro mō tēnei wā. E paka moi miti e paka peta e ke ako e pā. E te tīmata tanga o mata hui huinga ke te kapi e paka mutenga. E api e tēki nei ki ngā kai kōrero, ngā kai pakawā o tangata mō tēnei wā. E api e tēki mō tēnei o rātou mō tēnei hui mō tēnei wā. No rere e pā, kei te mā wiwi tanga, e ngā kaumātua, paka ke tamariki, ngā mokopuna hoki, kei roto ta hoi pera ta kāinga, ta marae, piki te kaha, piki te ora, piki te mārama tanga e pā. No rere e pā, kei te kotahi tātou, kei runga te hui mō tēnei rā. E ino i nei ke akoe, e ngā wā katoa, ko i hukraiti, kei paka ora, āmene. Kia ora tata, e noho. E karoria ki tātua, he manga rongo ki te whenua, he whakarau pai ki nga tangata katoa. Te nga koe e te kai karakia, e te kai mihi whakatau, Jerry. Tēnā koutou e nga rauranga tērā, e nga tangata whenua, e nga mana heri hoki, kua tai mai ki tēnei wānanga i te kaupapa, o te whenua o heratonga haukanui. Kā nui te mihi manahau ki a koutou katoa. Ko Martin Williams, tuku e noa. My name is Martin Williams. Welcome to our many leaders, uh, to Mayors Hazelhurst and Wise, uh, to our Kaumatua, uh, Jerry, Nahiwi and Baden, uh, to our councillors, uh, business leaders, to everyone. Welcome, thank you uh, for being here today to honour uh, this symposium on such a prescient and pressing topic, uh, the future of our precious soils resource uh, for the region. Uh, just a, a few matters of housekeeping uh, before I hand over to Mayor Hazelhurst to uh, formally welcome you on behalf of Hastings District Council. Uh, to note that this symposium is being recorded uh, and the recording will be distributed next week, so it's not live streamed. There is a, a, a delay there. Um, Restrooms are in the back corner. Whare uh, paku... Uh, over there, um, if an evacuation is required, an alarm will sound, and please leave immediately through the nearest exit. Uh, you can tell I'm reading off the script, I didn't make this up. In the event of an emergency, please follow the direction of Toy Toy staff. Are there any Toy Toy staff here? Put your hand up. All right, we've got at least one uh, present and accounted for. Exits are located behind me, speaker's left, it says. All right, uh, there's certainly uh, exits there and I believe on the other side of the stage. Um, please make yourself familiar with these exits uh, and those nearest. The muster points are behind the New World car park on Hastings Street and the Baker Tilly car park on Eastbourne Street. Do not re-enter the building until the all clear has been given by the Toy Toy front of house manager. Please also note that due to COVID and other unforeseen circumstances, uh, there have been some changes to the program. Now, masks, um, they're free. Uh, so is COVID, so please do feel free to, to and welcome to use them. It may well be the sensible thing to do for your own protection. Um, that may not work so well at morning tea, but then what about COVID uh, actually works? Um, all right, so with those short few introductory housekeeping points, I'd like to welcome uh, Mayor Hazelhurst to the stage uh, to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the Council. Nā mihi nui, Martin. Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai piki mai kaki mai tīhei mauri ora. Tēnā koe, Papa Jerry, great to have our iwi chairs past and present. Nā hiwi and Baden, kia ora. Can I acknowledge all of our councillors that are here today? Councillor Corbyn, thank you for your effort in bringing this symposium to and working so hard to bring this to us today. 
Councillor Kerr, our Deputy Mayor, Councillor Harvey, Councillor Redstone, Councillor Watkins, Councillor Shollum, Councillor Barber, uh, our Regional Councillors, Jonathan uh, Stockley and Marcus Butto, a very warm welcome to you too. Uh, to our industry leaders, thank you for being part of this important day for us. To our members of our community, our planners and all of our industry professionals, thank you for giving up your time today. Uh, this is an extremely important day for us. Mayor Kirsten, can I acknowledge you? This is part of our journey. We started with our um, Heritonga Plains Urban Development Strategy and we're moving to a greater place and that regional strategy is so important to us. I can't see you, Kirsten, where are you? Down the back, oh, you need to be in the front. Um, thank you, and, and also your councillors who are here today, and any regional councillors, great to have Martin M. Singh today. This is truly a collaboration for our region. So thank you for joining the first of a community conversation, how we preserve, how we protect our versatile lands, particularly those of our Heritonga Plains. It is a pleasure for the Hastings District Council to join with Chairman Rick Barker and our colleagues of the Hawke's Bay Regional Council to host this symposium. The purpose of today's symposium is to highlight the value of the plains and some of the pressures and competing demands on our valuable land to highlight how we best protect our fertile soils at the same time as managing our future. The produce that is grown from our land is the key driver of both our Hastings local economy and our wider region. Combined with our fantastic climate, our versatile lands give Hawke's Bay a dominant role in New Zealand's horticultural industry. For example, by area, Hawke's Bay makes up 55% of the land plant in apples across New Zealand. The region is also a major contributor nationally to vegetables, wine, and a number of other types of crops. In the Hastings District, our GDP grew 6.1% in 2021. This is on the back of the high sustained export commodity prices, and much of this growth is attributed to our horticultural sector and the businesses that serve it. Our economic success is underpinned by the great produce grown and processed by our producers and exported to the rest of our world. Its economic value to our region is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. But this economic success also create, creates enormous pressures and threats to the land resource. For instance, the recent record investment in planting apples brings with it an extra demand for processing and cool store capacity. The resulting prosperity workforce needs draws people to the area, command and, and also creating huge demand for housing, residential development and RSE accommodation. Along with these development pressures, impacts arising from climate change and, and production and cropping techniques also creating pressure on our soils. Now it is time for us to focus on how we deal with these pressures to ensure that our versatile land is sustainable. Together with Napier City and the Regional Council, we're about to prepare a future development strategy for the Heritonga Plains area to cover how we will accommodate future growth while protecting our land resources for the future. The five councils of Hawke's Bay will closely work on a regional spatial strategy with our community to build a spatial plan for the entire Hawke's Bay region. These strategies are essential to determining how we will manage growth and protect our soils for the future. Importantly, they will allow our communities to have their say in what is important to them and how these various pressures on our soil resources should be managed. One of the obvious answers to managing growth is more efficient use of existing urban areas. And our council is very pleased to say that Hastings has started on this path already. Last month we adopted a, an updated strategy on more medium density housing. District plan change to make this form into a development will be easier uh, will happen in the next few months. And we need to be encouraging that, and we need to find ways to encourage that, and that's the work that we're currently working on. As we start the future development strategy process, our gathering today is incredibly important to all of us. We will hear from mana whenua, scientists, soil protect practitioners, growers and producers and planners, including some of the people who will share their and feed their expertise into future strategies. 
on what makes soil so special and how we can protect them. Some of these experts will discuss the value of our tonga, our golden goose, that is our Heri Tonga Plains, and the potential risks, threats and impacts of to our tonga, such as those from the development of, and climate change. Producers will share their stories on the bounty of the plains and its value, and we'll also hear about the decision-making frameworks for land use and development affecting our productive and resource and land, special land resource. All of these contributors will help frame our core question, how do we protect our golden goose? I'm really looking forward to today's program. I'll hand over now to Martin to get our symposium underway, and I'm disappointed that a number of our people have COVID and are not here today who did RSVP, but they can watch the uh, streaming uh, at their, in their own time. So thanks once again for enjoy, um, joining us here today. So important to see you all, and um, we hope you have a fantastic, enjoyable day. Just seen Jeriff there, regional councillors. Anybody else that I've missed? Any councillors? Uppy, Councillor Lawson. So um, it's great to see such a, a large representation of all of our councillors here today. This is really, really big mahi for us all. So uh, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Nā mihi nui ki a koe, Sandra, for uh, that warm uh, and embracing welcome. Um, look, I'd firstly like to just congratulate uh, Ross and his team for assembling such a powerhouse panel of speakers uh, assembled here uh, for this incredibly important conversation, uh, Two Hawks Bay's uh, future sustainability. And I will have the pleasure of introducing you to uh, all of those speakers uh, personally and presently as the day unfolds. But before I introduce our first presenter, uh, Nahiwi, Nahiwi uh, Tomoana, I just really wanted to uh, put the issues uh, of today uh, in context. Now, just see if this works. And so context by the numbers, as I uh, suggest on the top of that slide. Why does this matter? What is so important about our versatile soils for the region in the first place? Well, in terms of the first point up there, and speaking to you as a councillor with, uh, on an entity with a 55% shareholding in uh, Napier Port, it certainly matters to me and my colleagues around that council table. Uh, the, the throughput uh, th through the port uh, of primary produce from this region speaks for itself. There is then, as Mayor Sandra touched on uh, most recently, 246 million uh, in Hawke's Bay GDP from horticulture and the fruit growing sector. Uh, you know, who doesn't have a job here that in some way is related directly or indirectly to our rock star amazing pip and stone fruit and viticulture and horticulture sector? Is there anyone here who could say they've got absolutely no connection or derive no benefit from that. All right, no, just kidding, yeah, I can't see any hands up. And, and 199 million from Hastings alone, and that's 12, between 12 and 15% of the national product uh, across those sectors. So that's on the, on the one hand, if you like. But on the other hand, we have a population that's expected to grow in terms of the uh, metrics being worked out for the future development strategy that Mayor Sandra mentioned from 153,000 to 203,000 by 2052. And we compare that to the HPUDS, or Heratonga Plains Urban Development Strategy, which we'll hear more about projections just five years ago. Um, that, that growth uh, d dwarfs, or the most recent predictions dwarf the assumptions uh, in 2020 or 2017 when that review started. We have also now a legislative requirement under the National Policy Statement Urban Development for what's known as a housing bottom line. And it is looking like the projection that Hastings and Napier would need 20,000 new houses by 2050 
again comparing with HPAD's 10,000 uh, projected in the strategy area. So you can already begin to see um, where the pressure comes on. And in recent years, the area of urban New Zealand has increased by 15% from 1996 to 2018, 83% of that being grassland, 9% cropping and horticulture. Just driving south from Auckland yesterday, I, I was struck and through Hamilton by just how massive that encroachment has been over my lifetime in spatial terms. Uh, the area of pr highly productive land rendered unavailable by housing increased by 54% from 2002 to 2019. Now these are nationwide figures. This is not Hawke's Bay, but this is, and this illustrates, a nationwide issue that in part requires a nationwide response. And again, I'll come back to that. And I've taken these figures from the Ministry for the Environment, Our Land Report in 2021. From the earlier report, uh, 2018, from 1990 to 2008, 29% of new urban areas were on class one and two soils. Go figure. Now, a point I'll return to presently for those who bemoan the encroachment over the Hiratanga Plains by housing and other developments in recent years. Well, I suggest we've had it lucky. Our councils have actually fought steadfast and firm to restrain that expansion against a very considerable pressure from a well-resourced development lobby. Believe it or not, I will come back to that. So what are we dealing with? Uh, well, call it what you like, productive land, versatile land, versatile soils, as Mayor Sandra put it, the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, I'm going to focus on versatile land with the definition, I am a lawyer after all, uh, from the Hastings District Plan and also from the Hawke's Bay Regional Policy Statement. There are some key elements of that definition that I think are very important that I've highlighted there. Firstly, the support uh, of a regional and nationally significant primary production uh, sector on the Heratonga Plains based around an exceptionally high proportion of class one to three soils. But noting also other factors in there, it's not just about the soil, it's the spatial arrangement of that land with the strategic resources that support and are sustained by it, proximity to a workforce and uh, processing industries uh, and uh, the port of Napier, as I mentioned earlier, and other transport networks. It's a package, is, is what makes uh, this resource so versatile. Um, now, as I say on the last point there, this resource, and for those reasons, is actually very strongly protected under the district plan. And despite what I think are uh, some actually um, some quite common mis misapprehensions and, and very strong concerns on the point. And why so, so strongly protected in the district plan? Well, I can do no better than quote in full from Hastings' most uh, publicly derived uh, document, uh, the district plan itself. And I've set out there some words, I won't read them all, but just some of the, some of the themes that come through this district plan as, as to, to the rationale. The soils that characterise this versatile land are nationally significant and provide maximum flexibility in terms of the type of crops that can be grown. And it's that flexibility that will ensure that land-based primary production will be able to respond rapidly to changing technologies. In the next paragraph, the community has signalled that the protection of this land is of paramount importance. Uh, through the process of drafting the plan, or the Heratonga Plains uh, Urban Development Strategy, there was significant support for preventing further encroachment onto versatile land, and so the district plan will continue its policy of protecting that uh, for the purposes of food production and for uh, future generations. And as section 6.2 of the district plan says, the Plains Production Zone recognises the growing powerhouse of the district. If we scoot up to one level upstairs or sideways perhaps over to Napier to the regional policy statement, this has a policy uh, linking to the Hiratonga Plains urban development strategy of avoiding inappropriate lifestyle development and ad hoc residential development. And the courts have confirmed, our Supreme Court has confirmed that that word avoid is itself a very powerful word. It's quite simple. It means prevent 
the occurrence of, not allow. So, in, as to a principal reason, it's to protect the productivity, the productivity of rural land. So that's what we're that's what we're talking about here. And I guess, in spatial terms, we have uh, the prototype of uh, quite a forward-thinking strategic document uh, that was uh, entered into between uh, Napier City Council, Hastings District Council and Hawke's Bay Regional Council first in 2010, HPUDS, uh, Heritonga Plains Urban Development Strategy, which really is the framework for that, that policy uh, expression in the district plan and the regional policy statement, which you'll hear a lot more about from speakers to follow. But the basic model of Heratonga, of the HPUDs, which covers that area there shown in green, is it's, it's a preferred settlement pattern of compact design, defined growth areas, uh, increased density and intensification within the city boundaries, 60% urban intensification to accommodate the 10,000 new houses that we'll need to 2045, well, 60% of them should be within the existing boundaries, and then 35% greenfields green development uh, in identified strategically located areas. So that's, I guess, uh, some of the initial context uh, that we're dealing with here. What I want to know, uh, go on and just talk about briefly now, before I hand over to Nahiwi, is, is some of the challenges and uh, opportunities. And at this point, I just want to back the truck up a little bit. The soils issue, its protection in particular, is symptomatic of a much deeper and fundamental sustainability problem facing all humanity, indeed the planet, and perhaps uh, the most wicked problem of them all. That is how, on the one hand, to protect the seemingly insatiable need to produce, grow food, and feed an ever-expanding, even exploding global population under a model of continuous or relentless economic growth. On the other hand, how to sustain and protect the finite capacity of resources to meet the needs of present and future generations and for their own intrinsic sake. Well, uh, for an answer to that, I'd like to draw on uh, the age-old environmental philosopher, uh, Dr. Seuss. So I'll just see if that's going to work. I hope it will. Any thoughts there, Alicia, on how we can get this? Oh, here we go. last mountain, the very last mountain, beyond the last Zeneca, Zeneca tree, beyond the last woomph bush, the very last woomph bush, there is a vacuous, vacant prairie, the prairie of Prax and the tail of the Zax. One day, making tracks in the prairie of Prax, came a north-going Zax, a north-going Zax, and a south-going Zax. A north-going Zax, and a south-going Zax. And it happened that both of them came to a place where they bumped. There they stood, foot to foot, face to face. Look here now. The north-going Zack said, Hey, say, you are blocking my path. You are right in my way. I'm a north-going Zax, and I always go north. Get out of my way now and let me go forth. Who's in whose way? Snapped the south-going Zax. I always go south, making south-going tracks. So you're in my way, and I ask you to move and let me go south in my south-going groove. Then the north-going Zack said with north-going pride, I never have taken a step to one side, and I'll prove to you that I won't change my ways if I have to keep standing here 59 days. And I'll prove to you, yelled the south-going Zack, that I can stand here in the prairie of Prax for 59 years. 
For I live by a rule that I learned as a boy back in South going school. Never budge, that's my rule. Never budge in the least, not an inch to the west, not an inch to the east. I'll stay here not budging, I can and I will, if it makes you and me and the whole world stand still. Well, of course, the world didn't stand still. The world grew. In a couple of years, the new highway came through, and they built it right over those two stubborn zacks and left them there, standing unbudged in their tracks. Thank you for indulging me in that little interlude, but I couldn't help thinking of the parallels for Hawke's Bay uh, the firm, not one more acre, I will not budge one inch to the left, one inch to the right approach of the Protect Our Soils lobby, and justifiably so. Call that the North Going Zacks. On the other side of the ledger, the South Going Zacks, our land developers, and now amidst a housing crisis of truly epic proportion. The problem being, and we've seen this in Hawke's Bay too many times, is that if we stand still, we end up in a stalemate. But the world will move on regardless. And we will get left behind as the world grows. So there is no standing still in a state of impasse. That is not the answer. And today is very much about what is. And I'll come to that as will the speakers to follow. So returning to my point about sustainability, that uh, battle between development pressure on the one hand and protection of the soils resource on the other has played out in spades through the courts with the Heratonga Plains being where the battle lines have been drawn. And I've been involved in some of these cases, and some of them have been a very uh, hard, even bitterly fought battles. Um, the, 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 the case names are, are very familiar to me. You'll be hearing about them from other presenters. Others I could mention are Bunnings, Lightning Ridge, Beecham and Hastings, uh, the uh, Hawke's Bay Land Protection Society case involving uh, what is now the regional sports park. So why has this happened? Well, part of the problem is that unlike the Town and Country Planning Act, soils right from the outset were never a matter of national importance, making uh, status or standing under Section 6 of the RMA. Another problem, the Heratonga Plains is not Hawke's Bay. We're only covering part of the base. We're only thinking about part of the region. What about central Hawke's Bay? What about Wairau? HPUDS is out of date. It was due for review, in fact, two years ago. Uh, 2021 at, 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 at the latest. Um, we now have, and this is where all the energy coming from government is, the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, uh, addressing, albeit belatedly, the so-called housing crisis, um, and uh, not so much in terms of a uh, soils crisis, the National Policy Statement on Productive Land was released over a thousand days ago uh, in draft for consultation. So perhaps that's uh, why there have been so many battles and we've had to play it out through the courts as we haven't had that strong, firm uh, direction from central government. So that's, that's the past. And just before I finish, a couple of points on the future. The opportunities ahead. And I really do think um, this concept of a spatial plan under the Strategic Planning Act to come could well be the panacea, or the panacea. The potential importance of this opportunity cannot be overstated. 
not just for the issue of soils today, but for all environmental and strategic planning uh, for this region, for the generations ahead. And I applaud uh, our Mayor Sandra and uh, Kirsten for the leadership they have taken uh, on this, this uh, topic and for all our regional leaders in, in brokering that opportunity uh, with central government. But it does need, as Mayor Sandra said, to be a truly region-wide approach. It is quite literally a map, a spatial plan of constraints and opportunities. Take Hawke's Bay uh, and, and, and project forward 30 years. What is our population? Well, it might be, uh, as, as estimated now, uh, 200,000 just Napier and Hastings, so 250,000 over the whole region. Where are these people going to live? Where are they going to go to work? How are they going to get there? How are we going to accommodate that population clear of natural hazard risks like erosion, tsunami, liquefaction, inundation? How are we going to do that while staying off our productive and versatile soils? What decisions are we going to make about water allocation and water security? Dr Clothier, who you will hear from shortly, uh, has, has impressed on me how much more efficient horticulture is than agriculture in terms of water consumption. We're going to need to make some quite tough uh, and, and strategic but deliberate decisions framed around a, trans a spatial plan which really is that big picture that means not just for the HPUDS area, but for the whole region, we can work this out and not end up in the impasse while the world grows around us. We also, uh, as a final slide, have an opportunity with the Natural and Built Environment Act, um, which heralds a new approach to resource management and protection, one in which limits are limits, the, the, less of the effects-based RMA approach, where you can do whatever you like, provided the effects uh, are no more than minor, and a whole bunch of judgment calls and discretions. There will be express outcomes. Well, this is novel. What are we actually trying to do? <laughs> so above or around or on top of the limits, where are we going? Now, there's a specific in the, in the exposure draft, uh, we have a resurrection, uh, going back to the Town and Country Planning Act uh, uh, pedigree, uh, of soils as a matter for which limits are required, environmental limits are required to be set, or will be required to be set, under the exposure draft as released from the Select Committee in February, and it's an express outcome of preservation of highly productive land for food production, so right up the forefront of the Act. Um, just a couple of other points. Hawke's Bay Regional Council has um, led a regional water assessment, uh, and, and you know the soil's resource is only as useful as uh, the growing capacity sustained by water availability. Uh, within that resource. And the news is, this is a, a slide prepared uh, and shared with us at our regional planning committee recently, that uh, when you factor in a degree of mitigation and efficiency, measures that we're not employing now, but also climate change, reduced rainfall, increased propensity for, doubt, for, for drought and doubt, uh, you can see there is an ever burgeoning and growing gap between supply and demand ahead of us as well, that we're going to have to factor into this whole uh, conversation. So, bear with, I seem to be going backwards here, uh, forwards I should say, I'm stealing someone else's thunder, and I apologise for that, no, here we um, But perhaps as a Sedgeway to that, um, I think I've dealt with enough, the national policy statement, the need for a future development strategy has been mentioned by Mayor Sandra. Here's a thought. Maybe we haven't done such a good job over the last 150 years as, as kawana uh, in this rohi and across the entire motu. Maybe we need to knock on the door and draw on what our rangatira, the kaitiaki, have to offer uh, through their status under Article 2 of the Treaty of Tatiriti and ask for a bit of help uh, because this is indeed a taonga that we are dealing with here and want to be cherished. Uh, so for all of this and much more, fasten your seat belts, hold on to your hats and enjoy the incredible lineup of speakers to come. Uh, let the wisdom wash over you like a warm summer breeze. I would like, uh, with all of that said, to call on our first presenter, uh, Nahiwi Tomoana, 
uh, to address you on mana whenua perspectives. I'm blessed by the sun, kissed by the rain, um, cleansed by the winds. Those are those words to that song, and that's what will um, be the basis of my corridor today. Nareira mihi ki ngā mihi kua mihia. I acknowledge all the protocols that have been um, executed with integrity and respect um, to all the all the guests, invited guests and speakers, I greet you um, from uh, Heretanga, from Kahunganu, Tēnā Tātou Katoa. Mana whenua um, perspectives on the whenua, <coughs> we always go off on a tangent when we ask something direct. So one of the basic questions we ask anybody when we meet anyone is, ko wai? Norway, Norway. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you stand for? Where are you going? So call why? Why is water? So you can't talk about Fenua without talking about water. So the basis of my corridor is about water. And because I'm an off course substitute today, I had to dig deep and find a, um, find a PowerPoint that I did about 20 years ago, Sanja. And so it's still relevant today. And it's called why? What waters birthed you? And when we talk about the land, we talk about the whenua. And the whenua is the placenta in the womb. It's the placenta that cleans the womb for the newborn baby and ensures that the water is has its integrity to provide the best outcome, the best birth ever. So when we talk about whenua, we talk about uh, land, we talk about whenua, and we talk about the womb. So the whenua is our womb. So just imagine that. We don't look at whenua as just dirt. It cleanses us, it feeds us, it nourishes us, it nourishes new life, new birth, New growth. Heretanga Hokunui, Heretanga, um, when the sailing, sailing canoes came here, a tonga is a birding place, a fishing place, a diving spot, or a food gathering place. And Heretanga, Here means to tie or bind together. And when they found this place, they named it Heretonga, the binding together of all the fabulous foods that you could ever wish for. And the Heretonga um, was named pre Takitamu, was named pre, it was around the time of Kupi. So that name was given to this place six, eight hundred years ago. Heretonga Hokunui, what they saw, from the sea was the mists. And they knew throughout the Pacific, if there was mist, then the earth was warm and you'd get good growth. So they called this place 
Heretonga, the binding together of all the best food sites, as well as the omen, good omen, of heavy mists that depicted fertile lands and fertile hunting grounds. And uh, one of the earlier names for this area was Te Ipu or Te Raya, Te Raya's food bowl. We called it the fruit bowl of New Zealand. Um, I know that when we were in um, Southeast Asia and China, they were calling it the market garden of Asia. Um, but James Waddy hit on it. He said, eat what you can, can what you can't. And that's always been, you know, those are, those are the modern expressions of hoku nui and te ipu wa te raya. Eat what you can, can what you can't. And he went around the marais and the kitchens of all our nannies and our aunties and he got their recipes so he could replicate them with all the ripe fruit that was falling on the ground and going to waste because we had turned it into jam and pickles and relishes. And um, that was the seed, the kākano, uh, the, the, the seed of his ambition to use every piece of fruit that was grown in Hedetonga, the tying together of all um, the areas in which you cook, uh, cultivate and grow food. In the early days, see this Te Ipu Taraya, that's looking from Bluff Hill or Mataruahau across towards... Um, Te Mata, Kahuranaki, and around the back of Pukipuki. Puki. So you could see that they could see that's my food bowl. Those two part, parts are uh, those bushes there, are the Pakiaka bush and the little Wairua bush around Mangateretere and Whakatū. So water meant everything in our ancestors' eyes when they arrived because they knew the fena underneath it was warm. And over in Ahuriri, they called the area Temara or Tafao. Temara is the um, growing places of Tafao, Atipuna. And um, that's the, um, if you land it into, in one of those spaces at the moment, on, a, on the aeroplane in those days, you'd land in the lake. But they saw that as the Mara or Tafao, a lot of our metaphors around food and the provision of food. Because without kai, uh, you have no sustenance. This is one of the early meetings at Waiohiki Marae, Pafa Kaido, where our people said we won't sell land, we will lease it. And we'll give 100 year leases. And that didn't happen, of course. That was one of the dreams that faded in the face of reality because our people knew that after, that after successive years of floods, of millions of years of evolution, this land was some of the richest land in Hawaii had ever seen, was some of the richest land in the planets. And they decided that we will lease, but we won't sell because this is the most fertile place on the planet. After the earthquake, um, the land was lifted up around Whanganui Orutu, where the airport is. Um, but that was, a, that was generic for all of the Hedetonga Plains, Ahuriri, all around. And so the... Um, the hunger and the feasting for land um, drove our people um, out of the land-owning business into temporary villages. Prior to that, though, all the, all the um, pa and all our papakainga were on hilltops. There was not one pa or pa site on the flats. One, because the flats were seen as common, Two, the flats were seen as hard to defend. So protocols were reached um, with all the different 
um, chiefs of that time to determine who had the hunting, birding, eeling, fishing rights in particular areas. So Havelock North, for example, was called um, Te Kara Nema Nema o Te Mata o Rongo Kako, uh, Hikapuku, Hikanui, Kahurangi Marae were up there. And so every night, the lights, the fires would be lit, food cooked, and the hunters and gatherers would make their way to the flickering eyes of the giant of Rongo Kako. Paki Paki, if you know Paki Paki, there's three marae there. Hangaria was on top of Horanui, was on a ridge there. Um, Mihidor was at the top of Mutiny Road and Middle Road. And oh, Mihidor was at the top of um, Crystal Road and Middle Road. And Taraya was at the top of Mutiny Road. So all our marais were up in the hills. So if you get the picture of what our people saw, this is back in the 1800s, that the land was too valuable to build on. That everyone was living in the hills. And we have the saying, me hoki koe ki te tuahiwi maunga uh, kia pūrea koe i ngā haora o tawhiri mātea. You must return to the ridges of your hills in order to be cleansed by the healing winds of, ta of tawhiri mātea. Which was a metaphor to say don't build on the ground, don't build on the flats. Build in the hills. The flats are too valuable for the produc production of food and the sustaining of populations. At that time, Jerry's tipo na hapuka, hapuku, he had a, 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 um, a vessel, a trading vessel that would go to Australia. And I don't know if it got to San Francisco, Jerry, but we know that it went around the Pacific, taking goods from Heretonga um, to the wider world. If you don't know Mike Paku, but Mike Paku's um, tipo na, Kaitiana Takamona had a schooner called the Henry, and they were taking kumara um, and wheat from here, taking them down to Nelson and Picton, and bringing back oysters and mussels and seaweed. And they weren't living on the flat, they were living in the hills. When I was at Karamu High 50, 60 odd years ago now, our geography teacher was going crazy that some of this land had been built on for the city of Hastings. That one of the best um, growing places on this planet. And in the universe, half of it had been built on. Um, so politics has got a lot to do with it because the railway was supposed to go around the foothills of Havelock. And Havelock, and the, and the advice of our tipunas at that time, Jerry's tipuna, my tipuna, was to build in the hills. Um, you must build your hills, uh, homes in the hills, and you'll be ritually cleansed by the healing winds of Tafiri Matia. And then Kainga, Kainga, Kai, Kainga, some of you might know, but Kainga means a place to dwell, a house or homes. But it actually, if you split it up, it means ka, you light, a fire to cook the food, to sustain the people. And so kainga is suddenly a living, it's a verb, it's not a um, noun. And so these are the metaphors that I want to share with you today about thinking about the future. Because although, um, although we will have um, Māori on, on councils now, although we have Māori committees, it's the politicians, the deciding places um, where the real big futuristic decisions need to be made so that we don't do further damage to the whenua, to our womb, to the, pancre to the, to the um, placenta of who we are as a people and a place and for our people um, going forward in the future. So... Um, 60 million years was when Gondwana, sort of New Zealand broke away from Gondwana. And so over that 60 million years, we've had all this um, alluvial soils. We have a whakapapa for it that Sandra and their team are going to display as a learning tool for all of us. That the first teardrop was from 
Ranginui, and it was called Matawaya, and it hit Tupari Maunga, the top of the mountains, and some of the teardrop went under to form deep glaciers, glacier movements underground, while others formed um, the surface water, the mountain creeks. That fell down to Rakahure, and the boulders started to break up. That fell down to Kirikiri, and to the shingles, and Kirikiri broke down to the Oneone, to the dirt, to the whenua. So we have a whakapapa to all this. It's not fanciful, mystical, magical. It lives with us, it breathes, it breathes with us. And so years and years of flooding, we saw that as a good thing. Um, but with all the new technology and the new uses of land, we lost this upokororo. The ngaru roro is short for ngaru upokororo. Ngaru means wave, upokororo is a grayling. And the waves of graylings, that used, as, they, as they surged up the ngaru roro river, um, was, a, was a tohu or a nomen of good health of the river and the land and the people. It's extinct. So if we don't look after our lands, I know there's about soils and the plains, but if we don't look after our water, our placenta, our whenua, then the rest is for naught, because we can become the most toxic sink that we could ever be in Heretonga, unless we make sure that our waters have the ability to carry it away. And so... Um, I don't know, where that, I, I forget where this was, Sanjay, but I'm sure it was with Lawrence or Jeremy to it. And um, you know, we've got to look after the water, not just the whenua. The whenua, we only moved down, we only moved onto the plains when we had the first drilling well. And Waipatu Marae is a um, metaphor for that. Why? Water, patu, bang, 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 hitting the water. And that's the first time a marae was built on the plains. All the rest were in the hills. So what's, the, what's my point? My point is, for future development, don't be shy of the hills. Ensure that the, ensure that the archaeological and tipuna sites are protected. But if there's going to be growth, me hoki kwe, we must return to the foothills and be ritually cleansed by the healing winds of Tafiri Mate. So all the rest. Um, I was at the freezing works. I left um, Karamu High School in the fifth form. Went to the freezing works. I stayed there till it closed. But in the off season, we'd work up on the roof, and you'd see sheep. 1970. All you'd see is white dots. And then, as it changed over time, um, you started seeing orchards, vineyards, and you start seeing the real intensive production that we're getting now. So we've seen land use change. We've seen, um, we've seen the terrors of not looking after our water supply in Havelock, um, with the Campbell and Belk Day outbreak there biggest in the world. We're kaitiaki of the land and of the waters. And so we say this to you not in fanciful, wishful, wistful thinking, but we can put it into action and to kaupapa with your science and matauranga Māori, the science of our ancestors. We can pull things together to ensure our future is bright, prosperous, and everybody's doing well. I still can't remember where I got that. <laughs> so, um, also, a lot of our rivers have been turned into drains, to gutters, polluted. And if we're talking about the whenua, we've got to talk that the water is as important as the whenua. That the water in the womb is important um, the placenta is important as the womb itself. And unless we get the water right, the whenua will, um, will corrode over time. So that's about all from me. Just saying that kiuta ki tai, 
We do have our own um, science around that, but we also compare it with your science, uh, with Western science, I mean. And we know that out in the bay, there's a whole lot of hydraulic force, um, ngā puhaka, puhake, that forces about 30 springs out in the bay. And we did a study, some of us, the iwi and some of the orchardists did a study that you could fill up a super tanker, oil tanker, by just inverting a cone over one of these blowholes and you can fill a super tanker up in 24 hours without any pumping. So there's a lot of hydraulic wall out there that can be, that can be repatriated onto the land to make sure the land and the water, the mana, mona and the mana whenua is intact. So without further ado, uh, ngā mihi kia koutou, tēnā tātou kato. Um, if I could just stand uh, by your shoulder for a moment, Mahiwi, uh, just to acknowledge you uh, and uh, to thank you not only for your insights of uh, Matauranga to this important kaupapa, uh, but equally uh, for the, the truly immense contribution that you've made to our rohi for over a generation. I didn't share this at the outset, uh, but this is a man who really does need no introduction, uh, as you'd be aware. Nahiwi was chair of the third largest iwi in Aotearoa, uh, that's the Ngāti Kahanunu Iwi Incorporated, for 26 years. Alongside that, Nahiwi has had a, a range of uh, key strategic positions and various service uh, roles within our communities, including deputy chair of the Hawke's Bay District Health Board, uh, Executive Board Member of New Zealand China Council, Member of New Zealand uh, Commissioner's Māori Focus Forum, uh, Waipatu Marae uh, Representative, um, Member and Co-Chair of the uh, Pautahua working, working Group for the Iwi Chairs Forum. The list is immense. Um, and I think, uh, perhaps as it says here, more importantly, uh, alongside all of that, Nahiwi is a, a loving husband to Mere, uh, a father of six, uh, Tamariki, grandfather to 15 Moko, and it is with his whānau uh, that he, in mind, he has really taken on all of these responsibilities. And now here we thank you for the uh, insights that you shared. Uh, Kōr wai, uh, nō wai, and more wai, really, what else do you need to know? Um, eat what you can, can what you can't, something there for you, Mike, uh, perhaps later. And, but here's really a message uh, for this uh, symposium, maybe it's time to stop being so precious about living on our pretty landscapes in the hills. Uh, there were no pa on the flats. We should return to the ridges to be cleansed by the wind. Could you all please join me now in thanking Nahiwi for his presentation today. I have a small gift uh, to, to hand. So I was supposed to say it at the beginning, but I thought it was more touching uh, and more apposite to, to perhaps share that at the end. Um, so thank you, Nahiwi. We're now going to hear uh, virtually, or albeit in a, in a real sort of a way, from um, a, a star witness of mine in one of the cases that he'll refer to in an equally in another environment court case that um, Dr. Brent Clothier will mention. Um, Dr. Clothier uh, tested positive for COVID on Monday. Um, it's uh, such as the vagaries of trying to run a symposium like this in, in present times, but he has recorded this presentation and he'll be joining us for a panel discussion by Zoom later on. Dr. Brent Clothier is a principal scientist with plant and food research based in Palmerston North, New Zealand. Brent is uh, president of Royal Society of Te Aparangi, uh, Brent has published scientific papers on the movement and fate of water, carbon and chemicals in the root zones of primary production systems, irrigation allocation and water management plus sustainable vineyard and orchard practices, including adaptation strategies in the face of climate change. Brent has been or is still involved in soil and water related aid and development projects in the Pacific and Indian Oceans 
as well as in the middle, uh, middle East, China and Africa. And uh, I think, Alicia, will you get this going or do I press the button? Cobra and Clothia Topo in one. Hope scientists with plant and food research. Apologies for not being there today. Uh, I'm at, isolating at home with COVID. I'm going to talk to you about soil, valuable natural capital, and why it's worth protecting. To finance, we can think of nature in terms of capital. Whereas in finance we have financial capital, in nature we have natural capital. Our stocks of our natural materials and energy, our soils, our waters, and our climate. In finance, from capital flows rent uh, or interest, whereas in nature we get ecosystem services, the beneficial flow of goods between natural capital stocks themselves or between stocks and us as humans. Say, for example, nitrogen mineralized in the soil, taken up by the plants, the plants grow well and we eat the plants. So these are ecosystem services. Globally, our inventory of land stocks are not keeping up with population growth. You can see down here, you can see our land and water resources since 1960 uh, increasing at a rate lower than the population. However, we have been lucky. Our food production of meat and cereals has increased above the rate of population growth. That is achieved, has been achieved by the addition of built capital nitrogen. So we are running out of our natural capital stocks relative to population growth. So we can pose the question, should we be ash felting a pace over our valuable lands? If we look at the Hawke's Bay, the Hawke's Bay has a magic climate and this gives the Hawke's Bay a dominant role in horticulture in Aotearoa, New Zealand. By area, Hawke's Bay provides 14% of New Zealand's fruit. By apples, it's actually 55%. And also for vegetables, it's 18.5% by area. And COVID notwithstanding, you can see that since 1995, our horticultural exports have gone up rapidly through 1995 through 2020. And indeed, our natural capital stocks deliver nationally some $10.2 billion of provisioning service. And that just comes from 120 hectares of land. And not only the provisioning services, we have to get other valuable ecosystem services, supporting services, regulating services, and cultural ecosystem services. Yet, in New Zealand, we have built infrastructure that covers 1 million hectares, and peri-urban lands have been lost at a rate of about 40,000 hectares per year. So we're sort of getting a death by a thousand cuts. And so you can see that we get $10 billion from 120,000 hectares of land, yet we're gobbling up 40,000 hectares of land a year. Back in 2013, the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research said, New Zealand producers and consumers get much value from natural assets. Much of this value is intangible. So they think there's a fundamental reason to make a special effort to measure the value of these assets and ensure that we make the right decisions about their use and conservation. They propose an approach which could improve the understanding of the value of our natural assets, which would give them a better and more consistent weight in decision making and also how we might manage them. In, 19, in 2017, this moved towards Treasury with a report to Treasury by NZIER on an update stock take of recent literature around natural capital and decision making. And also, it's gone further in 2018, where Treasury itself is starting a conversation on the value of New Zealand's natural capital. Meanwhile, the Ministry for Primary Industries has an emerging national policy statement on the potential uh, for highly productive soils. It's an interesting title, Productive Soils, because in terms of production, production is just one of four soil services. Nonetheless, why don't we join those two conversations between MPI in terms of productive soils and starting that conversation around the value of New Zealand's natural capital. So natural capital, price and value. If we look, say, 
from the city centre of Hastings, for example, you would pay something like $7 million a hectare for land in the central business district. As you move out um, to the, the peri-urban fringe around um, horticulture, you might get $60,000 a hectare. This has changed. This comes from a paper with Alec Mackay back in 2011. So it's quite interesting that in terms of the difference between price and value, and I had here uh, that the economists know the price of everything and the value of nothing. So there's a lot of valuable land under threat around Hastings and elsewhere in New Zealand. Back in 2011, for Bunnings, there was indeed a cloud over the um, big box development in the old Nelson Park. Bunnings failed to secure a site in Nelson Park, so they went and bought a 4.5 hectare um, orchard on Pakawai Road to build their warehouse. So of course, it, it was appealed under the district plan, and so this went to court in front of Judge Dwyer and two commissioners. Bunnings Council, Mr Lautet, said, well, the soil at this site suffers from limitations, which was quite interesting. So as an expert witness for the Hastings District Council, we went out and had a look at it, and actually it looked pretty good to us growing a maize crop. And the next door um, orchard was also looking pretty good as well. Lautet said, 70% of the site is poorly drained, which significantly restricts the range of uses. It cannot be described as versatile. It's an interesting perception because we found tree roots down at 1.3 metres, which is quite interesting. Also, if we think of a regulating ecosystem service, that water table where, the, where on the Twyford soil here is actually linked to seasonal uh, regulating services of recharging the water table and the caribou stream. So replacing that with a um, series of ash-filtered car parks uh, would have reduced the services provided to the Karamu stream. So that's sort of the basis of my expert witness report. Um, and so I noted that the district plan seeks to assure the life supporting capacity of the soils of the plains and assure their availability for future generations. So drawing on that natural capital ecosystem services approach, I noted that this was very consistent with the life supporting capacities referred to in the plan. And I concluded by saying we cannot afford to lose such valuable natural capital assets whose presence is needed for their ecosystem services. It wasn't universally agreed to. Doug Edmeads, on behalf of Bunnings, said that he thought my evidence was actually unhelpful uh, in terms of the facing the court. And he had a brilliant suggestion that natural capital value can be defined as the price that a purchaser would pay for a piece of land. And Mr Lautick came back and said uh, the Act agreed that it makes provision for safeguarding the life-supporting capacities of air, water, soil and ecosystems. But he reckoned that I failed to produce any quantitative or any qualitative evidence of the ecosystem services or life supporting capacity of the soil at the site other than in relation to food production. Well, Judge Dwyer and the Commissioner said they didn't propose to enter that debate between uh, Dr. Edmead and myself. But they did say that it seems to us that Clothier took a somewhat more holistic approach to assessment of the value of the soils at the site. He did also note that the loss of four hectares of Plains land for the proposed development by Bunnings was in itself pretty insignificant. However, the wider policy implications and the cumulative effects would be significant. So the appeal was declined. This went to costs, and the cost decision actually also makes quite interesting reading in terms of what uh, you people will be discussing today. So Judge Dwyer said, we emphasised the importance of the district plan to protect the rural resource. We held that the Bunnings approach, which concentrated on the soil structure of the site rather than the wider rural resources, was fundamentally flawed. It's on italics because that's a reference to the case law. 
Bunnings considerably understated the versatile nature and capacity of the soils at the site. In those respects, Bunnings' case might be described as without substance or unmeritorious, again with case references. So therefore, Bunnings will pay 50% of the costs incurred by the council. If we move on to more recent times, uh, I have again appeared for the Hastings District Council uh, in the Environment Court. This time you'll see that uh, Martin Williams, who's with you today, uh, was acting for Hastings District Council in this case. And it relates to, uh, the decision relates to appeals for a subdivision consents to create rural lifestyle blocks along Raymond Road out by Haumawana. So they noted that in, in the decision that the definition of versatile land in the proposed plan is LUC classes one to three and class seven for viticulture. The properties comprise LUC two and three at a scale of one to 25,000. However, a finer grained analysis did actually find some LUC four. The expert for the uh, appellants said the LUC handbook reckons that the least capable LUC unit should therefore be assigned to the whole area because a small pocket of LUC 4 was found, irrespective of LUC 2 and 3 comprising the major portion of those parcels of land. My assertion was that if there's a small problem, fix it. This is what a, this is what a grower does. If there's a problem down the, the back of the second paddock there, do something about it. But do not manage the whole area as a whole. And indeed, the court said in response that one such technique that uh, was proposed in the hearing is the movement of soil from the inter-row to create deeper soil under the row as an adequate root zone free from saturation. This is known as mounding. And the court found that we prefer the evidence that this technique is feasible and commercially viable to overcome production limitations. So, Judge Dickey and the commissioners summarise their findings. The definition of versatile land is an inclusive one, and I think that's very important. It is inclusive. The 90% LUC reference is to be applied at a sub-regional scale, not site-specific. Site-specific analyses, however, do demonstrate that soil properties can indeed be managed. They concluded that the Raymond Road sites represent land with life-supporting capacity and productive potential, enjoying a climate that is superb for horticulture, even if soil mitigation is required. We have found that the appellant's land is versatile, it can be described as productive. The appeals are dismissed. I like this phrase here in the, in the um, decision. The area of Raymond Road enjoys a climate that is support, superb for horticulture, even if soil mitigation is required. So, why is Aotearoa food bowl located in the Hawke's Bay? It's because Hawke's Bay's lands are versatile and its soils can be managed. Kia ora. Thank you. Well, wishing uh, Dr. Clothier well for his recovery. Um, just a couple of reflections briefly on that. In this topic, we're drilling down um, from the Matauranga perspective into a, what you might call the Western science perspective uh, of the issue. But a couple of things about uh, Dr. Clothier's uh, presentation. I, I mentioned these bitter battles. The Ensley Cottages case was quite literally trench warfare. And I have to say, as, as a, uh, an advocate, as a lawyer, I personally felt a huge degree of sympathy for the Morenbecker and Evans families. These are cases that you see and read about, but they're not easy. They weren't easy for the people involved. These are real people's lives. These are real people's stories. The council officers found it really tough. And each and every one of those listed cases that I put up for you was, it was uh, as I say, uh, quite an experience and a very challenging and confronting situation for the local authority and for the people involved. So 
it, it, it can get quite intense, and I just wanted to re-emphasise that. So thank you, Dr. Clothier, for your contribution to today uh, and uh, for sharing those insights. What we're going to hear uh, now on the topic of versatile soils of the plains, uh, session one, is from uh, Keith Vincent. Uh, we're hearing uh, now from uh, Keith, who's a retired soil scientist. For over 30 years, he has worked in many regions of New Zealand, particularly the East Coast and summer dry regions from Otago to Hawke's Bay. Uh, his career began in the DOSIR Soil Bureau in the 1980s, uh, studying the effects of soil erosion on soil properties and soil mo uh, moisture in the Wairarapa Hill Country. Uh, in the late 1980s, he was co-author of the soil map of the Wairau Plains, Marlborough, and I hope uh, Keith will be able to explain today these LUC class one, two, and three terms. Just unpack that a little bit for us. His work uh, formed the basis for planning decisions as well as subsequent uh, viticultural development. And we all know the Sauvignon Blanc story down in Marlborough as well as we know uh, the Syrah story here uh, on the Gimlet gravel. So through most of the 1990s, he was based in Hawke's Bay uh, with Manaki Whenua land care research and during this time was involved in two major collaborative projects, one being to develop a scientific rationale for water use and allocation, the other being to measure the movement of various pesticides into the water table um, and uh, through contrasting soils. Um, Keith has completed many soils investigations comprising soil survey followed by interpretations of soil drainage, fertility and irrigation recommendations. Keith, please do come up and share your presentation with us. Thank you, Martin. And also thank you, Ngahiwi, for setting the scene for us today and, and giving us the perspective. Of, of what we're setting out to do here. Um, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this very important task. Um, I've been introduced, so I don't need to describe who I am, what I do. Um, I'm gonna be discussing today a number of things I've been asked to address. Um, and they fit into these three, three main areas. Uh, first of all, I will You'll, uh, with your permission, I'll give you a very short lesson in soil science um, so that you sort of know the te technicalities and just some of the areas we, we look at to describe these, um, these features. Uh, secondly, I'll be referring to the land classification systems, or at least some of them that we've uh, developed over the, over the decades and which, um, some of which are in use still now. And we need to use because th these are what we're referred to. <clears throat> And, and thirdly, I'll finish off by uh, referring to the draft national policy statement proposal uh, around highly productive land and how we, how we move forward and address that. So first of all, I'll, um, I'll, I'll adopt my professor hat, even though I never was really a professor. Um, and I'll describe uh, soils and how we approach them in, this, in the field. And so uh, to that end, I'll be talking about the physical characteristics of the soils how they're formed, our aspects of their formation, how we then classify what we, what we find, what we observe, and then um, how, we map, how we map that uh, uh, to make it into a, into a format that we can you know, discuss it and use it as a useful, um, uh, well, it, it becomes part of the, of the literature, really. Um, so first of all, of course, we have to dig a, a great big hole in the, in the ground and jump into it. And um, to be honest, I've actually lost track of how many times I've jumped in and uh, crawled out of a soil pit, but it would be thousands. Um, and, and over the years, often starting a job, people would ask me what I thought about the soils, and I would simply have to say that, well, actually, I don't have a clue, and they look at me very disturbed. And Well, I haven't actually had a look yet, you know. It's, it's true that we really need to see what we've got before we can make any pronouncement of it. Uh, but fortunately, I, I have done this rather a few times, and so I can am qualified to speak today without actually having to jump into any more pits. Um, so once we're in that pit, we, um, we observe what we call the soil profile. It's the face, if you like. That it, it shows the, the natural layers that have formed. And obviously, there's a thing that we'd refer to as a topsoil and then a subsoil. 
and also um, underneath that, uh, at some depth, what we would call the parent material of the soil. And this can vary all sorts of geological sort of, uh, you know, uh, features. Um, but in the soil itself, and, and this applies to all those layers I was talking about, um, uh, especially the topsoil, which is where all the roots tend to be, but, but with horticultural crops, of course, the roots also, you find them two metres down as well in a, in, a, in a vineyard, a grape vineyard, for example. So we, we are interested in the whole, whole of the soil. So we, we first of all uh, assess the physical nature of the soil in terms of what we call soil texture. And that's the primary particles that if you smash the soil down, it's, it's the smallest particles it would come to. And, and these are described obviously as sand sized particles, which are less than two millimetres, or silt, which are much finer, right through clay. And then you also, of course, have the other extreme, your gravel and your rocks, whatever, whatever you might find. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the elementary sized particles are not what we normally find the soil sitting in. Um, and this is what I'll refer to later as structure, but I'll come back to that. Um, the other thing that stands out when we first look at these soils are the colour of the layers, and often what we, we look for what we call mottling, which is a, mottling is a reflection of, um, of the aeration status of the soil, depending on how often it gets wet, how often it gets dry, and how well it drains. Um, and so if it's a nice, well-drained soil, it'll be a nice, even, let's say, brownish-yellow colour, in the subsoil, whereas if it's a wet soil, you get um, examples of both reduction and oxidation of the iron which is in the soil, and you get, in the oxi oxidized state, it's a rusty color, obviously, iron oxide, and in the, in the wetter state, the, the anaerobic state, it's, uh, it's a gray color, and that's what you might, some people might call the, um, you know, the pug or the blue clay or something, but it's really a reflection of the aeration status of the soil. Very important, very important for our classification. So in a way, the, the list here I've got of these um, six bullet points, or three, well really, quite a more than that, but this is almost the, te the order of the importance as we observe them. The next thing that we observe, which is really more of a judgment, is the permeability of their soil. Soil really is a sponge, and, and this is what makes it so, so useful, but also so very sensitive to, to damage. Um, and so it's very, very important to have an uh, uh, assessment of just how porous and what the density of that soil is, because this really does affect how the water moves through the soil and also how the roots manage to grow into the soil. And, and as a result of that, in some cases we may... Um, we may make a judgment that a layer is impermeable, and this also has a lot of relevance to how we, uh, we uh, then assess that soil in terms of a classification. Um, as, well as, as well as the permeability, um, then we also assess where the water sits in this soil, and um, this is very important because you, you, you end up some, in some soils having what's referred to as a water table, and if that water table is, is within the root zone of whatever you're growing, it, it can actually limit or it can lead to uh, a poor quality in an orchard or in a vineyard, for example. Uh, so we, another, another judgment we make about the soil after making the observations is we, we give it what we call a hydromorphic class or, a, or otherwise called drainage. And, and the term profile drainage is... Is, it, is easy misunderstood because it's not really about digging drains or anything. It's really the drainage status, the natural drainage status of the soil. And it turns out that this is one of the most valuable um, things we can use to decide on, on how, how good or how bad a soil is on the Heratonga Plains, for example. So these salient points are all referenced by how deep they are in, from the surface. In other words, how thick the layers are. Um, there are a lot of other descriptive soil science, so before your eyes glaze over, I'm not going to try and describe them in detail, but um, consistence is a term which is otherwise known, perhaps, if you're um, ploughing a paddock, as just how friable the soil is, how, how, how nicely it breaks into a, what we call a tilth, you know, becomes a very nice seed bed, how, how much work it takes to achieve that. Um, it, it also includes um, uh, factors which indicate whether a soil is prone to liquefaction. Um, there's a term called thixotropy, which soils 
in an earthquake, when they start shaking, they became liquefied, and this is obviously very important, not, not for a, um, a primary production point of view, but certainly if you might be wanting to build houses in the way of a subdivision or something, um, clearly you need to know that. Uh, soil structure is what I was referring to earlier when I talked about how the soil material is, is, is naturally uh, clumped, if you like, into, um, well, things we call peds, actually, um, just little lumps of various size shapes which are sometimes quite strongly held together and, and this is also what leads to tilth. If the structure is strong, the, the tilth will be good and it will be easier to produce a seed bed without damaging the soil. So these all fit together and soil strength. There are various other things and, and I'm going to move on from, from those de terminology. And so now having um, looked at the soil face and, and made observations, we, I'm going to jump into um, factors of soil formation, as described by um, a scientist in 1941 who, who identified five uh, factors which pretty much explain every aspect of the soil as we see it in the field. And so I'll, I'll, I'll try and um, relate these, soil, these five soil factors to the Heratonga Plains as well. Um, so first of all, the first factor is the climate because this has an influence on how well, the soils, as Ngahiwi explained, are experiencing sunshine and wind and, and, and water. And um, it's this climate over many, actually thousands of years, which really does define what sort of a soil type we end up with. Um, it's, it's a little less relevant for the most recent soils on the plains, but you can still see factors uh, which are influenced by the climate. But the most, uh, most important thing to remember about our climate, which Brent rightly praised, is that we have what's sometimes called, well, it's an almost a Mediterranean climate, and I'm sure you've heard that term. It's where there's, we have drought in summer and usually quite a lot of water in winter. So that you have, it's quite an extreme, you know, flip-flop between the summer dry, which is excellent for growing stone fruit and viticulture, obviously, and then in the winter everything is, is a bit uh, dormant and it doesn't matter when the soils recharge with water. Well, that's what we hope on a normal year. Who knows how it's going to unfold into the future. And, and the thing to note about this is that we're, we're blessed here because we enjoy the rain shadow from the, the mountains. Um, and I'm not going to go at all into the actual uh, meteorology, but it's just a fact that on the east coast of the country, pretty much from, um, well, from here right down to Canterbury, certainly, uh, we have this rather, rather, rather favourable uh, summer dry climate. Secondly, we talk about the organisms, and these are the, a lot of the biology which has formed soil layers over thousands of years, and um, I've got no idea how I'm doing for time, I better whip along, but the forest uh, um, was here originally, and that in fact formed a lot of the layers of the soils that we now observe. Now... <clears throat> The, uh, <coughs> beg your pardon, the organisms have um, evolved into agriculture, horticulture, and so the point here is, I'll leave it here, is, is that the humanity is, is the organism which now is having most effect on our soils, uh, and, and if you want to jump into France and call that terroir, well, you may well, but it's the same idea where um, well, the factors have an influence on the soil, and they include the human influence as well. Uh, the third point is a very important factor is topography, which uh, depends on where the soil is sitting in the landscape, it will change. Uh, fourth point is the parent material, which I've referred to a, 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 a previously, and that's what sort of material the soil is forming in. Uh, if it's a, alluvium, which it is uh, mostly uh, here, we have three rivers which coalesce to form the Heratonga Plains. And uh, these three rivers are accessing different parent materials. The Ngaruru is accessing hard sedimentary rocks called grey wacky from the, from the Kawekas, for example. The uh, Tuki Tuki is, is accessing soft sedimentary rocks, you might call papa, from um, Central Hawks Bay primarily. And, um, but as well, and also with the Tutaikuri has a mix of that as well as a bit more limestone maybe, but um, as well as that we do have a volcanic ash. We're pretty close to the erupting volcano here. And over, let's say, over the last 20,000 years, there have been 20 major eruptions from those centres. Uh, they've all, in turn, you know, led to dust and other alluvium coming down as well. Um, <clears throat> finally, the factor of time is very, very important because uh, this is how long it takes to form the soil. 
So here we are. Um, where does it all end? Or what does it result in? And we have actually two rather good soil maps here we can look to. Um, how is that for visibility? Uh, first thing to notice, uh, and I'll certainly reiterate what Ngahiwi said, is that look at where Hastings is, right in the middle of um, what I would describe as some very good soils. Um, and um, I don't know if there is a pointer on this. It, maybe there isn't. I'm going to have to describe this verbally. This is the soil map from 1938, which is actually a very good soil map. And, and um, we don't always find, as soil scientists, that the early maps were any good. But this one actually is still quite good as a, as a foundation. But it's useful for a couple of points. It, it, it highlights the way the river, the, the um, Nararora, has flowed down from the, from the left-hand side of the picture there. And in fact, this map does trace the river right through the middle of Hastings. Um, and in, in the middle of the river channel, you have the stony soils. But then on either side of that, you have the Twyford soils, the sandy soils, and then the back, the, the back slope, which is the Hastings soils. And, um, and finally, you have the little swamp down the bottom, which is the Kaiapo soils. And that's marked there in the blue around the bottom. But as a, as a memory exercise, just try and remember how big Hastings is on that soil map. And I'll see what your memory's like in a few slides hence. Um, it turns out that Brent and I both chose the same um, profile that Elwyn Griffiths uh, provided here. Um, to illustrate what I'm saying about how important the topography is. Uh, and, and this is very, very diagnostic of pretty much the whole of the Herotonga Plains. You may not realize when you're driving everywhere that there's a bit of landscape, but there really is quite a bit. Um, you notice it more if you're biking or walking, maybe, or running. But what you do get is you get the river channel, and sometimes that's actually quite a high stony uh, uh, build-up. In this case, it's described as a, um, as, as, a, as a hollow, because that actually is modeling on the Kadamu stream, which is where the Ngarurora used to flow before it was divert, diverted. Um, naturally diverted. On the very crest, you have the sandy uh, Twyford soils. Um, and the best example of that is the retirement home on Te Oti Road, I have to point out. Um, and then we come down into the, uh, some more Twyford sandy soils. But most of the back slope is the number 14, the Hastings soils, which are silt loam. So the texture of the soil is getting finer. But also, because it's getting closer and closer to that water table, uh, we're starting to see some uh, mottling that I described. And so um, we're, we're starting to question how good this soil is. And then once we get into the very hollow, which is a clay, clay loam, which is the Kaiapo soil, let's say, uh, well, we really are questioning how useful that is because it's basically, it's got very wet feet. And in fact, it's almost got a very wet neck um, because it's, uh, it's a soil where we have water right through, right to the surface. Um, now, a couple of points here, though. Um, the Kaiapo soil can be drained very effectively, and it has been, and it is. Um, Having said that, these soils which are judged a bit lower value always are not quite as good, even when they've been ameliorated. But, but still, coming back to the point Brent makes about our climate, it really does deliver us. I, um, I, would, I should say that the Hastings soil is what I would class as having imperfect drainage, and this really trips people up because they think that's a bad thing. And in their defence, I'd have to say, in, in, when, I, when we were mapping on the Wairo Plains in Marlborough, same climate, and when we came to the imperfectly drained soils there, we were, we were downrating them greatly. But then we discovered from all the users we talked to, well, what are you doing? You know, and they were, they were growing very well, in fact. In fact, this is what happens here. Pretty much the whole of our uh, pip fruit is growing on Hastings' uh, imperfectly drained soils. And... Um, Yet no one's going to argue that there's anything wrong with them. So, um, whereas, uh, just to finish off on the imperfectly drained theme, if you had that on the west side of the country, it would be wet and it would not be, it would not be a viable option. It would be much lower value. So that's coming back to the climate. Um, quick example of the Twyford's fine sandy loam, which is a well-drained soil you, that's got layering which reflects the uh, uh, sedimentary nature of the deposit. It has a topsoil. The Omahu uh, shallow sony, sto sorry, getting tongue-tied. The Omahu shallow sandy loam, which is pretty much a viticulturist dream, because you've got a very little bit of topsoil and then mostly stones and gravels. 
And, and, and the other one I referred to here, which is just three examples, which is the Kaiapo clay loam, which is a, a clay loam. It still has quite good structure in it if it hasn't been damaged. Uh, and you can damage a wetter soil by working it in wet conditions. Uh, but this one just shows the, the general greyness uh, at, at the depth at which we would say that there's a problem. And in fact, you can see some water down the bottom of that profile. So that moves me right on to um, soil classification. And there are many systems worldwide. We used to have a system called the New Zealand Genetic Classification, and so the soils in this region, the older soils would be called yellow grey earths, for example, under that scheme. Uh, now we have a, a newer system which is pretty nice to use, and the New Zealand, uh, sorry, the, the, the yellow grey earths became what we call pallic soils. Uh, but they both have uh, recent soils, which is one of the more common ones around here. Um, so as you can see, uh, we, we assess the data that we've observed in the profiles and brought back to the office and, and thought about for a long time and compare and contrast and, and create entities, soil entities, uh, which we, we put together and we create a soil map. And that's, that's pretty much in a thumbnail, a thumbnail sketch what happens. So... So coming to the Heratonga Plain soils in particular, uh, as I mentioned, it's an alluvial plain, it's pretty recent, and much of the soils we would classify as recent soils. Some of those soils, like the Kaiapo, the ones with the grey and the wet, uh, we would call glay soils. Glaying is the feature that I talk about when you get the greyness. Uh, the pallic soils are the older ones with lurse, which is the windblown uh, material, uh, and they tend to be on the higher terraces, uh, further back in the Ngātara Triangle, for example. Um, Alephanic soils are those ones which have had some weathering with volcanic ash, and they also lend a nice character to the soil. In fact, when they're stony, and you get what we call red metals up by Cellini there. Um, but, but in fact, for this study, when we're focusing on the Herotonga Plains, we're really looking at the recent soils and the glaze soils. And they're both highly productive soils, highly fertile because of their river valley uh, status, and um, they're located in a, in a favourable climatic zone. So I'm really just verifying pretty much what we've been saying uh, the last two, last two speakers. Um, now, uh, I'm going to take a moment to give credit to my predecessor, Elwyn Griffiths, the guy with the hat sitting on top of the soil, telling us all about a soil pit on a soil conference. He is the author of the next soil map, and we really do owe him a huge vote of thanks because he was such a sincere worker and he, he didn't leave any stone unturned. Not that there were many stones, but you know what I mean. And this is the book which he produced, The Soils of the Herotonga Plains. And it's a very detailed book, but very easy to follow at a technical level. And um, he, he actually published this once he'd retired, but with the assistance of the Regional Council. And I'm pretty sure that it must still be, be available at the Regional Council, but somebody else can confirm that. And, um, and at, at, at the same time, this book was brought out to explain further his soil map, which is now, well, you can buy it on five sheets of paper or you can get it online. And um, this is the comparison I wanted to make between the old soil map in 1938 and this soil map, which we should date about 1998. 60, in 60 years, can you remember what, how big Hastings looked then? And now if you compare the urban areas of Hastings, Havelock, and, um, and Flaxmere, you can see that there's a pretty big wadge of urban area right in the middle of our productive soils. But hey, none of us are arguing that that's what we're here for. Um, however, very interesting to reflect on the fact that Havelock is mostly on hills, which is a, which is a good thing, in my opinion. Um, although I've also had to fight it out with viticulturists who say, no, no, they're the best soils, but they're not quite. Um, but Flaxme is the very interesting case in point of where you do the best job at the time given the information available because it's a brilliant, um, I think, example of land development where the urban area was chosen to be developed on the stony soils, is that correct? And in fact, because at the time they were considered to be worthless. Well... It's there for the right, the best of reasons. Well, who would have guessed that, you know, those stony soils which have no water in them or they, you know, are dry, droughty, would have been as uh, sought after now as they are. But, but we're not going to go and get rid of flax overnight. I'm not, not for a moment thinking that. Um, so here we come. Um, on to land classification systems. I must be well over time, am I? Do I need to rattle it along? 
Five minutes? Yep, thanks. Um, again, there have been quite a few over the years. I came, I, my, my upbringing was in DSIR, and we felt pretty elite, and we didn't really like what Ministry of Works did, so I will have some bias. <laughs> but, um, but just want to reflect on what was happening at the time, and this is like 60s, 70s, I suppose, that people started considering some of these aspects that we're still you know, worried about today. So in DSIR, we had a term called soils of high value for food production, there were maps produced, but they were at a pretty uh, large scale, so they weren't, weren't very detailed. And then Ministry of Works uh, came along with their land use capability classification, uh, leading to the New Zealand Land Resource Inventory, or the NZLRI, as it's called. And that was, a, that, was a, that was an approach... Actually, I might explain this. I'll just see if I've got it on the next slide. Oh no, I'll just, I'll just quickly summarise that. Um, this is an approach that, look, that brought in eight categories, really only four for arable lands, uh, unless they're extremely bad um, or poor. But it's a fairly coarse classification, and in many respects, it's not really fine enough for our purposes to differentiate on the plains here. Um, so both these two approaches were a bit rough to start with. Uh, sorry, not rough, um, less detailed than what we require now. Um, and, and then in recent years, 2002, I think it started, um, there was a very interesting paper by uh, staff at Manaki Fenua and um, looking at a digital approach to soils information. And so they came up with this whole big thing called an SMAP, which you can look into, it's all online. And it, it pulls out a lot of soil features. Many of the ones I've described, in other words, using information that people like me, the pedologists, have been out there mapping in the landscape, but also um, doing some interpretations with using the computer to look at various fertility and a whole lot of aspects. So this is a very good resource. It's, it's actually way too detailed for our exact purposes here, but it, it can be used uh, when necessary except that it tends to jump back and use the existing maps that we've already produced, and that's the current status. Um, as for high value for food production, um, oh, I did have a few notes, I must have misunderstood. When I started in DSIR in the early 80s, staff were going to hearings for the Town and Country Planning Act all the time, and usually winning, because the Town and Country Planning Act specified that this this was to be avoided, development of urban land onto uh, that. And, and so that was prior to the RMA. I forget what year the RMA came out, but after that I think um, things got a, a bit leaky. Um, quickly, the land use capability, five factors it uses, soil, rock type, slope, erosion and vegetation. It makes polygons uh, or parcels of land which are it's a real mess of a map to look at. I mean, it's good if you need it for technical reasons, but it can be quite hard to see. But as I've already, uh, or as I've already said, it's not so good for the Heratonga Plains, uh, and also, they also just used our soil bureau maps, so you're no further ahead, really. Um, but as an example of what it uh, does, there are, the eight, um, there are the eight categories roughly put against the landscape. So number one at the bottom is the very best sort of flat land arable soils going up through the the rolling country and into the mountains. And uh, it is a very good system for classifying mountainous terrain. Um, I think I've already talked about the SMAP. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just flick past this. Um, you can get a hold of this, I'm sure. Um, mainly, lots of useful information, but um, very detailed, and we can use it if we need to. So this is my summary of land classification, and I promise I'm almost finished. Uh, the LUC is probably too coarse for our purposes. The S map is probably too much detail, so let's just be Goldilocks and choose the resource which is just right. And in our case, we've got this rather wonderful document, the soil map of the Heratonga Plains, which in fact, um, if you know how to interpret it and, and read that, what it means in terms of imperfect, poor, etc., it, it can be very good. And my experience by looking at the Heratonga Plains, although not always the case, because of just where we are with our climate, most factors being held constant some decisions are primarily easy to be based on soil drainage class alone. Um, that's not always the case. There are pumice soils to be considered, etc. cetera, but, but that's a general uh, rule of thumb. Um, and now at the very end, I'm just pulling in the, um, 
the draft national policy statement, which is what we're moving towards for highly productive land. Um, and my reading of the, uh, of the document is that councils are to use the default criteria. In other words, they're almost being suggested to use LUC classes 1, 2, and 3, which I've already kind of criticised against, because, they're, because they are already defined as highly productive land. Um, but then councils can consider exclusions or other inclusions. And in this case, um, well, depending on the suitability of climate, size of land properties, which is alarming, to be honest, but uh, water availability, which is clearly important, and also access to transport and labour, because you want to be able to do something with what, what you've got. Um, and so uh, applying that to here to the Hiratonga Plains, uh, first of all, we take the rough cut of classes one, two, and three, uh, then we obviously include the excessively drained shallow and gravelly soils because we know th the value of that resource. Um, and we, we can include wetter soils if we think we can mitigate against the uh, disadvantages. In, in many cases we can. And perhaps we exclude the pumice-based soils because they're not very fertile and they do have low permeability and they can be quite difficult to, um, to work with. Um, that's, my, that's my final slide. Um, I, just as a finishing uh, note, though, I did recall getting approached by Bunnings, same thing that Brent worked on, and um, they, they became disinterested when I made it clear that, well, actually, looking at your soils, <laughs> I'd have to say they're pretty nice soils. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, fair enough. Um, and, and so thank you very much once again, as I said, for inviting me here, and hopefully that's been of some, of some foundational background. Cool. Thank you very much indeed, Keith. Um, I was approached by Bunnings, in fact, sacked by them for not getting the, uh, the council hearing successfully consented, so um, we've all had our experience there. Goodness, uh, the Mediterranean climate, where's that gone? Perhaps we'll have to ask Kathleen. Um, I was very struck by your reference to uh, alluvium, the three rivers coalescing, precisely the Heratonga, all the tying together, uh, which Nahiwi shared with us. Thank you so much Thanks. for unpacking... Uh, for I guess putting a framework around the soils classification system for us, a great benefit for the conversation to follow. I'd just like to offer you a small gift of appreciation uh, to, oh, well, thank you. Uh, oh, for your effort and time <laughs> in uh, sharing your insights and uh, expertise with us. Thank you, Mark. All right, look. We do have an hour to go uh, before lunch. If you do need to slope off and... Uh, Use the, use the uh, bathrooms, you please feel free to do that. But I think we do need to press on in the interests of time. Um, our next session is entitled Other Risks to Our Soils and Some Solutions. And our first presenter, who I'd like to now invite to the stage, is uh, uh, Dan Bloomer. Um, Paige Bloomer Associates, Principal Dan Bloomer, uh, provides consultancy and project management services, come up if you like, to the agriculture and horticulture industry. He has considerable, considerable experience working with New Zealand primary production and natural resources and is recognised for connecting farmers, researchers, technologists and policy makers. Uh, I'm not allowed to read all of this, but I will share this. Dan's passion is helping farmers produce uh, sustainably. Uh, and Dan was heavily involved in developing codes and assessing tools for smarter farming, including irrigation in New Zealand. Uh, NZ Good Practice Guidelines in 2019, Dan began study towards his PhD around about the time they notified the uh, NPS on productive soils. So for, for Dan to share where he's got to with that and uh, his contributions to today's forum, so I hand you over. In the middle. I think so. Excellent. Right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about soil loss and in particular looking at water erosion, wind erosion, degradation and I'm not going to talk about urbanisation because others are doing that but it's probably where you know, it's a pretty passionate thing about mine. And I do want to talk about water management too and Kia ora Nahiwi for making sure that we don't separate the two. Your blood and bone go together pretty well and soil and water the same, and people have, that theme's going to keep coming back. Um, but we will talk briefly about some of the water and the sense of soils. And I want to talk a little bit about resilient systems or the ability to bounce back and how that fits. 
So just starting off, this is land capability for the Hira Tonga. And what we're looking at here is um, the, the darker the green bits, the easier they are to produce really good stuff on. And the darker the red bits, the more we need to do to make them highly productive. So the harder, more effort to do. So I've spent my whole life here. I, I sort of grew up on Mataruahau, and I'm old enough to have driven through the country to Otatara to visit my grandparents. And the change I've seen in my lifetime, I'll say, contributes to my fear for the future and my passion for looking after our soil resources and our water because it's not what it was when we were kids. I don't know what it would be like if we carry on at those rates for the same amount of time that I've been on the planet. So this bit here, it's not the darkest green because it's pretty wet, but we can grow really good stuff there if we can deal with the drainage. We also seem to be pretty good at building houses on it. This is a wet bit too, but again, highly productive if we do the drainage, which is why we're putting retirement homes on it. It's not called Swamp Road for nothing. Conversely, this is cactus country, and it's been brought up today already. It's pretty useless stuff, really. A quarter of a sheep per 10 hectares, or the world's best wine. This stuff here, if you open it up, blows away. And so does this stuff here, very light soils. This stuff here is really, really good. So is this, so is this, so is this, and so is this. So these are the soils that are the most versatile, the most productive, the easiest to get good stuff off if you look after them. So how are we losing soils? Well, water is one of the, one of the tools, or one of the, the mechanisms by which we lose, lose our soil. And we're used to that. And Nahiwi, again, thank you, because we dis you introduced the concept of the rivers and how what we've done is we've tamed the river, which means we no longer replenish the soil. We send it all out into the ocean instead, where it's... One day we might have Hira Tonga going out to a line between Mahia and Cape Kidnappers, but it's going to be quite a way before we get there. Um, this is what water can do if it's not contained properly. Now, this is actually um, not Hawke's Bay. But if you don't have your drains right and you let the water spill out across cultivated soil, you lose it really fast. This could be anywhere in New Zealand or anywhere on the planet. It's the same thing, just at a smaller scale. But there's a lot of it frequently, so we lose potentially soil in that way. And we need to do management so we don't do that. One of the things we can do is just avoid cultivation, because if we don't cultivate soils, don't open them up, don't expose them, they're far more able to hold themselves together. You know, nature does a good job of this stuff. So this is an example of no-till planting. So it's the paddock that was actually come out of sweet corn going straight back into grass without any further cultivation. Um, this is a more extreme example of just planting straight into the grass. And in this case here, it might be sprayed off afterwards or it might just be left to grow through as a new pasture. Here's an example of trying to retain soil when it's all cultivated up again. This is from work I've done in Levin, in Horo Whenua. And this is a farm growing vegetables. And you can see where the rows go. And you can see some patches in there that look a bit brown, particularly on the right-hand end. And that's because it keeps drowning all the time. I used a computer model to look at how water flowed when it rained. And the blue lines show the water going down the rows. But even now and then the water builds up and then it bursts out and it spills from one to the other and starts working its way off down, down the paddock. And you see the red bits are where there's enough water to be at erosive velocities. And we end up with this, which is a photo taken from that paddock. So the computer is a marvellous tool. And I asked the computer, what would happen if we grew our, grew our rows 90 degrees differently? And it said, well, actually, it'd be quite good. You get the water to all flow to one end, but it wouldn't get to those damaging velocities. So I told the farmer that, and he told me I was really clever, and I just said thank you, and he's changed all his rows, and now he doesn't lose crop, and he doesn't lose soil. These are some other things we can do to keep the soil back from water. So the two pictures on the right is what's called furrow diking. So going along with a machine that makes a little scoop and creates little dams all the way down the, the rows, so the water then gets held up, it settles, it slows, it can soak in, it can drop sediment, and then it moves on and moves on. So that's a really good thing to do. 
The ones on the right, the top one is another example from Levin where Woodhaven Gardens have put huge areas into grass. They know that they're going to get some soil movement when it rains because, boy, does it rain in Levin. Um, but the water, the dirty water coming off the end of the paddock will go through that grass and it will collect all of the sediments before it gets into the drain into Lake Orofenua. So they've contributed a lot of area to catching soil, so at least it's still held in the environment or in the farm. The bottom right is a Pukekohe solution. If you're going to spill all the soil down the hill, then catch it in the great big tank and every year or two dig it out and take it to the back of the hill and start again. So again, it's a way of stopping it going through town into the supermarket, which it had been doing. All right, wind, wind erosion. This is a good Hawke's Bay photo, Central Hawke's Bay. Um, Alan Griffiths, when I worked with him as part of my apprenticeship at Regional Council, told me that when they chopped the forest down in Central Hawke's Bay, they lost 800 millimetres of soil in the first few years while they tried to grow wheat. So now we've got soils which are very shallow and stony, but they didn't used to be. They used to be really big ones, and it's the volcanic ash that was laid across the gravels, and now has disappeared. So wind erosion is associated again with cultivation. And when I did work for a regional council some decades ago, I was told, we want you as a land management guy, we don't want you going to the hills, stay on the high value flat land. All you have to do is fix wind erosion and irrigation. So having asked what to do after lunch, well, I got set about doing that. And um, it became a fascinating thing. So this is a map of Hawke's Bay. The yellow bits are moderately exposed to loss of wind. Orange bits severely and you'll see that's all through Tikakino, uh, Onga Onga, that area through there where these soils, if they opened up, blow away. So what can we do about that? Well, the obvious thing is don't cultivate. So how can we produce stuff if we're trying to do vegetable cropping without cultivating? So here are some solutions. Top left is uh, Pakipak, where there was asparagus growing on very light soils, and what they did was they planted strips of... Uh, barley in this case, so when the wind blew the sediment got trapped in the barley. Uh, we did some work that turned into the Landwise program over the years which has been going since 1999 now, helping farmers look after their soils and produce sustainably. And through that we experimented with strip tillage and give Hugh Ritchie huge credit for the investment he privately made into equipment to make strip tillage possible. So these are examples of that. Um, the bottom left is actually Arapawa Nui, where the soil is extremely sandy and when the wind blows up from the sea, it'll just abrade the plants off. So as well as losing the soil, you lose the plants. But if you leave the thatch there, when the sand grains start to bounce, they get caught in the grass and nothing happens. The soil stays right there, so it's protected. The two on the, the right are actually Hughes farming system. So the top one, he's created a system where you can go through and just spray off a narrow strip and then he comes back with a strip till machine and cultivates only that narrow strip leaving the rest of the soil undisturbed and the thatch there to protect it. So it's a really simple solution and Hugh spent the last 20 years perfecting that. So he's got some of the most beautiful soils in Hawke's Bay that are cropped, partly because of this process and partly because he and his father have always looked after the soil with long-term rotations and been very careful with it. But it's, it's great stuff and a joy to work with. So degradation, I'm just, we're just going to talk about compaction. There's also issues with contamination. And Brent Clothier did some work years ago on what's the implications of a million bits of wood treated with copper chrome arsenate stuck into the ground. And there are other issues as well with contamination, but that's, not beyond, that's outside what I want to talk about today. So compaction is when... We take the soil, and Keith talked about soil peds and structure and the openness of the soil. Compaction means we've done enough force on it that we've just crushed it down so it's, it can't breathe anymore. So you get great big hard lumps, air can't get through, water can't get through, roots can't get through, so we can't access the nutrients, we can't access the water, and the plants just don't survive or don't do it all well. So compaction can be seen as a bad thing, um, particularly happens when you drive on it. Most of our cropping and orcharding requires people to drive on things. So 
we've got a bit of a dilemma. What can we do about that? Um, this is an example which isn't deep compaction in the soil from years of driving. It's just because the soil's been worked a lot and it's lost its organic matter and it's lost its structure, so when it rains it all collapses and we form a crust on the surface. And that can prevent seed coming through. The, the silver lining, I guess, is it's shallow, it's on the surface and we can deal with it relatively easily. But it's a pre precursor of more damage and if we're seeing that, we're probably not in the right space. This is um, controlled traffic farming. So I worked with David Clark in Gisborne, and David farms at Manatuke on Manatuke clay loam, which makes a Hawke's Bay heavy soil look like the lightest, fluffiest stuff you've ever had. And he was concerned that his production was going down and his soils were getting harder to manage, and he was trying to be light on his soils. But he adopted this practice of controlled traffic farming, and that photo shows that his equipment all matches, and so everything is done on six metre widths, and the wheel tracks all go in exactly the same places. So effectively, he's got roads in his paddock that he drives on, and that's great because these compacted zones carry the big equipment without it getting bogged, and when it's wet, they seem to carry the traffic far better as well. And he's got gardens, and the soil between those tracks is beautiful and you can work your hand into the clay soil up to here without actually needing to use a spade. So having taken the load off and looked after it, it's healed itself and it's built new properties. So we can do that, and increasingly with automatic driving tractors that are on the same places, if we line our equipment up, this almost becomes a default position where we have roads and gardens. And as um, James Power used to say, woe betide the kid who walked on the veggie garden. Granddad would get stuck into them. David Clark had a big sign at the gate. He had a health and safety sign this big and a sign this big saying, controlled traffic farm, don't drive anywhere but the road. And he would boot anybody off and they weren't allowed back on if they drove on his paddocks. So water. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to talk about irrigation other than to say that it's really, really handy in a Mediterranean climate if you want to produce stuff in summer. And it's one of the reasons that we're so successful. I do want to talk a little bit about infiltration. And so we can naturally recharge our soil with rain if we can hold the water there long enough to soak into the soil. And if we do that, we keep it so infiltration and retention can sort of go together. So again, this was that machine that was making little things which stops the water running away. And this is an example of it being used. Actually, I stole this one from Paul Johnson's work in Levin as well. But you can see that as well as where they've put the little furrow dikes in on the left-hand side, this water's actually soaked in. Where they haven't, as a control and experiment, the water's run down the wheel tracks, built up speed and actually carried sediment from one end to the other and so the soil's moving, you're losing the water and the soil. So we can do things to aid, aid that. We want to look after the soil so it can soak up the rain because that's free irrigation and it's really, really good stuff. The next piece, of course, is drainage, so too much of a good thing. And the, I cut my horticultural teeth in Miani, uh, both growing gherkins in the loop um, and experiencing some very, very wet seasons and knowing what drainage necessary was. And then later on I grew kiwi fruit in Miani. And again, if you didn't have the um, subsurface drainage in Miani, it was going to make life pretty horrible for your apples or your kiwi fruit. So subsurface drainage is part of Hook Space um, history since we started doing high value horticulture. And it's, it's good stuff. The other thing you can do is look actually about making sure that the land shape allows the water to move. So while we want water to soak in and get that, we don't want too much water sitting around too long because it drowns things. So you might notice around the Hiratonga nowadays, there's quite a lot of work where soil is being moved around to make, make a level surface so water can drain in a controlled way from one end to the other rather than ponding and causing problems. So that's some work being done at our research site in uh, Ruhapia Road. And you can see from the top of it, there used to be great big areas in there that just browned out and bogged up and now the water runs to an end where we've got a great big grass strip that will catch any sediment that does move. 
we actually applied that technology as well into orchards because there were problems with water ponding in orchards and they were driving up and down and up and down and make big ruts and people would end up slipping over, twisting ankles and tractors would get stuck and they couldn't do the operations. But with the smarts of computing and high accuracy GPS and ingenuity, it's now possible to do a lot of work around solving some of these problems. So resilience, <coughs> that's one resilient plant. We need to have systems that can bounce back from adverse events. And if we look at climate change predictions, we're going to get more adverse events, whether they be longer droughts or bigger floods or more horrible things. So this idea of resilience is really important. And some of the things that we're doing aren't that good for resilience. If we're wearing our soils out and burning off the carbon, making them more prone to compaction, making them less able to hold on to themselves, we're kind of going in the wrong direction. So let's have a think about some alternatives. Now, regenerative agriculture is the buzzword at the moment, and it's one that creates quite a lot of angst and camps. And you know once you get people forming camps that you've already kind of lost, right? So it's hard to get dialogue going when people have already got a corner. But this, the idea of regenerative practices, they're pretty simple, really. So the first thing is try and minimise disturbance. And I've worked on a farm where we did some trial work, and by minimising disturbance, because we did some no-till sweet corn and some cultivated sweet corn, after 90 days I could measure the difference in soil quality. So you can do things quite quickly if you stop driving on them and chopping them up. The soil's got quite an amazing ability to look after itself. If you keep the soil covered, then when the raindrops come down, they don't beat all those little peds up and create that capping. And if you make sure that you've got some living roots in the system at all times, they're holding it together, they're holding the nutrients back, they're soaking up the free nutrients, they're releasing them later, and there's the whole soil microbiome. So I, I live with a human nutritionist who's going on about the gut microbiome, and everything she tells me I find a parallel in the soil microbiome. And it's something that we don't understand and we need to learn a lot more about. It's been too hard historically because we don't know how to do it and you can't see it because it's hidden under the ground. But DNA testing and things like that's making us far, far wiser. The trouble we've got is people keep finding species that they can't classify because they're not plants, they're not animals, they're not really fungi and they don't know what to do with them. But it's absolutely critical to the functioning of the soil and if there's not living stuff there, it all breaks down. Um, and the other principle is diversity and introducing grazing animals. So how are we going? Because I hear farmers saying, we're already doing that. And I think some are. And compared to North American feedlot farming and maize for 50 years, we are pretty good. But we can do better. And we need to think about looking forward and trying to improve whether incrementally or not. So some of the good practices is here in the strip till, the no till, we've got diverse lot of cropping. Um, but here we've got, on the right hand side, is a, a thing called a roller crimper. So rather than spraying a crop off, they've done technology where you can drive across and it crushes the plants in little strips, which seems to be enough to kill it and let it actually support the soil and support things while a new crop comes through. The bottom pictures are using a range of plants as cover crops between your main crops. So typically what we do here is some, some ryegrass on it, but people are starting to use, well, not starting, this is Scott Lawson from about 15, 20 years ago, um, mixed crops that he's been using to restore health into the soil. And the other one is these damn cows. Now, cows are a really good thing to, to be rude about at the moment. You know, they're the whipping boy, even if they are a girl, of farming. But there's a lot of work to show that bovine into a system is quite important. And again, it's part of it comes back to their weight pushing biomass into the soil where it's, it's digested by other things. And part of it's to do with their gut microbiota and the soil uh, microbiota having some links, which are beyond my comprehension at this stage, but something I'm fascinated by. So is regen actually viable? Well, we've got a project that we're trying to get going called Carbon Positive. And Landwise Group has joined up with the Future Farming Trust to, to push this along. And so what we're trying to do is, is um, investigate this. So at our micro farm, 
we're proposing to split that up into three management systems with four replicates, so we've got some good statistics. And we'll run, basically, <coughs> asking this question, do regenerative practices make a difference in intensive field cropping? So we will run a conventional intensive horticultural intensive cropping system. We will run what's called a fully regenerative system and some kind of hybrid in the middle. And we will measure, 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 measure. And it's a lot of hole digging and a whole lot of testing to find out what's going on. And then we'll look at those best practices alongside other attempts to try and build soil carbon and get that sponge working as well as it can. Um, <coughs> bonus topic, I'm not going to talk about this protected cropping thing because Scott's going to talk about this in quite a lot of detail, but it's a, in my mind it's a way of protecting that production of the ground. So if you're investing a whole lot of money in trying to grow stuff and then it gets hailed out or it gets flooded out or it gets blown out or something or other else, it's kind of wasted a lot of that effort. The bottom picture is a leader brand in Gisborne putting in 30 hectares of, of greenhouse. That's a, that's a big project. But when you look at the production impacts they get when Gisborne keeps getting these big massive rain events, you can see why for food security of those kind of crops we need to do something rather clever. And clever in this case is one hell of a lot of money. I'll ask another question, which is do we actually need soil anyway? Because we can grow things in plastic tubes. So we've had hydroponics since I started being trained. Nowadays people are stacking those hydroponics on top of one another in tiers. In fact, they've got rid of the glass house and just shoved them in a container or in the basement of a building and using LED lights. One of the things you'll notice about these is they're all fresh leafy greens that grow in about a week and a half. And you won't see people trying to grow cereals, potatoes, carrots, or some of these other crops in these systems. And they certainly don't have any apple orchards growing inside a container that I'm aware of. So I think there's a role for this kind of intensive farming and production of herbal things and very fast growing things and why not grow your, your plants near the, near the point of consumption if you can. But I do think we need to protect the soils for other purposes. One of which seems to be um, growing electricity by harvesting it. I did some work on growing biofuel crops and found out that I could get more energy per hectare by covering it in photovoltaic cells than I could by trying to grow something for oil. So that set me off to thinking a whole lot of questions about what was the best use of that land. Just because it can grow crops, if the crop I'm trying to grow is energy, maybe I should do the best thing for energy. But then I got into a small problem because I started beating myself on the head and gave up. <laughs> but I do think it's possible to do both. And there's a company you've heard of called Bayvar, or you might call it Baywa or TNG. But Bayvar is one of the biggest solar energy companies in the world. And there's some fascinating work going on about using double land use, if you like, cropping under solar panels. And I think for Hawke's Bay, with our Mediterranean climate, some of these things, if we think really, really cleverly, we can get a lot more from the same land without taking more of it for other purposes. And that's me. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. You have an evident genius about you and you have been quietly going away, literally, uh, about your work safeguarding the life-supporting capacity of our region, and uh, you had some most um, interesting and informative insights to share uh, with us about that. So we'd just like to offer you a brief uh, token of appreciation, but could you just send those maps through, the, uh, the soils maps and, and the other maps that you showed, I think they'd be a really great start for a spatial plan, so send them through to, to Mayor Sandra and <laughs> Mayor Kirsten before you go, well, after, you, after you go. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. Mm -hmm. Kilda, that was wonderful. Thanks for having the day. It's a brilliant day to have. Good. For you being here, it is. And it's a perfect segue to uh, Scott Lawson, uh, who you've just heard mentioned. Um, growing up in Hawke's Bay, Scott uh, spent his youth dabbling and growing vegetables. I think he's done a lot more than dabbling since. A quick trip home from school at lunchtime to check on his crops was part of what he loved to do. So with over 30 years, uh, or 30 seasons of growing under his belt, uh, his innovation and passion for growing and enjoying a healthy, sustainable lifestyle is the driving force behind True Earth's certified uh, organic 
blueberries. Scott has always felt it important to give back to the community and has been actively involved in many off-farm uh, farming groups and he's currently on the boards of Organic Aotearoa New Zealand and uh, much to our delight in the Regional Council, uh, Hawke's Bay's uh, Future Farming Trust. So, um, Scott, over to you. Wonderful to hear from you. Marlene Oil, please bear with me while I get my technology sorted here. I'm more comfortable driving a tractor than I am a PowerPoint presentation, so I'll work through this. So, um, a little bit of intro, I guess. I'm just following on um, from what Martin said as well, too, and, and thank you to Dan as well. Um, I've been um, born and bred here in, in Hawke's Bay. My, if you like to say it, the, the Pākehā Pepeha is, is coming. My, my father's from from Manawa too. My mother was from Kaiti in Gisborne, um, and I was uh, brought up in Camberley, just behind in the um, the Hastings Fire Station, which used to be paddocks in those days. And um, I was born in the Fallen Soldiers Memorial Hospital, and I used to walk across um, as a, a kindergarten child, walk across the Mahu Road to the kindergarten in Frimley. I wouldn't want my grandchildren doing that these days. So um, things have changed pretty quickly in time and I was lucky enough to have a father who was um, very financially savvy and worked hard and he used to lease land while he was working in an office in Hastings for a transport company and he spent his lifetime with, um, with Sherwood Transport and Hawke's Bay Transport Holdings, the farmers transport in those days. And he used to lease land and then um, the paddock opposite the hospital um, we used to grow beans in there as kids as well too, and that's now in housing. So in a short space of time, um, we've seen a lot of change. And when I was five years old, we moved out to a block that my father was renting down the Mar um, Ormond Road. And consequently, he bought that uh, a few years later. And we sold that and we moved out to Tower at um, Bridge Park, Royce Hill, in the early 90s. Um, that land is quite, that I was brought up on as a kid, is actually now in concrete in Delegates Winery. And um, that was some of the most fertile soil we'd seen and been involved with as, as family growing. Um, some other land that I used to lease when I was at school is now going to cool stores at Poker 2, with turners and drives as well too. And um, uh, I've, as, as said there, I used to travel in the, my seventh form year, I'd go to, to work in the fields before and after school somewhat distracted with my schooling and so I didn't take my schooling much further than that and actually went back to the fields of farming. So I spent most of my time here in Hiratonga. Um, I associate myself with the Nauraura and the Turakuri, spent a lot of time up in the hills. Um, as kids we, we fished and eel the rivers and streams around Twyford um, and used to um, push bike to Twyford school every morning and that was quite intensive in those days and it's good to see it changed a bit. We used to arrive at school in a homespun jerseys covered in smelling a spray. And then somebody wisened up to it and said, hey, why don't we stop spraying these kids while they're biking to school? In the mornings, we won't spray the roadside between sort of eight and nine in the morning and, and between three and four in the afternoon. And that included um, our school field as well too, around the school. So that was quite helpful actually. So um, I, I sort of come from a reactionary stage, I guess, in, in the way that I've been brought up in a very intensive environment. I've seen some change over time, um, and I've changed my own growing practices towards certified organics, which is actually a really hard ask, uh, but it's what sits well with me and my philosophy, um, and that's where I like to see my future and my time and my efforts spent. So <clears throat> um, I am involved with the Hawke's Bay Future Farming Trust, and we thank the Regional Council for our seeding fund money with that. Um, we have nine trustees, um, all actively involved in adding value, and um, a lot of time is spent um, looking at what the future of farming in Hawke's Bay is doing. We're doing a little bit of work on the plains, but we're trying to do a lot of work up on the catchments. Um, our hardest part is engaging with MPI, um, and it's also difficult to know to engage with EWI in which area as well too, and we need to do a lot more work on that. Um, and we're getting some really good buy-in from farmers who are knowing that there needs to be change made. So. Um, that's really, really pleasing to see because in the past you'd hear the, um, the old saying, bugger off, don't tell us what, where, what to do with our own soils. They think they own the land title, 
they don't own, own the right to destroy that land. So, And there's more and more pressure coming on, obviously, from our community in there as well. So um, my views are my personal views, uh, not necessarily those of the trust either. So, um, But that's um, because I haven't run this presentation past fellow trustees either, so I'm just winging it and, and we, we'll get it, get it through. So, you're the right way here. So I really thought that today I'd, I'd take the, the um, topic of from cover crops to covered crops, and as Dan's mentioned, we're, we're looking at a lot more investment in our horticultural stuff. These, um, this is a crop of mustard here, and it's what we would use typically to build our soil, organic matters, uh, and eventually what we're trying to do is aim to get more humus in our soils. Um, it's also used as a biofumigant, as a soil conditioner, etc. Pit fruit growers are using it. You'll often see it um, planted around some orchards now as well too. So um, as a vegetable grower in the past, um, I just now focus on blueberries these days, but in the past this was a, this was a really key component, trying to feed the soil, the soil will feed the plants. And that's a bit of a mantra of our saying, healthy soil, healthy food for a healthy community. And I guess the, the opposite of that is rubbish in is rubbish out. And we see that with some of our takeaway foods we're having these days. So we go from our cover crops to our covered crops. And this is um, an example, actually, without naming names, a neighbour of mine growing blueberries um, on what is a large expanse of glass house, similar to what Dan's talking about being um, built in Gisborne. This company um, has a lot of glass houses around New Zealand. And um, this is adopting a Canadian system called the Cravo Tunnels. And they're retractable roofs. So you'll see these roofs um, either on a hot day or a cold day retracting and moving as the computers tell them what to do. A spot of rain arrives, the roofs close up. Um, underneath that is bird netting as well too, and on the sides of bird netting. But as I say there, it involves a large investment. Um, there's a lot of concrete in there, there's a lot of steel, a lot of plastic, uh, but there's a lot of output of the crop produced as well too. And just saying that the, these systems are now going to soilless growing as well too. So um, I, I struggle with the concept myself because I find it really hard to find a, 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 a dynamic, biologically active soil in a pot. That's not my philosophy with things, so that's where we are. Um, the, this, this is not for small-scale growers either. It's, it's, it's very uh, much associated with corporates or large-scale businesses, so it's a barrier to, to what we're what centering there. So this is an example of some cover crops. This is oats and vetch in here. Um, easy to grow, still expensive at $350 a hectare, but um, if you feed the soil well and look after it, it'll return that, and particularly in high-value crops really hard to do in low value crops and the likes of arable crops, wheat, barley production, um, to a lesser extent maize. Um, but we see people that are doing maize really well and putting a lot of um, effort into looking after the structure of the soil and, and adding, adding to it in such a way like this and compost and things, they get a real benefit out of that. These are some of our crops in the past with carrots for instance and the and the photo to the, um, to the left shows the um, rows of carrots grown in a bed situation. And one thing we always did was this furrow diking and ruffling up the hard wheel tracks to let the water dissipate sideways rather than gather momentum and run to the low part of the field. We have also done some levelling in the past and that was really hard on the soil structures when you have a, a shallow soil. One thing you might notice in that, in that photo sort of halfway up the page there is um, the difference in the growth rates of the carrots, and that's because they were growing underneath these, um, these crop covers. Um, in this case, what we call insect mesh, um, and on the right, the potatoes growing under the same insect mesh, so these crops are used in multiple crops as well too. The reason um, that we um, had to go to using these crop covers was um, basically because we had a biosecurity incursion with potatoes and tomatoes in New Zealand. In 2006, the TPP, the tomato potato salad, arrived in New Zealand. And in 2006 in Auckland, and then by 2008 it was in Hawke's Bay, destroying our home gardens and all of our commercial fields of tomatoes, potatoes and everything. 
Um, and conventional growers um, had made really good gains in reducing insecticides and everything. Well, we went back 30 years, unfortunately, um, trying to control this pest, and all the old chemicals have had to come out and get used. So as an organic grower, this is a way that I could control it as well too, so I use an exclusion um, in that. Um, people said this is all right for small little organic growers like myself, but it actually came from um, large-scale conventional growers in Scotland, and they um, developed this. I think it's on my next slide. Um, they developed this uh, because they actually um, couldn't farm without it. So it's made of HDPE. Um, when the piles and stacks of new nets arrive like that, then what do you do with it? Um, you've got to think about the end life cycle of this. And I think people are buying or, or, the, or the retailers are selling a lot of stuff and not concerned about what happens downstream. So this end of life recycling is something you need to be really concerned with. This net winding machine is still in Hawke's Bay. Gareth Holder now uses it on his salad vegetables, which is great to see it's still here. Um, designed and built in the UK. Um, and this is this wonder mesh that I was referring to there. So the mesh that we use is 0.6 of a mil. That's actually a good pest there being excluded. That's a little parasitic wasp being excluded there. Um, so it can exclude um, good and bad from there as well too, but primarily we wanted to keep the tomato potato salad out of there. One thing we learned that was when we excluded some um, predators and, and parasitic wasps like this to control the aphids, um, aphids actually laid through that net as well too. So um, when an aphid gives birth, it also, a baby that it's giving birth to is already giving birth again. So hence the, the multiplication factor is, is tenfold underneath that crop. So you would be really careful about trying to find some balance with your ecology in there. A little bit of a plug there for the um, biological husbandry unit at Lincoln, um, which has received very little funding and support over the years. It's not part of Lincoln University, but a subset. And Dr. Charles Murfield um, has uh, worked around the world. He's one of the few um, gurus we have in New Zealand on, on science in that area. And he brought these products back to New Zealand and encouraged some of us to get going with it. And from a hope gardener's point of view, you can buy smaller patches of this and use it in your, in your gardens for potatoes and that. Because as I was saying before, people that used to grow good potatoes and good tomatoes in their, in their gardens um, prior to the psyllid arriving can remember the days and now we really struggle. So uh, another, another crop um, cover that we use in, in plastics in our, in our farming systems is this um, black mulch. Um, and it's a soft plastic and it's actually cheap to buy, reasonably easy to lay, but damn hard to recover properly. And really hard to get out of the fields later on. Um, and it's hard because it actually gets torn and ripped and, and you end up with little micro pieces everywhere. Um, we tried bio, biodegradable mulches ourselves in the past. This is, this is not my field. This is actually a shot I've grabbed off the internet from, um, from the supplier. I think it's in Holland somewhere, this one. But um, we tried biodegradable mulches, but um, there's a little way to go with that um, in figuring out the life cycle of those because sometimes they don't last long enough for the crop. If you use them in strawberries, for instance, you need a year, if not two years out of it, and then for it to break down. Sometimes they'll break down in a few months, all the damage, etc. cetera. So. Um, it's, it's microplastics, I think, in our farming environment is something to be really concerned about. So here's an example of weed mat um, on the left, and, and this is actually uh, weed mat not working so well. It's a, it's a grass that's actually pushing up through the weed mat, so you have to know your species and know what you're doing in that area. It'll easily control annual weeds and the likes, but, but less um, easy to, to control the um, difficult grasses like um, cooch and doob, um, kakua and the likes of that. Um, the photo on the right is actually one of frost cloth, and there's lots of different even types of frost cloth as well too. Once again, um, needs to, we need to find a way to recycle the stuff. Eco mulch mats, and you might see um, Waka Katahi Transit New Zealand using this on the sides of their um, roadsides to stop um, silt and everything running off as well too. Well, we use that in the, in the orchard situations and fields now as well. 
Um, it's hellishly expensive um, and it's not always practical. We've tried one um, that's actually a layer of shredded uh, paper in amongst heavy cardboard. Um, the birds loved it and tore it apart in no time at all. So, um, so there's, there's lots of barriers to this. It's normal farming. You've got to find your way around it and there's, there's things to do there. So. I'm really just saying that, um, actually I'll go back to the slide, when we, when we run this stuff like this weed mat, um, for those of in your home gardens or something, you can imagine underneath that, um, you're excluding a lot of the biology that's happening under there and you remove that weed mat after a year or two and it's just like concrete. Um, so it's not, not such a good cover for us either. Um, and this breathable mulch mats or coir as we're, as we're using as well too, um, we don't need to recover it from the soil, we can let it degrade and add to the, add to the soil with that. Um, some semi-permanent covers, this one on the left is actually me mucking around with some onion seed production, that square box is a, um, it excludes pests that can um, spread pollen, so um, it's, it's a fine bio net actually, an insect mesh. Um, the one on the right is just an example of some shade, shade covers. Um, and as we talked about with the weather and the climate, um, we're Mediterranean, but we weren't so Mediterranean this year, um, 350 mils in our main blueberry harvest season for ourselves in February, March. Um, so as, as soft fruit growers and grape growers, we, we took a hiding this year, and that's why you're seeing more and more investment in these covers in Hawke's Bay around the place. Um, this one on the left is a Massey University trial, just bird net um, and some seed production. The one on the right is a, a small flexi tunnel, um, typically 100 metres long, 4 metres wide, um, developed by a grower in Christchurch, all places there. Um, this one is a small man-made home-built almost structure, just covering some blueberries with some rain covers that fold down. And the danger is in our hot climate here, if you um, leave these covers down, you can actually get too hot under there, so you can protect your fruit from rain, but you can also cook your fruit as well. Different structures. This is an old shoulder belt of mine at home, which has been up for more than 15 years. Um, and I just put it out there just saying, we, we use these artificial plastics and that in our, in our farming situations, um, but we don't always know what's necessarily going on. Um, so is this leaching from the poly clips that are clipping the, the netting to the wire or is it the leaching from the galvanised wire or something? But it just says to me that whatever is there is um, actually hindering the lichen growth on the... Um, and this is north facing too, on a north facing um, sunny shoulder belt on them. So I guess it's the old mantra with every yin there's a yang, isn't there? And, and positive and negatives and things. So. Um, this is extended A that we use in blueberries um, and it's widely used um, in apples and there's trials going on in grapes as well too and that's to increase our light reflectiveness both um, underneath our hail net covers and also um, out in the open fields as well. Uh, blueberries are developed as an understory, um, have evolved sorry, from an understory forest where they, they um, like moisture, wet roots, not too wet, but, but moist roots, um, no wind and only a little bit of light, but we take them out of that environment, cultivate them up, and they actually um, need a fair bit of light to kick them along and get their sugar bricks levels up. Uh, and that's a photo of one of our backpackers. Um, that's a few years old, that photo, because we don't have backpackers in Hawke's Bay anymore. Um, they were the backbone of our work, and those of us who travelled overseas and did all those fantastic jobs, we miss them, we welcome them back, um, and I hope our government opens the borders up. They're talking about maybe 2024 to the working holiday scheme. Um, let's get that open up a bit earlier. And also today on um, Radio New Zealand, the Gospel, um, I heard that they're actually increasing the immigration costs for people coming to apply for a work visa. So. Um, if there's anything we can do, we need to encourage people to come to Hawke's Bay a bit more. Um, we're now more reliant on RSE workers in our own situation. Um, and they're fantastic people. And when we talk about our Trans-Pacific partnerships and things, and I remind the Solomon Islanders of my grandfathers that fought in the Solomon Islands uh, for their own freedom and our freedom as well. And there's, there's geopolitical issues going on there too. 
So we make this investment in covered cropping for this reason. This is looking outside my office window. I'm sorry I didn't have a photo of the crop getting hailed because I didn't have a, an umbrella handy or, nor a raincoat. Um, these events are, are, are few and far between, thankfully, but by crikey, they're damaging when they arrive. And many of you may remember the 1994 hail storm of Hawke's Bay that took $50 million of fruit crop out of our area. Um, and a five-time multiplication factor, that, that's a lot of money in 94. I'd hate to see something like that happen now. So that's why we go and build these sorts of structures, these, these covered cropping. Um, typically the first thing we do is um, we go and fell some trees because we don't want the trees falling on the structures. So that removes a bit of biodiversity from our area, um, creates a few hazards in the process, but it's a bit of fun, um, but it's bloody hard work and it's expensive removing trees and it's dangerous, and it's even harder trying to replant that same amount of, of be it carbon or, or um, biodiversity as well too into our systems now. Um, <clears throat> now in our situation here, we built a, a net pro um, hail net system, which is designed, it's a, it's a solid structure working on, on wooden poles tied back into the ground with, um, Latty's made us some big screw anchors we put on the ground instead of using posts buried in the ground. So there's some smart things you can do to reduce the amount of tantalised timber in the ground. Um, the idea is that the hail, um, when the hail lands on these structures, it stretches down to the ground and then the, the, um, the hail slowly melts and away we go. One of the bigger problems with this big flat roof netting is the uplift. Um, the steel poles you can see in the middle, each one of those poles is designed for an 800 kg per pole uplift. So you're trying to pin this stuff down um, and stop it blowing away. Um, this is uh, actually just retensioning some nets because we didn't get it right the first time. So once we'd planted, typically you'll, you'll fell the trees, your land level, as Dan mentioned, or surface optimization, which means a lot of diesel, a lot of, a lot of machinery, uh, leveling the land out, and then you plant. Um, and in our case here, we're retenching some nets because they weren't done properly in the first place. But you can see the issues of trying to get in and around existing crop structure. And I've got a, a brother of mine's an apple grower, and he's doing something similar to this actually over some um, G2. Um, G2 is the system he's putting up over some MV apples at the moment. Um, but it's a slightly different design, but some similar concept. These are, these are rain covers and soft berry fruit. Um, not our place, another place, but the idea is that the, um, it catches the rain and drops the rain between the rows. These are raspberries, so any soft fruit is very prone to um, any damage, just like grapes, um, etc. I guess, I guess we're lucky as berry fruit growers that we get more than one, one harvest. For, for blueberries, for instance, we go back and harvest that same bush six to eight times um, over a period of three to four months. Um, cherry growers, obviously, they don't get that luxury, and grapes don't get that same luxury either. So what's happening here is um, we're actually moving where the water would normally be falling into the root zone, so you have to be really careful about um, what's happening with that extra water you're dumping in the rows. Where is it going to go to from there as well? So when you modify the environment, you need to be aware of what's happening with that. Sorry. Thank you. No, I'm just about done. I'm not sure why that stopped. Thank you. Right to that. Um, so plastic contamination in our soils, as I've talked about before, is a real problem, and, and municipal um, retention as well too of soils and returning um, uh, paddock to plate back to the paddock, and that's really important to us. Trying to get that green recycling back on the field. But um, I don't know what's going to happen with these microplastics we're talking about in the, in the ocean. They're a big problem. Um, because they get buried in our soils, uh, we don't see them, but I think they're, they're a problem to us. Something's gone wrong with that clicker, I'm sorry. Um, and just reiterating the fact that as we exclude the wind by building artificial shelters, we change the, change the environment in there. Um, excluding the wind, we actually increase the frost risk. Um, and in our situation in here, we use overhead water sprinklers to protect the, um, protect the flowers and the fruit and the buds and the leaves. 
Um, you can do this with strawberries and be picking later on the same afternoon as well too, which we used to do with overhead sprinklers and strawberries. So that next slide, please. Okay. So really, um, my, my thoughts today were just to, just to bring up a couple of key pieces. Um, oh, before I finish on that note, I just lost my notes. So I was wanting to talk really just to add about the protected cover cropping. And the, one of the things we're seeing now is we're, we're excluding the birds from our, um, from our orchards, et cetera, and our glass houses. But what's happening is the seagulls are coming along and landing on the top as well too. So we've got real problems with seagulls. So then we start out with lasers. Um, I had a neighbour ring me from the top of Royce Hill the other day because my laser had fallen over and was shooting into his bedroom at night. Um, that's a real problem and it's going to be a real problem for our aviation as well. Um, we've got other neighbours who have people employed to drive around all night just in vehicles scaring birds and seagulls off their roof because um, seagulls lay some pretty big disastrous um, blotches on fruit. Um, biological contamination and mess, etc. Um, so we need to be aware, aware of that side of things. So um, we need to think about if we're going to use more of these crop covers um, and glass houses, what are the other un unintended consequences? The Bay, Bay of Plenty is having real trouble with seagulls on their, um, their hail netting that they're using in that area for their kiwi fruit, etc. as well too. So um, that's where we are in there. And just to finish really, um, how much of this, you know, of our precious tongue are we, are we going to protect, preserve, restore? And I think that's a community um, discussion we need to have. And I, I thank Mayors um, and the Regional Council for initiating this discussion today. Thank you. Well, on behalf of everyone, thank you, Scott, for uh, your uh, innovation and uh, your leadership, your thought leadership in this context and uh, your role with the Future Farming Trust. You're proving the model uh, through what you've done on the ground. That's been most enlightening. They say necessity is the mother of invention. You've proven that. You are not a Zax standing there in some sort of impasse. You are not letting the world grow around you. Uh, you are very much leading the way there. So thank you. We've got a small uh, token of appreciation. And it is, uh, so if you just all join me again to uh, thanking Scott uh, and uh, Dan before him. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And uh, look, it's lunchtime now. Just to note and uh, appropriately, appositely, all of the food that you will enjoy over the next 35 to 40 minutes uh, has been produced in Hawke's Bay. I'm going to introduce, as you're making your way back, our next presenter, who will be dealing with the existential threat of all time, perhaps other than the biodiversity crisis. But um, if we're talking about soils, as we've heard right from Nahiwi right through, the interaction, and from uh, Dr. Clothier, the interaction of soil and climate is uh, most important and indeed pivotal uh, to, to uh, the way we sustain, uh, protect and uh, rely on this resource of our precious soil. So with that said, I'd like to invite Dr Kathleen Kozniak uh, to the stage. Uh, Kathleen's the team leader with the Regional Council, Marine uh, Air and Land uh, Science. Um, uh, Kathleen has been the climate and air quality scientist at the Regional Council since 2010, but very recently took on the role of team leader marine air and land science. Uh, Kathleen studied earth science and environmental planning at the University of Waikato and then completed her PhD at Bristol University in the field of meteorology, which I think is something to do with the weather. Kathleen had, uh, had worked as a meteorologist at Met Service for nine years prior to joining the Council. Uh, she's born in Napier and uh, is an expert in our existing and future climate. With that, Kathleen, I invite you to the stage uh, to present to us. Thank you.
Tina Koto Kato. Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, I was asked to talk on, touch on two topics, one being the soil quality monitoring that our land scientists do at the Regional Council, as well as the climate change aspect. And I just wanted to pick up two points. Um, one is that um, I'll probably come across as having presenting all the problems, um, but it would have been quite nice to have Dan's talk follow me because he actually produced, you know, his was great in terms of providing some of the solutions. Um, and the other one I was going to um, pick up on was um, Councillor Williams noting this morning about the urban expansion uh, across New Zealand. Um, so I did have a look um, at the land cover database, particularly with um, respect to that HPUDS area. And the figure, that 15% national figure, was, was very similar for um, that HPUDS area. It was around about 12% of the built up sort of sediment area expanding. Um, that was between 1996 and 2018. And uh, for us, about Half of that was what's called um, high-producing grassland, was, was converted, and about 37% was a mix of cropping and horticulture. The interesting thing was that um, by far and away, most of that was pre-2012. About 95% of that change was prior to 2012, and only a small amount, because the whole area was about, according to the, this database, was about 600, just a little over 600 hectares, and um, it suggested only about 30 hectares of that was between 2012 and 2018. So now I'll actually crack on um, with the talk and start with our soil quality monitoring program. Um, with respect to the soil quality, what we're kind of looking at there is the fitness of the soil um, to support crop growth without um, the soil being degraded or other environmental harm um, occurring. Now, with, um, why we do it um, is to look at different land uses, the impacts that has on the soil, try to pick up any problems that might be emerging, and over time to see whether the soil condition is um, improving, worsening, or, or pretty much staying the same. Now we've got, over, since about two uh, the year 2000, um, the land scientists have established around about 90 sites across the region and across five different land uses. So that's intensive and extensive kind of pasture use, uh, forestry, cropping, and sort of a combined mix of orchards and vineyards. Um, and just to, with more of a focus on the Herotonga Plains, um, most of those sites that we've been looking at um, on the Hiratonga Plains are predominantly cropping um, orchards and vineyards. And how do we do it? Well, we get out in the field and um, just take samples along 50 metre transects, um, whether it be through a foot corer or putting, pressing a ring into the ground, and composite those samples and send them to an independent laboratory for analysis. So we're looking at um, the soil physical properties, chemistry, and a little bit of biology in terms of um, the activity of soil organisms. And this is more or less in more detail of the kind of things that we're measuring. So one is like total carbon, which gives us an indication of the amount of organic matter, which is important for holding nutrients, um, holding water, and for giving the soil some structure so the roots can grow. Also look at um, nutrients that are important for crop growth, such as nitrogen, and Olsen P is, is a measure of um, phosphorus that is accessible to plants. And we're also looking at um, soil physics like bulk density for um, levels of compaction, Macro porosity gives sort of an, um, that's sort of important for air penetration into the soil. Um, aggregate stability, As aggregate stability we only look at on cropping sites because that's the one land use where you're kind of quite regularly disturbing the soil and, and doing cultivation. 
And the, sort of the, the little crumbly nature of the soil can be important for um, absorbing water and holding it, um, for, also for drainage and for um, allowing um, roots to grow. Also do some trace metals and, and a few pesticides. And I'll just note that um, where we monitor, what we monitor, how we monitor it, and the targets we use are just protocols that are, are common to regional councils ac across the country. Um, and the targets we're using try to balance both um, pro uh, productivity, gro you know, crop productivity, and also avoiding environmental um, harm. So by and large, actually, um, I'll just make this point first of all, that uh, a lot of our sites actually are within the target values that um, are desirable. I'll just perhaps highlight a few that, you know, really may be a bit more, a um, bit, bit of room for improvement. And box pots, unfortunately, but yes, box pots, and so with the, the boxes kind of giving the, the um, distribution of the measurements that we're getting for the different um, crop, uh, for the different land types. And with it being the Herotonga Plains, the focus really is on cropping and orchard and vineyards. So in terms of that soil carbon, that kind of organic matter content, um, cropping is falling below kind of the, uh, a desired level. Um, and just a little bit too, perhaps, in the vineyards, and only, you know, just a little bit in, in the orchards. Phosphorus, um, we are seeing um, above kind of desired levels. Uh, I guess the, when we're getting above desired levels for nutrients, then it just increases the risk that um, they may get, if they're not being taken up, then they're going to be lost from the soil profile and end up causing... Um, impacting our water quality, um, either in groundwater or in the waterways. So, yes, um, phosphorus, a little high in cropping, and to a certain extent, um, orchards and vineyards too. We are getting some samples that are above target values. In terms of uh, soil physical properties, pretty good, actually. Macroprocess, just, a, um, a, just the, the odd sample that's below kind of target values. Um, but as I mentioned with the aggregate stability, we only do that for cropping and the majority of those measurements are below the value, target value, um, which isn't, isn't a good thing. So um, on the whole, you know, things aren't too bad, but there, are, there is room for improvement in terms of both um, crop productivity and potential for some environmental harm. So now I'll go on to the climate change aspect, and here I'll touch on both a um, report that NIWA did for us looking at climate change projections and impacts for the region, and also just some work we've done within council as well. Because the um, council's environmental science team has recently completed a three-year state of the environment report, and that covers the years 2018 to 2021. And from a climate perspective, looking at the state and room of the environment, that three-year period was really, you know, quite a roll call of severe weather events. One of those being, of course, the Napier flood, which um, was a rainfall event that had a return period in excess of 100 years. About 250 millimetres fell on the city within 12 hours, and peaking at 60 millimetres in one hour and inundated properties, and some people um, literally saw some of their properties sliding away from them. So I guess, um, now he was brilliant talk this morning, I guess that talk about being, you know, living on the hills. And in the case of that particular hill, um, I guess there is some caution in terms of, and, you know, a limitation to intensifying um, the number of people living on hills, and also um, for the people that experience kind of the perception of perhaps living on a hill isn't um, as great an idea. And, and likewise, me personally, I live on the hill. Um, my insur insurance premiums <laughs> have gone through the roof because now the hill is considered a flood, a flood risk, a flood, you know, in floods there is a hazard there. So um, thinking that you're going to avoid that 
that those sort of costs by living on the hill um, isn't, isn't real anymore. Um, and we can expect, essentially we can expect under climate change to get more of those rainfall events. And for the impacts, that, that particular event was quite localised into Napier City, um, but we can expect the impacts to be broader and wider. This is a map that NIWA did in our climate change report. It's actually just for baseline um, levels. They haven't actually done one for a climate change projection. But they just looked at um, kind of the exposure to the flood hazard risk and some for buildings and people. And for Hawke's Bay, it did identify that, you know, about 1,500 um, hectares of orchard, uh, vineyard and, and cropping areas was... Um, potentially exposed, exposed to flood hazard. And rainfall isn't the only sort of type of, of flood hazard either. It's in, they also looked at terms of 100-year um, uh, kind of events, storm tide, and just put that on top of different levels of, of rising sea. And again, so as, as the sea level rise, again, there's um, a number of you know, increasing hundreds of hectares potentially affected um, by those sorts of, the, of events. And that also highlights too perhaps the, the pressures that has kind of come on land as sea level rises, the need to retreat back. Now, um, as I mentioned, we can be expecting more of these events, and as the temperature warms, um, it gives these storm events more energy. So rainfall isn't going to be the only thing we need to worry about because it can also um, then help um, produce other damaging phenomena. And so the one on the right is a hailstorm, and the one on the left is like a tornado type um, feature. Um, and so both of these were taken from just our Hawke's Bay Regional Council offices during that three year period that I talked about. So if either of those cut a sway through the Hirotonga Plains, then the impact for those in the path um, will be quite devastating. And then again in that three year period, um, we had two significant droughts, and it is rare in, our, in the history of our, of our climate record to have two such dry um, summer, autumn kind of periods. And here we have um, the seasonal rainfall compared to average for those three years that I mentioned. And we can see under summer and autumn um, that they were you know, a lot drier than normal, and autumn has been dry all three years. Um, spring, on the other hand, is, um, has actually been wet, but climate change projections suggest that um, that season will get, will get drier over time. So we, again, with, um, we had a look to see what um, trends that we're seeing over time to date. Um, we aren't seeing a lot of, of uh, obvious trends in rainfall over the history of our regional council climate records. Um, but one thing that has emerged is that um, rainfall, there was one trend, there was one trend in summer rainfall, decreasing summer rainfall in, um, in the, at our sites in the Kawika range. So that has implications for flows for the rivers that have their, head, had, have their headwaters in that range. Um, we also tried to see uh, if we had trends in temperature. Um, again, our council records are quite short. They only go back to 1997, which was um, a very warm wear year. So we aren't seeing a lot of trends in temperature, except apart from seeing some um, increases in minimum, minimum temperatures and uh, reduction in frost um, days. But you do, if you look at the Met Service and the EWA sites, you can see just overall an increase in temperature. So um, both um, with that sort of the, 
the uh, expect expectation that droughts will increase in number and severity and the increasing temperatures. Um, as mentioned by, by Dan, um, we can get things, <coughs> excuse me, again I've got that um, wind, suspect, wind erosion suspect, susceptibility map, um, but with a bit more detail and on the Hiratonga Plains. So there is, with drying soils and hot temperatures, there is, and this was um, just that, that feature there with that dust, with the dirt being um, pulled up into like a, um, I can't remember what you call it, but yeah, um, you all know what I mean. Um, that, um, that was taken again in that, in that same period, in that same three year period, so very recently. And there is, a, a, you know, enhanced potential to lose um, uh, soil. So just doing a summary of um, potential climate impacts on horticulture, you have got these changes in temperature, which could affect um, the plant development stages, and so affecting sort of the quality and quantity of the crop. Um, the changes in temperature make it, may make it unsuitable for some crop types, um, but reduce frost damage. So there, there may be, there may be um, opportunities for um, crop diversification. With more CO2 comes more increase in um, plant biomass. We've got the um, effect of um, reduced rainfall, um, more severe droughts, so there's going to be more, there's potentially for more um, irrigation demand and less water reliability. Uh, you've got this, just the storm events that um, potentially will um, uh, really affect sort of damage soils and properties. Potential rise in pests and diseases. Um, and like I mentioned, that, that um, exposure to coastal and fluvial flooding. And just to end on perhaps some of the opportunities, um, my colleagues at the back there will know that I don't pass up an opportunity to Scott about the bananas I'm growing on, on my, in my own garden. I'm the worst garden, gardener ever, but I do love my bananas. So, you know, that may be something that we can look at in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathleen, and for all the work you do for us as a regional council in keeping us um, appraised of, of what to expect. And we are, as to use that word resilient, I think we are better capable of responding to what the future may hold if we've got a better and more accurate understanding of what's in store for us. So thank you for your addition to the symposium today. It is greatly appreciated, and a small uh, gesture of that. Appreciation, which I hope you get to enjoy out there on the hill under your bananas. <laughs>
Um, I have a son, actually, I have many children. One of my sons is a lawyer, and he tells me my, my style is more sort of coloring in. Um, so, so if you just work with me and feel free to uh, fact check as we go through. So, um, Sandra, thank you today. Uh, great to be here. Obviously, a great opportunity to, to um, collaborate um, having you know, science, art, and, um, and business in, in one room, I think, is, is really important. So, um, I found this morning really interesting, and um, I think what it really has amplified to me is exactly what I was going to start with, which was the fact that um, today we really do live in a far more sort of VUCA world, which is an expression that's an American, I think, military expression. Um, and clearly today what we're seeing is an increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And uh, I thought that last presentation just really captures that. So <clears throat> I'm going to get a little bit off-piste this, um, this afternoon and try and sort of take us really big picture and try and then um, drill down as to why what I'm going to be talking about is relevant. And if I see, if you put two arms up, uh, that means I'm losing you entirely. Um, so, and I'll move on quickly if, if I do that. So let me um, quickly flip to um, what I'm going to start talking about, some really big picture trends. And so you, you'll know these probably intuitively, and you'll have seen them in numerous presentations from various um, scientists and, and think tanks. But essentially the trends which I think are important um, globally are things such as, uh, you know, we have an aging population, we potentially have an, a population which is going to be healthier in one part of the world and less healthy in other parts of the world, um, but at the heart of that will be an incremental demand for, for proteins, and um, which is something which is, I think, very important to, to New Zealand. We are also seeing global geopol geopolitics, I think, like we've not seen in, in decades, and um, I think no matter who you read, there are certain, you know, it, it's, it really is, a, it's a VUCA world, and we're seeing the, really the rise of nationalism like we've not seen before. Um, I was in Sydney uh, a couple of weeks ago presenting at a food standards conference, and there was a, a, a doctor from the Singapore government um, talking about their, their 3030 ambitions, which I thought was really relevant to us here today. And Singapore's ambition is to be producing 30% of their food within Singapore by 2030. And for those of you who've been to Singapore, it's about the size of Hastings. And so to be able to produce that amount of food um, on the land uh, is going to require incredibly dynamic and creative thinking. Um, globally, we're seeing a drive for resource efficiency. We've heard a lot about climate change and some of the climate scientists who were presenting at the conference I was at saying, forget this one and a half degrees in the Paris Accord, let's be really thinking about three to four degrees. And I'm not a scientist, so I can't tell you whether that's right or wrong, but I think it's helpful to actually bring tomorrow forward to today when we're thinking about what we're planning, uh, how we're planning to react here. We're seeing digitization increase at speed, and that's going to continue to lead to, an incredible, to a, a far more autonomous world. So this all sounds a little bit doomsday-ish, but you know, I think, frankly, on most of this, the train has already left the station. Uh, so when we now bring that a little bit closer to home, um, I, I think the things that we, and we've already heard a little bit about most of these things, so that's always the downside of going uh, in the eighth speaker slot, but the, uh, the, the, the need for you know, further biodiversity. And so I think it is good in some of the government's latest responses uh, to see a desire to be planting more natives. Capacity and, and productivity constraints, and you know, yet another theme that's already been touched upon is RSC, skilled labor. Um, you know, we really are at a, a crunch point here in, in New Zealand. It's not a lot better across the ditch for those of you who also operate in Australia, um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's preventing, um, I suppose, productivity and, and um, some growth. The clear imperative to decarbonize, and we've seen that in the recent emissions um, reductions plans, which I wasn't going to go into. Water quality's been touched upon, of course. Water availability's been touched on. 
And, and obviously, climate change is going to have a huge impact upon that. So I think you know, I'm buoyed by the fact that the regional council is actively starting to think about that and planning. Um, but are we thinking sufficiently, I, I use the word boldly, I'm not sure it is bold, but you know, what if it is three to four degrees and not one and a, one, one and a half to two percent? And of course, the local supply chain resilience is being fully tested and there are no immediate signs of, um, of respite across a variety of, uh, of factors. So turning now to um, the New Zealand food sector. So I'm going to talk pretty high level again and I think if we, if we sort of think about the food sector in, in six boxes, um, you know, obviously not all of these are critical to, to Hawke's Bay and I get that, but the point I'm really trying to make here is that they're all critical to New Zealand's economic welfare. And with this in mind, you know, the New Zealand food sector comes from uh, a place of you know, incredible strength. It really has been a growth, a, a, an income engine for New Zealand. And I think um, what this underlines is the critical importance of the, the primary industry, which we've been talk, hearing a little bit about uh, this morning. And it is also obviously good to see it being represented here. So part of MPI's ambition for the primary sector um, is to try and grow the sector from about, it's around 50 billion, I think, um, this year in the latest um, SOPI report, the State of Primary Industry report, um, growing it to about 85 billion in 2050. Now, that actually only requires about a 2% growth annually, which doesn't sound that, re that crazy. Um, but to enable that, there has to be two things to happen. One is that we need to be producing more efficiently and effectively and or um, more farmland, productive farmland, needs to come on stream or not be built on. Um, and it's a bit of a matrix within that, but you know, you, it's the old adage, you, know, you can have there are three options, but you can only have two. And, and so we actually need to, to be really thinking clearly and when we think about exports, and I know you can't read this, but uh, I just thought it was worthwhile taking a look at the, the size of the food sector, or the primary sector rather, which this includes uh, timber. And I know there are some um, people in the room who, who do grow um, pine. Um, what we can see is it's a pretty diverse group. Obviously dairy is clear, clearly the number one and, um, but it also, I think, demonstrates yet again some of our, I suppose you call it commercial bias towards China, which I'm not going to, to go into. But, um, but I think importantly, even though dairy is not important for Hawke's Bay, um, it's the soils here that are the strength of the horticulture and the processed food sector, which we have, we have heard about. And if I put my Watties hat on here, which obviously I, I am here trying to do today. When we think about processed foods, what we saw was that processed foods account for about 6% of total primary export, um, exports rather. And um, when we look then at what we're exporting, we are a big part of that as a company, um, but also uh, the, the importance of supplying countries like Australia, which is a big trading partner for us, um, in the primary process sector. So um, okay, just in case I'm losing you or you're sort of wondering where am I going with this, um, I just thought it was useful um, that, that we did actually quickly touch upon this. Um, but importantly, what I did obviously want to do was talk about um, Hawke's Bay and the importance of Hawke's Bay. If I can get my slides to go forward. That screen? This one here? Over there? Got you. Okay. Um, so I think we've, we've already covered, we've already had all of these points. So um, I'll, I'll whiz through these um, really very quickly. But um, so when we think about Hawke's Bay, we know it's, you know it's a big vegetable growing region. You know, behind others with potatoes, it's a big fruit growing region. Others eclipses with potatoes and, I mean, wine, sorry, and... Um, and kiwi fruit. Um, I think the thing that struck me when I was going through the numbers, uh, so I don't spend a huge amount of time looking at the metrics for all um, produce in, in Hawke's Bay. It's not part of my day job really, but I was blown away by the diversity of crops that Hawke's Bay has. Um, 
And that really stood out as a non-scientist, uh, you know, a Luddite cave dweller that I am when it comes to, um, comes to these things. Um, and also, we've heard that Hawke's Bay is a, is a huge exporter. And when I burrowed into some of the, the fact sheets around Hawke's Bay, I was actually staggered to see there are about a, a thousand registers, just under a thousand, about 800 and 984 or something like that, um, companies who are registered in food and beverage cultivation um, in Hawke's Bay. So it's a, it's a large number employing just under 8,000 people. And yet, uh, and I'm not sure this number is right, so fact check me, that only 6.8% of Hawke's Bay's farms. So I was sort of staggered by the productivity um, and yet the small nature of the total acreage that, that's actually farmed. Um, and especially when we consider that ag is the number two industry in Hawke's Bay behind manufacturing and yet I'd actually suggest there's quite a strong interconnectivity between the two. So when um, I was in the global job, which got mentioned in, my, um, in the introduction, um, having spent about five years traveling around the world, which, which was great apart from my carbon footprint, um, when I came back to New Zealand, it really gave me a, a, a far clearer, uh, I suppose, perspective to, to look at the food industry here. And it really struck me just how dynamic and innovative and smart, um, fantastic design industry here, also in the food sector. And, um, and it really stood head and shoulders above so many markets that I, I, I worked in and traveled to. And so I, so I always question, you know, why, why it's so entrepreneurial. We look here at just the sheer number of this is, this is um, it's called scan data, looking at companies who sell through the supermarkets. So over time, what we can see here, this is food and be beverage, so it might be toilet roll companies as well. Not that there are any left in the country, by the way. Um, hence the crisis. <laughs> but, um, but if we just look at the sheer number, and uh, it's grown over time. And why is it because the fact that the cost of entry is reasonably low, or just the fact that we're incredibly... Um, entrepreneurial group. And, and then, I suppose really just to keep drilling down on that point, when we think about, you know, I'm here representing a large company, but I'm very much in the minority um, as a, as a you know, part of a, of a big food company. New Zealand is the home of small and medium-sized food companies. They are the growth engine um, of the sector. And um, we've heard, you know, some people have talked about you know, corporatization of some of the, the primary um, growing, and um, this is not the, the case in the supply base into the supermarkets, which I think is great. So, um, the word entrepreneurial has been used, so, and I, I was just, you know, I was tickled. I had never heard that expression about uh, eat what you can and can what you can't. That's just a bloody doozy. So, thank you. I'm, le I'm, I'm leave leaving you here wiser. Um, for that insight, I can't wait to get it on social media. Um, so, what is, um, you know, uh, we're a pain in the ass to work with, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, we try our, our damnedest and uh, we work incredibly hard um, to support the, the, lo the local industry um, and to also, I suppose, be a bit of a poster boy for what you can do in the food industry over shore, uh, overseas, sorry. Um, on volume, we're more of an exporter than a domestic company. Um, you know, we are the number two supplier of the supermarket trade here across our 35 or odd brands. So you often be buying us and you wouldn't know that's clever. Huh? Um, and our main markets are Australia, Japan, Korea, but we do export all around the world. And I suppose the point I'm really going to keep coming back to in the, in the, in the next part of the presentation is around local food security. Um, I think we're a great example of the need for local food security, but also we saw um, demand for our products step up quite literally exponentially um, when we went into lockdowns because food was scarce and supply chain suddenly melted down. As for our social license, um, you know, we, we, we process foods for, for the reasons of food safety. Um, we like to think that we produce foods uh, for the eight months of the year when fresh produce isn't available. And so, you know, um, if I wanted to be saintly, I could say that we, we produce foods for in a consumption 24-7, 365. Um, I'd point out that we're less susceptible to global commodities. 
Um, we're more of a price taker than a, uh, uh, sorry, price maker rather than the price taker, and, uh, and so on. And, um, you know, whilst we do face the cost of living crisis, and I can't say that we're not having to move on some of our pricing, uh, processed foods are actually typically cheaper uh, to consumers than fresh, uh, obviously in, in winter times as well, because of the, you know, the supply chain uh, efficiencies and so on. I put this slide up really just to remind us also of the fact that provenance, um, provenance became very trendy when the country was doing well and you know, us young people were really focused on sporting ourselves and um, wanting to buy local. And, but it's interesting that that wave has actually continued and I think it's become even more pronounced. And you know, whilst I'm always a little bit suspect about claimed research, um, when we look at the actual behaviors on some of the, the products that we sell, um, I am pointing the right direction, but I'm not moving forward. Story of my life. But the, <laughs> the maybe if you could flick my slide on, that would be fantastic. Or have I moved on? There we go. Um, is the fact that what we have seen is the, and this is not because of our competitors not being available. It's simply that we saw people actively purchasing um, local products. So what I'm um, now going to do is sort of argue that this is all great, it's all very exciting, and it'll be even more exciting in my slide moves, that um, the, the future is clearly not um, a replica of the past. And I sort of borrowed here from the TPW um, framework, which I thought was actually quite interesting. And the reason why I put it up is that we, as a business, we as, a, I think, a region, as a country, we can't be the frog that's sitting in the pot of water as it's slowly boiling. And, you know, we need to actively address the trends, the, the mega trends that we're seeing. We need to try and sort of bring them forward and think, how would we react to those now? Um, and also, technology, which hasn't been talked a little bit about this morning, you know, needs very, very careful consideration. That was the reason why I put up the Singapore example. Um, some of it might sound a bit radical. I don't think all of it is totally radical, um, but you know, certainly the, the vernacular is going to be challenging when we get into discussions around uh, alternative protein, emerging protein, and you know, topics such as genetic editing. And um, it's actually not scary, but it just sounds scary. And um, so we need to think about how we're going to be talking about that. So I, I would um, you know, question Alternative proteins, um, are they the future? Are they not the future? Um, are they part of the future? Are they a friend? Are they a foe? Um, I suppose that some of that depends upon your perspective, but the reason why I wanted to put it up is because it's going to happen. And it's part of Singapore's solution. They're introducing legislation now around gene editing. They're the first country in the world to do it. And you know, I think it's important as a country we sort of take note and think about it what impact it could have on us here. But um, if you want one takeaway, uh, this is not going to replace traditional agriculture and systems. So everything we've been talking about this morning still remains mission central or mission critical um, to us. And I don't think the plant proteins are as scary as it sounds, but you need to think about it on a, on a continuum. You've, you know, you've got plants at one end um, which have high protein in them and you know, that re they still require land to be grown on. You've got cultured or cell-based proteins in the middle, you know, using bioreactors, and on the other end, uh, forget beer fermentation, we need to convert it all into protein fermentation. And, um, you know, whilst the, the latter two are exciting, that they're, they're actually they're not going to give you your five a day that you need. So, Hawke's Bay, um, bro uh, if I could move on. So, um, how am I doing for time? Okay, right, I'll keep going then. So I was going to say that um, brewing proteins, you know, I think it will, it will demand, I'm not quite sure who's doing what on brewing proteins in, in Hawke's Bay, but it's not going to require the Heritonga Plains um, to make it happen, which I think is fantastic. So it's going to coexist with whatever um, we're currently doing. And obviously growing plant is all about converting water, nutrients, heat, and light into carbohydrate, and that's not quite how it happens with, with proteins. We've heard many people talk about the, the abundance, it's a great word, isn't it, um, of, of Hawke's Bay, and 
Um, obviously, Hawke's Bay does have that sort of rich um, nexus of, of, uh, well, of, of many, many things, but um, whether that be water and, and versatile soils and so on. Um, and what we also know is that food production in, in, on the Heritage Plains takes many forms, whether it be export, fruit and vegetable crops, um, obviously fresh fruit and vegetables for regional and national uh, consumption, but also uh, for process production and making foods available, as I said, 24-7, um, 365. Um, but also, I put up a case that it's around supplying fruit and vegetables for processing is an important option uh, for primary producers, and it, it diversifies the risks it utilizes the food that may not be aesthetically perfect, uh, which obviously fruit in particular being exported needs to be, um, because all food going into the processing industry is peeled. Um, and it provides for crop rotation opportunities, which is important for ecosystems to survive, as well as you know, improving commercial justification for, for capital staff utilization and so on. So you know, there's, a, there's a strong interconnectivity, which is the point I made earlier. Um, also, field to fork, you know, the distance is, is really important. Um, um, you know, admittedly, we don't process frozen, or we don't, we, yeah, we don't uh, process frozen vegetables in Hawke's Bay anymore, at all in Canterbury. But, you know, the, the old adage of, you know, a couple of hours field to, field to freezer, um, it really is important. It's a limit to how far you can drag your crops uh, before you spoil them. So, proximity, having productive land near to production units is, is really important. Um, rather than putting cold stores on that same land because it's close. So um, to, to meet the future um, challenges, uh, you know, I'd suggest that we, it's, it's nice and easy, it's sort of a trite comment, isn't it, that we need to do more with less, um, you know, ultimately as land is finite. And so at the heart of the argument, we need to protect Hawke's Bay's versatile soils to maximize the opportunity to grow food to feed people, okay, obvious. Um, you know, currently there are 16,000 uh, hectares of the 23,000 hectares of, of Heratonga, um, which are irrig on irrig irrigable land, if I could say. Um, and breaking news, every single crop that we take into our factory is, is irrigated. So irrigation really is um, incredibly important. We need to think about, especially with climate change, um, leaving space for water storage, probably land, or, you know, I'm um, not sure, the, I can't think of the term, it's not a lake, but reservoirs, um, you know, needs to be factored into the, the equation, especially as temperatures rise, you know, and the, you know, the converse or the adverse dynamic of population growth, which we've, which, which we've heard about. So we're growing, as a business, we, you know, we're actually pretty excited by the work we're doing. I actually have a colleague here in our, in our ag area, um, our, our guru, and, you know, we are doing a huge amount of work over the years, embracing science um, to improve our breeding, growing, and, and crop protection, uh, I suppose, philosophies, approaches, and, approaches and practices. And that's led to some pretty uh, phenomenal increases in, in, in production improvements. Um, you know, peaches, you know, the, we're up 64% on a seven-year rolling basis. Uh, tomato performance, you know, we're up 16% over the you know, similar number of years. And you know, every year uh, we get better and better. And I think that's really exciting. Um, and also, um, we, took, we heard a little bit about this, uh, the, Bridge, the Regen project this morning. And um, the cynics in the room will say it's, nothing but agri it's something but sustainable agricultural led by a marketer. And um, I think the important thing is we need to sort of debunk whether it is a science or whether it is um, an art. And so we're looking forward to working with some of you in the room on the, um, on the regen trial over the next um, six years. So, um, and I, I, I tickled here, I used the term golden goose, which somebody else had used this morning. It really is um, important. Um, I'm not sure I'm going forward or backwards here, but um, so I'll move on through that one. So, um, so if we now start um, sort of moving towards some form of um, finale, uh, it's, I'll, I'll sort of restate a little bit of what I've said. I'm particularly good at that. And um, we need to really think now about extreme global warming, in, in my view. 
you know, forecasts of two and a half degrees by uh, 2000, um, one, um, 2100, doesn't sound right, does it? Uh, 21, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it must be 2,100. Yes, it sounds very odd. Um, we'll require a further 31.7 cubic meters of water by 2040. And if temperatures rise more than that, obviously, this is using the predictions from the Hawke's Bay regional um, suggestion. You know, the volumes just uh, increase exponentially. And how, how do we actually do that? And where's the space to, to house that? We've mentioned, or I've mentioned, biosecurity risk and related exposure to, to monocultures. And there's been some discussion about monocultures. I was actually blown away that only 12 plants account for 75% of the global food system. It's a remarkably small number. Um, and so what will climate change impact be on those limited number of plants uh, in places that will be more impacted by climate change than us? We've touched on water scarcity. Um, I've talked about irrigated land. Um, and you know the importance and the lack of land. So we need to sort of balance the, the population with water storage and, and growing. Now obviously development is, is unavoidable, but we can test that it's guided pretty poorly by soil classifications. And um, I'm not a scientist as I said, but you know I was surprised that Gimlet gravels um, typified as a type seven, um, you know, as a potentially low productive uh, land, but obviously it's far from it, and we've heard other examples this morning. And <coughs> I could, there's a laundry list of land that we've seen disappear from, um, from I suppose, being orcharding land for Wattis over the years. And I've got, I've got a list, but given time, I won't go, th won't go through the list, but it is pleasing to hear the, the sports arena being mentioned <laughs> as, as one of them. So our mantra. Um, from a commercial perspective is to always move forward to the next slide and beyond that it's to control our controllables and so you know, and I would contest that as much as we as a company are we're actually trying to tackle change through trying to get ahead of it or at least you know, you know preempt it in our, in our own minds and so you know whatever the future be it protein brewing we've heard about vertical farming plant-based proteins or whatever what we do know is that uh, once we place a cold store in, in Pakawai or wherever it is um, on highly productive land, that, that food is, is, you know, realistically, it's gone forever. And music, nice. Um, and so I think this, this will require a rethink of policies and rules around zoning, permitted use, subdivision, which you've heard about, and the like, which are consistent with protecting our versatile soils for food production. And as I've said uh, many times already, consider a time of extreme warming, uh, which I won't go back into. Um, and also remind ourselves, we, we're not, we are an island, um, physically, but metaphorically. Um, you know, we're part of a global system which is rapidly deglobalizing. And so we need to think about our local food supply um, being less connected to, to a global um, food supply, given possible, unpredictable um, continuation of geopolitical issues. Um, so, you know, as I said, build on, uh, build, but don't build on productive land. You know, productive land is lost for, for many reasons, um, I think all of which we've heard this morning, so I won't relitigate that. So, the power fundamentally sits in the hands of many of the people actually in the room today, which is quite exciting. And, um, you know, it's in the hands of the legislators, it's in the hands of national um, uh, regional authorities, obviously national authorities aren't here, but what we as a company would ask is that we make good decisions and ensure the policies and rules that are there to actually protect versatile soils um, and fundamentally protect the future of growing in Hawke's Bay. And it really is important. This is a, you know, a, a, an exciting moment to be pondering what our legacy will be and what um, you'll be telling your grandchildren that you did to, to protect their food supply. Thank you. Uh, thank you indeed, Mike. Uh, you've taken it to a whole another level for us. Uh, Avuka World, I googled it 
uh, V for volatility, U for uncertainty, C for complexity, and A for ambiguity. And my goodness, isn't that precisely the construct that you outlined us uh, to us of, of trying to be a food-producing nation, a food-producing entity in, in a world with labour constraints, a drive to decarbonise, uh, supply chain uh, issues that we've seen through COVID, wealth and social disparities, just so much going on there. And if we're going to get from 48 billion to 85 billion by 2050, we're going to need the farmland uh, to do that. So, look, some absolute gems in there. Uh, thank you, Mike, indeed, for those insights. That really is, as I said, uh, taken up to the next level for us. Uh, a small gesture of our appreciation. Take a bit of local food, uh, well, and produce back on the plane with you. And enjoy it. Um, you get back to Mike, Mike Pretty, that really was um, quite something else. I think we caught this eroding. <laughs> I'll leave that up to you. Uh, the Uber driver, might, Uber driver might have different ideas. All right, um, the second of the Bounty of the Plains sessions is about to commence. I'd like to invite uh, Neil Cave from Hawke's Bay Wine Growers to come and speak to us. Uh, Neil is an independent wine grower in Hawke's Bay and is also the owner of a boutique wine company, Alchemy Wines. He has been supplying grapes from his vineyards in the Dartmoor Valley area to some of New Zealand's premium wine companies for 15 years. Uh, prior to his involvement in that, industry, in that industry, Neil had a corporate career in both the private and government sectors, uh, primarily working in IT. So that is an interesting uh, combination. Uh, Neil's been the director of Hawke's Bay Wine Growers for five years, so thank you very much for taking on that role. And please uh, join me in welcoming Neil to the, the stage for the next presentation. Look, we've, we've clearly got issues with this, uh, whether it's running out of batteries, I'm not sure. Fire it straight at the screen over there. If that doesn't work, I'm sure if you just point it, they'll uh, click it on for you. As I, must, I must admit, as Mike was struggling there with the uh, pointer, I was starting to get a little bit worried as an ex-IT guy, <laughs> thinking, oh my God, the IT guy's going to go up and it's not going to work either. But um, thank you for uh, the opportunity to, to speak here today. What a, it's a, been a really, I mean, I'm a, I'm a viticulturalist as well, so it's actually been a really interesting um, range of uh, topics covered. Um, thank you for the introduction, Martin. Um, okay, so I'm a, I'm a grower, I'm a, I'm a winery, uh, and I'm also a, on the board of Hawke's Bay Wine. So I've sort of got my fingers in a few different pies there, but. Um, Today I'm really wearing the hat for Hawke's Bay, Hawke's Bay Wine, or Hawke's Bay Wine Growers. So just really want to talk through today. I've, I've promised Martin as well, I'm, I'm only going to try and do 10 minutes because I've, there's another presentation following up regarding wine. And when we Zoomed with them the other day, once we started talking and, and sort of segueing into stories, I mean, it, you know, we, we could have waffled on for an hour. So we're not going to do that today. I'm going to be quite short and sharp with my points. So I just want to give you a bit of a heads up on the, the Hawke's Bay wine scene. Um, move then into some links with tourism. Moving then on just very briefly onto a little bit of vineyard geography. Touch on three, uh, three sort of uh, Hawke's Bay wine growing sub-regions that, that sort of has a, have a relationship with soils. And then hopefully that'll lead nicely into, into the, the, the following presentation. From, from Delegate. Okay, so let's see if this works. Br brilliant, that is brilliant. So who are we? Hawke's Bay Wine Growers. We are the, the overarching industry body that supports wineries and wine growers, grape growers in Hawke's Bay. Okay, we exist to, to protect and advance the collective interests of the Hawke's Bay wine industry as a whole. We're there to grow the reputation of Hawke's Bay as New Zealand's premier wine region. And, and one of our str strategic sort of uh, things we're after is we want to become and be known as one of the world's great wine regions. And particularly thinking over the last few years, and, and, and it's something that's been really important, is actually support the, the Hawke's Bay wine community to be the best that it can be and together. Now, but just before I go on, actually, I just want to welcome a few wine growers here. It's great to see a few other colleagues. And I just want to give a big shout out while I'm here to, to John Buck, who's, who's here today. Um, John 
He's, he's been involved in the wine industry for at least 50 years, he sort of muttered to me before, but I know that he's been heavily involved over the years in land use planning and, and working with the councils. Um, and also he is a real patriarch of, of the, certainly the Hawke's Bay wine industry, but, and even next year, and, and probably more so, the New Zealand wine industry. So big, big, big heads up to John, great to see him here. Uh, so I've been on the board for five years now, and what I've realised actually, it's quite, quite amusing now, I sort of step back and think, nearly six years now in fact, and I was shoulder tapped to come on by one of my grower mates, you know, come on to the board, it'll be good for you. What I've realised, and, and to coin a sort of a, sort of a famous eagle song, you know, you can, you can always check out, but you can never leave. And I've realised it's actually pretty hard to get off this board, all right, if I ever wanted to. Now, the irony today, though, and I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the, 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 the district council sign and the Hawke's Bay Regional Council sign. Well, the two last people who've left the board after, in fairness to both of them, years of service to the board, um, one of them went and became a councillor for the Hastings District Council, and the other one went and got himself a job with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. So there you go. So I'm now thinking, hey, trade me jobs, I'm going to be having a look on the weekend. Maybe that might help me move over. OK, a quick snapshot of the Hawke's Bay wine industry. We've got over 100 wineries at present and 227 odd vineyards at the moment. We are New Zealand's second largest wine region behind Marlborough, but we are the oldest wine region. OK, and, and you know, looking at some of, the, some of the sort of stats there, I think 1850s, Mission Estate was first set up. And I think Tomata Estate was first set up in the late 1890s. So, you know, we've, we've got a lot of history here with wine. When, when I say wineries as well, I think this, is not, this does not mean 100 physical wineries located throughout Hawke's Bay, because it, it's nothing like that anymore. What we're seeing is we do have the physical wineries, but especially a lot of new entrants now into that wine scene, you know, they, they don't have a winery. They, they, they use winery space at an existing winery. And then we're getting a lot of the younger people now getting involved in the wine scene where, again, they don't have a winery, they don't even grow grapes. They're buying grapes off a, a grower or off a winery, and they've sort of, you know, they've got a wine brand as such. So when I say 100 wineries, think 100... Oh, sorry. If I, if I say 100 wineries, think... Um, 100 wineries and wine brands, okay? The, the, the current vineyard area in Hawke's Bay is around about 4,800 hectares. If I look back over the last five years, that's been pretty static, all right? There's no huge uh, new establishment of vineyards at present, with the exception perhaps of what Delegate may talk about later on. Um, we're pretty much fully planted out. Any, any sort of vineyard development over the last five years has probably been more redevelopment of existing sites, moving from one variety to another variety or, or you know, moving some old plants, taking those out and putting in newer plants. In, in 2022, approximately 40,000 tonnes of grapes were harvested in Hawke's Bay. And if you convert that back to, to bottles of wine, I've seen 10 of them there today, but we're talking roughly 36 million. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a lot. I think one of the things to note about Hawke's Bay is we have the greatest diversity in wine, uh, grape varietals that are grown of any New Zealand wine region. Um, and that's particularly due to our diversity of mesoclimates on our, on our vineyard sites. And many of you hopefully will know, but we are, we are the largest Chardonnay producer in New Zealand. And we are also the largest premium red producer in New Zealand. And, and think Merlot, Syrah, which someone mentioned before. It's good to know people know about wine here. And also Cabernets, the Cabernet Franc, the Cabernet Sauvignons. So, and also sometimes known as the Bordeaux sort of wines. In terms of some value to the Hawke's Bay wine industry, you know, just basic sort of maths on those, num on those bottles means we're generating an estimated $300 million to the economy, and that's just in straight, direct bottle sales. Um, 
I think there's a, a lot more you could think about in terms of indirect, which, you know, haven't really got a number on that. There's an ex estimated $50 million worth of ex export output. That figures from New Zealand Wine. We, we, we sort of estimate there are 900 direct wine sector jobs in Hawke's Bay. That reflects, in fact, though, that there's actually a high degree of uh, mechanisation now in the vineyards. You know, we're doing, in the, in the old days, things like uh, leaf plucking and picking of grapes were often done by hand. So you needed lots of bodies to make that happen. Um, we've now got technology and machinery that, that does a lot of those jobs. So there is actually quite a high degree of mechanisation now on our vineyards. But that's still a lot of jobs. You think that's people physically working on the vineyards, it's winemakers, it's, you know, admin people working for wine companies, it's, it's uh, marketers, it's, it's, a, it's quite a lot of people when I think about that now. And I think the other thing, we, we, are, we are seen as brand champions for Hawke's Bay. Okay, we, Hawke's Bay wines are premium positioned. We're, we're, we're seen as a premium producer of wines. And that has a halo effect for the whole sort of brand Hawke's Bay. Which, and I'll lead that into something to do with tourism in a minute. You know, the, the connection with tourism is actually really intertwined now. Um, you know, Hawke's Bay's destination positioning is all about New Zealand's food and wine country. So wine is right in there in terms of that positioning. We've got more than 35 physical cellar doors. So again, it's not the 100, 100 wineries, but we've got 35 of those wineries or wine brands have cellar doors. Quite a number of them have restaurants as well. So you've got that sort of that food and wine connection again. And we've actually got a really well-developed wine tourism ecosystem. Particularly now, I mean, the development of the cycleways has been huge over the last five years. You know, we've got tours going on all over the place. Uh, we haven't got too many cruise ship visits as of late, but, you know, prior to the last few years, that was actually a really well-developed um, part, part of the scene. So some of these numbers, I mean, they surprise me, but 62% of New Zealand travellers associate Hawke's Bay directly with wineries slash wine. So 62% of, of our domestic sort of visitors think that. And 30% and of Australian sort of visitors associate Hawke's Bay with wineries and wine directly. So again, they're, they're, they're quite big numbers. So again, we're... You know, wine is very much intertwined with that sort of brand experience, Hawke's Bay. Now, this is a, this is a really important sort of a connection for me. Um, one of the government agencies I worked for in my previous life was actually the Ministry for the Environment. So I've got a very big connection with sustainability. Uh, New Zealand wine have, have, have sort of... Uh, launched a program back in 1995 called Sustainable Wine Growing New Zealand. And we sort of know it as SWINS, and in fact, it's good to see the general manager of SWINS here as well, which is really good. Thank you, Ed. Um, and it is widely recognised as a, as a, as a world-leading sustainability program. And it actually was one of the first to be established in that sort of wine, in the wine world. And it's come on leaps and bounds. I mean, I've been growing for 15 years, and I remember when I first got involved with you know, the, the, the swins auditing, and I thought, oh my God, this is just terrible. Um, as a grower, it was just so, uh, such a drama, to be honest, and, and the technology and the systems that they had back, I mean, I started, say, back in 2006, I mean, it was just a, an absolute drama, and, and I know at the grower level, many growers just thought, this is bureaucracy gone mad. But over the years, it has really developed and really stepped up, and, and in fact, I was saying to Ed this morning, for, from my point of view now as a grower, it, it's actually an inter integral part of my business as a, a as a wine as a wine grower, and, and B even as a winery. You know, it's something you do think about, and it's pretty pretty key. Oh, I've got to move. Okay. Okay. Very quickly, let's go. Um, latest the latest report that we that we've done. Eighty one percent of vineyards. This is a New Zealand wide, but the, the Hawke's Bay experience is 
is certainly these numbers, if not slightly more. 81% of vineyards undertook specific activities to promote soil health. So it's a, it's a big thing for us. Soil is really important. 46% of vineyards reduce the use of herbicides. I, I can vouch for that myself. That's what I've been doing over the last five years, trying to re reduce that use. 23% of vineyards reduce cultivation. 18% of vineyards are trialling some new inter-row plantings to sort of increase that diversity and biodiversity in the vineyard. 64% of vineyards are applying soil nutrients in response to tests, to, to specific soil tests. I've loved the connection with soil and water, because I think, again, you can't separate those things. They, 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 they go hand in hand. So just touching here on water, 97% of vineyards who irrigate optimise their water applications. Interesting for me, I actually dry farm my vineyards. I don't irrigate. Never irrigated. So it's not an issue for me, but I know all the guys who do irrigate do it very carefully. 92% of wineries, this is the wineries, have initiatives to conserve or reduce water use. So it's a big thing. Sustainability is a big thing in the wine sector. Whew, I'm going to have to move quick here. Vineyard geography. Just really quick, some really key messages for you guys here. Oh, yeah. Yep, we can do that. I won't go into the detail of, I'll go into one slide detail of sub-region. Vineyard geography, and, and some of the speakers already have touched on some of this issue in respect of what it is they do, but there are limited sites where grapes can be grown for, for quality wine production. Climate, soil, and water are three of the key considerations. The quality vineyards in Hawke's Bay are generally located on free-draining soils of low to moderate fertility. Vineyards are generally not located on the most fertile soils of the Heratonga Plains. And most, you know, if I look at the vineyards here, I mean, the shading there does, does sort of indicate where they are, but vineyards are located over gravels, shingle along the coast, the Gimblet gravels, which I'll touch on next, bridge par, triangle, and on the inland river terraces, which is where my vineyards are. Just want to touch on the Gimblet gravels quick and then we'll fin and, and finish off with a, a summary. It's on the Heratonga Plains. It was the Narrowroa ri riverbed until it changed course in 1867. It is really delineated by its soil type. It's stony gravels with, mixed with a bit of sand and a bit of, a bit of sandy loam. It is a very warm sub-region in terms of Hawke's Bay and benefits from those, those, the, the stones in that area and, and absorbing and then radiating heat from them. 850 hectare area and it's pretty much fully planted in, in grapes. 90% red grapes. It is a really internationally recognised wine region. And, and a quote here, it's, you know, from James Halliday, who, he's an Aussie, but it's not just a very special parcel, it is a sacred site, and that is in terms of wine growing. Now, I'm just going to quickly buzz on to a summary here and leave you with this sort of message. Hawke's Bay Wine, it is a very established industry with a positive future. It's a significant contribut contributor to the Hawke's Bay economy and is a significant part of the Hawke's Bay experience. Uh, grape growing is very site specific. It depends on climate, soil and water. Suitable land, like Mike's touched on as well, suitable land is actually finite and limited. And to maintain and grow, and, and to maintain and grow the wine industry, the Hawke's Bay wine industry, soil suited to grape growing must be protected now and for future generations. And I'll finish on that and leave you with that slide. Thank you very much. Sorry to have to cut Neil short and put pressure on him, but we're just not going to get to the end of the day. I want to give everyone a fair crack at it as well. So, hey, Neil, thank you very much for what you're doing and the leadership role you're showing for the industry that is so important and really adds such colour and vitality and, indeed, pleasure to, to living in Hawke's Bay and the brand that we're able to share with the world. So look, again, uh, uh, an appropriate token of appreciation
uh, for what you put together and the time you've taken to do that and share that with us. We're now going to hear Thank you. from a delightful character that I've had the great pleasure to work with in my professional uh, career, uh, Dr. Ring Ringasami Balasubramanian, um, commonly known as Bala, who isn't able to be with us today, um, and he's self-isolating as well. Um, I'll let Bala speak for himself. He, he is, uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy his presentation. There we go. Thank you, Neil, for the overview. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and fellow audience. Thank you for the opportunity for delegates to share its story on its establishment in the Hawke's Bay region. My name is Bala and I'm the regional manager for Delegate based in Marlborough. Delegate is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year, established in 1947 by the Delegate family, which is today run by Jim and Rose Delegate. Jim and Rose Delegate's vision was to create a global super premium wine company and we are on the path to achieving this goal through great teamwork by all the members of a delegate. Achieving the goal is reliant on four key success factors. They being establishing a world famous brand, producing a super premium quality wine with exclusive supply and good global distribution. Delegate established Oyster Bay as a global brand and has created great distribution channels and routes to market. Equally important is the supply of grapes to produce the wine. Today, Delegate has grown 22 fold in the last 21 years with its key exports to the US, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and Ireland. Premium wines are an expression of the vineyards where the grapes are grown. Oyster Bay is a single tier brand which has chosen Hawke's Bay and Marlborough regions to express the virtues of cool climate viticulture. Delegate through its Oyster Bay brand is taking New Zealand to the world markets. Delegate chose Hawke's Bay as an area suitable to grow Bordeaux reds and Pinot Gris and Chardonnay for sparkling wines. We do not grow these varieties in Marlborough. Hawke's Bay provides a unique soil and climate which suits the growth and production of Merlot, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay and Syrah and other Bordeaux reds. Of the six New Zealand Oyster Bay offerings to the world market, three of these are produced in Hawke's Bay because of the unique soils and climate. Delegate established its current vineyards in the Hawke's Bay region in 1993 with its first plantings in the Gimlet Gravels. We also invested in the Crown Thorpe region to capture the essence of the sub-region. Today, we have 163 hectares planted in the Gimlet Gravel area and 526 hectares in the Crown Thorpe region. We further intend planting 311 hectares in the next few years. Our expected growth is to reach an excess of 1,000 hectares in the Hawke's Bay region. Delegate first established in the Gimlet Road and then in Highway 50 properties and gradually expanded its holdings as shown in the map 
here. And these areas are marked in the border red color. The reason for selecting this region is expressed by many others, uh, including Neil, on why Gimla gravels are an important subset uh, of the Hawke's Bay region because of the unique soils and its properties. It has got stones interlaced with silt and sand and also provides a very warm soil condition suited for the growth of the Bordeaux Reds. They have low vigor sites and produce mines and grapes which enable the production of purple and black colored wines with good wine texture and desirable tannin characters. This slide shows our establishment in the Crown Thorpe subregion. And this subregion provides unique cooler conditions for the production of uh, Pinot Gris wines. The areas marked as one and two are established vineyards, and three and four are yet to be planted in this subregion. Oyster Bay Pinot Gris is much suited for this region because it ripens slowly and develops flavor intensity and produces some beautiful aromatic characters which are typical of this particular varietal. In the last 11 years, Delegate has increased its production by 3,000 tons. This is a phenomenal growth for this region by delegates, and we produce currently in excess of 500,000 nine litre cases of wine to take to the world market. What is also very phenomenal growth for delegate is in the five key world markets that we export to, 14% of Pinot Gris of New Zealand wine sold and 69% of Merlot sold and 37% of sparkling wine sold in these markets are occupied by Oyster Bay sales. The following three slides illustrate the key positions at Oyster Bay hold in the world markets. We are number one in both UK and Australia in the premium category of New Zealand wines. And we are amongst the top 10 Merlot sold in the USA. And we hold number one position of New Zealand's Merlot sold in Ireland. And of course, we are number two of the New Zealand category. And so far as Pinot Gris, again, another success story. We are the number one Pinot Gris, the imported Pinot Gris, by the way, sold in the USA. And amongst the top five uh, in the Australian and Canadian markets, and we are number one in the British Columbian market, which is part of uh, Canada. We are amongst the top five of sparkling wines sold both in Australia and in New Zealand, and we are amongst the top ten in the UK market as well. Over the last 20 years, Delegate has grown to be a world leader in Oyster Bay. This has been achieved through the many staff members who have aspirational goals to be part of this leader brand. We have currently 448 permanent staff, 
and we employed 1,021 seasonal staff to date. And in the Hawke's Bay itself, we have 31 permanent staff and 100 to 300 seasonal staff and contract staff in various operations. We spend 15 million operating expenses, expenses and have invested over 215 million in capital investment in the Hawke's Bay region to date. There are a lot of intangible contributions we make through visitors, company staff, and tradespeople, not to forget the amount we also spend through legal staff and planners in the region. Many of you traveling on the Napier to Hastings Motorway would see the prominent feature of the Delegate Winery, which is based in the Evenden Road area. This was, this winery was commissioned in 2016, whilst construction started in 2015. Today, it processes up to 6,500 tons of grapes our vineyard plantings are expected to increase by 400 hectares to meet the planned sales growth targets. The winery has the capacity to process up to 20,000 tonnes and the vineyard areas uh, can grow to produce up to 1,600 hectares of fruit to meet this future target. Our growth in the Hawke's Bay region is predicated on various factors. These include the stability of the region, creating opportunities for sustainable growth, the region's support to suitable regional plans which enable growth and development, suitable land being available. It is so important that land that is destined for primary production be protected going forward, adequate labour being available. We are in many ways are the problem in some cases. We have created so much growth within the region that it has created the need for labour and all subsidiary industries, which in turn has created the need for housing. So we are, in fact, in many ways, people who have created the challenges going forward. However, it is so important that we work together to meet these challenges with a comp without compromising on foregoing the highly productive re land areas within the plains. Delegate itself has a plan to grow sales from 3.6 million cases to 5.1 million cases over the next seven years. This would be a phenomenal growth for us, which requires not only suitable land, but also adequate labor as well. The other important needs going forward would be good transport infrastructure, port facilities, and the availability of water and power supply. If, as forecast, the population of Hawke's Bay is to increase by 50,000 to 2052, then one of the biggest demands would be the need for municipal water supply. It's so important that thought be given now to meeting the supply needs. However, in meeting this need, one should think very carefully about not restricting what water is available to the primary producers at present and into the future. 
as much as environmentalists do not wish us to build reservoirs and dams across rivers, we have to think how the Clutha project has enabled the production of many areas in the Otago region to develop because of the water supply that's currently available to them. It is also important that national and regional policies are made in consultation with all those who are impacted by such policies. Today, we have many national policies and regional policies which are coming in to us thick and fast, and we are struggling to keep up with such changes within short periods of time. It is so important that central government communicates and interacts with those people who are affected by such policies before they formalize them. There's a big need for a change in mindsets of planners. It is so important for such planners to have a better understanding of producers' needs and limitations when these plans are formulated. Our future in the region can only proceed if we can work together collaboratively in meeting each other's needs. In summary, I would like to say the unique soils and climates of Hawke's Bay need to be protected. Hawke's Bay is New Zealand's second largest wine region. It is important that all policies and both regional and national are enable such growth to take place within the region. Hawke's Bay is so important to delegates for its future growth. Delegate represents over 15% of the Hawke's Bay wine production. We intend growing this in the future. Maximizing the value of Hawke's Bay soils by producing super premium branded wines and taking them to the world is a success story. It is important to understand that we cannot export soils. It is the virtues of those soils and what it produces that can contribute to not only regional but national economic growth. It is important, therefore, for all the politicians, policy makers, and the people of the land to realize the potentials that these areas can deliver and maximize such potentials. Thank you. Unfortunately, I will not be here to take questions and therefore, please direct your questions through the chairman, and I'm happy to answer them in time by proper means. Well, thank you, Bala. Um, and I'm sure you all were most informed and uh, entertained by that presentation from Bala and the great success story that Delegate has been. Uh, and the very substantial investment that it has made. I keep on forgetting to take this off uh, in our region. The next Bounty of the Plains session uh, is again a duo, and uh, we are firstly very uh, privileged to have uh, Ross Wilson from uh, Ag First. Uh, Dr Rachel Kilmister sends her apologies, and Ross is uh, presenting in her place. Ross is a horticultural consultant with Ag First specialising in apple production. He has undertaken work for uh, New Zealand Apple and Pears over many years to collect data and information relating to crop forecasts, labour needs and financial monitoring and advises uh, to many apple and pear growers within the industry. My notes say that he advises too many people, uh, many apple and pear growers <laughs> within the industry. I think that that was a, a slight typo. But maybe it feels like too many people at some, at some points. Please join me in welcoming. Uh, 
Thank you, and apologies from uh, Rachel for not being here. Um, and apologies from me if I don't do Rachel's slides uh, full justice. Um, certainly don't want to see that one for very long. So, um, looking around the room, uh, there's a few faces from the Apple industry that I recognise, but there's a few faces that uh, are not from the Apple industry. So, uh, my purpose today is to give you an overview of the Hawke's Bay Apple industry so you have a really good understanding of where it's at and where it's going and how important this region is to the New Zealand Apple and Pear region. It's, uh, it's no fluke that the Hawke's Bay is the largest apple and pear growing region in New Zealand, uh, currently accounting for 66% of the planted area. Uh, Nelson uh, next at 25%, Central Otago at 4%, and we have a, a growing region up in Gisborne that's currently sitting at 2%. But the Hawke's Bay is by far and away the biggest region, two-thirds of the apple and pear area in the Hawke's Bay, uh, and it's a very important industry for this region. Just to give you a few statistics, in the Hawke's Bay uh, in 2020, there were just under 6,800 hectares planted area. There were 153, surprisingly low number, of export growers, 24 pack houses, and the crop produced in that year was 47,000 tonnes for domestic consumption, and just under 400,000 tonnes went export. Why Hawke's Bay? Uh, well, uh, Rachel's put it that, 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 that I'm sure there are no particular order, but the Hawke's Bay climate is one of the best in the world for growing apples and pears. There's no question about that. It also has, uh, and, and I've done some work uh, internationally, so I know what the likes of South Africa and Chile and Australia, what sort of soils those guys are dealing with. The soils that we have here in the Hawke's Bay are elite. They allow us to produce very high levels of productivity, very high levels of quality. But it's not just those things, it's the water availability, it's the fact that Hawke's Bay has a deep water port, it's the infrastructure that's been built up over time and the technology that has surrounded this region. Another bit of statistics just shows you in the world scheme of things in Apple and Pears how small we actually are. New Zealand, this is New Zealand, produces 0.5% of the world's apple production only 8% of the world's apple production is actually exported from one country to another. Uh, so a lot of countries are self-sufficient or doing, growing a lot and, and consuming a lot of their own. New Zealand accounts for 4% of global apple export market, but the big statistic for us is that 68% of what we grow every year is exported to 80 markets around the globe. This is the New Zealand industry, uh, to give you some context, has been ranked by the World Apple Report as the number one producing country in the world for a number of years. And that's a ranking that's made up of all sorts of things, but the climate, the soils, uh, and all those sorts of things that we've got to produce the crop is obviously a very important part. The figure on the right hand side, a little bit hard to read, um, but the little wee uh, words that are in the middle of the, um, uh, is that the pointer? No, I don't know what the pointer is. On the right there it says, look for New Zealand apples. It's actually a measure by the USA EPA authority of the residue levels on apples and pears. And these particular studies show that New Zealand consistently is one of the countries that's exporting apples and pears with one of the lowest residue profiles on it, one of the, uh, uh, and, and that's, that's through a lot of work that's happened in our industry over the last 20, 25 years to get to that position. That just hasn't happened. And that's a big competitive advantage. This is just showing you this next slide, the growth in export value. 
Since 2012, it's been impressive. The apple and pear industry in New Zealand has the last decade has been a great run. Um, and you can see the growth, that's the growth in uh, millions of export value. That's a 7.5% compound annual growth rate since 2012. And the last measurement on that graph is 900 million, just under a billion dollars of export revenue from the New Zealand apple industry. The industry itself has a, had a target to hit the 1 billion in 2022. Unfortunately, we've had a poor crop in the Hawke's Bay in 2022, so we might not get there because of the climate extremes this year. But the, the, the actual target uh, for the industry by 2030 is to take that to $2 billion, uh, which is you know, in line with those uh, increases that you've heard talk about from the New Zealand uh, Rural Inc. story as a whole. But a lot of the growth, uh, yes, we will need to grow into new land, but it's important to note that a lot of that growth has actually occurred within the apple industry's current footprint. So there's been a lot of increase in the product value. That's driven by a lot of product, new varieties going into new Asian markets, paying premiums, uh, transitioning into more productive growing seasons, uh, growing systems, sorry. Uh, big uh, technology drivers in the pack house and a big move to on-orchard accommodation, which was raised by the last speaker. This next graph shows you the growth in land, uh, in value versus land area. Quite an interesting graph, that one. The blue line is actually New Zealand's planted area in apples and pears. And you'll notice back in 1997, it was 16,000 hectares. Um, back then was 1,400 growers. Uh, it dropped. There was a period where the apple industry had some pretty tough times. And a lot of uh, you with grey head in the audience will actually remember those tough times. Um, but since 2012, we've changed a lot. We used to be a duo culture. There's been so much change happened. And then you've got the steady 3.5% area increase. That's the blue line gradually going up. But look at how the, uh, the orange graph, which is value, uh, has grown at a much bigger rate than the planted area. That's the value per hectare has been increasing substantially. This shows you how New Zealand ranks uh, by a couple of our major competitors in the value of our product. So this is uh, dollars per kilo on the left hand side by time. The blue line is New Zealand, the orange line is Chile, and the grey line is South Africa. And you can see the premium that New Zealand apple and pears extract from world markets uh, over our competitors. By the way, we are also a high cost producer, so it's very important that we maintain that premium. And the table off to the right, if you can read it, um, shows you the value that's been extracted from the various markets from New Zealand in 2020. And you'll see there's quite a big range from the top one there of Japan at $6.34 per kilo right down to Germany at $1.78 per kilo. And it's, not, uh, it's also not a surprise that the top uh, 10 there are all the Asian markets. That is definitely where our growth is coming, the growing affluence uh, within those Asian markets rather than the, uh, the EU, the UK and the USA which used to be our traditional markets. New Zealand's a high cost producer. We can't produce what the rest of the world is producing. Uh, we always must have a unique offering and a high quality offering. And that means that we've got to play the fashion game. We've got to be growing uh, the latest and best varieties. And so I think uh, the New Zealand industry, that's a, that's a shows you a change in variety mix since 1951 quite an amazing graph, and even in the last decade, that variety mix change is very substantial with now a lot of plantings of apples very suited to the Asian palate, that's big, red and sweet, 
things like Envy, Rocket, Dazzle, uh, all those sorts of varieties are the ones that you'll see being planted out there today. Not only do we have to change variety mix, but also there has been a lot of transition to more productive and even robot-ready platforms. So the, uh, the, the image top left is what we were doing 30, 40 years ago. I see Philip Martin's in the audience. He'll remember trees of his looking like that. Uh, and today we're moving to much more intensive systems and even moving to what called a robot-ready system. That's a system a bit like growing grapes, actually, where, uh, where the canopy is very, very narrow. Uh, the crop is easily um, uh, taken with a camera and potentially harvested by a robot. And when and if that ever happens, that will transform our industry. This is a good slide, I love this slide. This shows you that growers on the, uh, this is a New Zealand graph, but it's, uh, it's equally uh, relevant in New Zealand. Growers productivity on the land that they farm has been increasing uh, quite phenomenally really. So the, uh, the blue line again is the planted area uh, and the, uh, the orange line there is the export tons. Notice how they're both growing at quite different gradients, which just shows you the productivity is increasing all the time. And the table on the right-hand side just gives you a comparison as to where New Zealand sits in productivity with the rest of the world. We average 61 tonnes per hectare off every hectare that we farm, whether they just be newly planted or one year, two year or mature. Uh, the next one down is Chile at 41 tonnes per hectare and poor old India sits at seven tonnes per hectare. So it just shows you how, uh, you know, what a real competitive advantage we have in the apple and pear industry in New Zealand. While there's all this technology going on in the field, you've also got a lot of technology happening in the pack houses. Um, and, um, and you'll see the spectrum uh, picture there is, is an automatic defect sorter, so more and more pack houses these days are using camera technology to sort out all defects, including these days infrared technology that can actually look at what's on the inside of the apple and grade out any apples that have got internal browning disorder. Um, yep, going well, I think. Purpose-built accommodation, this is something the industry has had to take on board and it's had a massive investment uh, and has had to be enabled to do that, but um, there's been a lot of investment. We need RSE labour to harvest this crop and to grow with this crop, well, any itinerant uh, migrant labour we need, and those are sort of some examples of the investment that's going on uh, on site to house these people, so to not take up uh, residential housing in our, uh, in our cities. The projected growth. So this is the growth for the industry. You'll see uh, that we have got a growth target. We have got markets that want our product that are prepared to pay for our product. And the growth target that New Zealand Apple and Pears are putting out to you as uh, regulators and decision makers going forward to take the Hawke's Bay area from currently about 7,000 planted hectares up to 9,500 hectares, another 2,000 new hectares, to increase productivity on those hectares, but to drive export value from the region, from this region, not just from the country as a whole, of $1.1 billion. Uh, permanent workers of 3,500 and seasonal workers of 11,000. That's a, that's, a uh, that's a lot of good economic growth and a lot of families uh, that are reliant on this industry if we can get it to grow. So future considerations for this particular meeting, uh, the industry does want to grow, it has been growing in the Hawke's Bay at about 3.5% per annum increase in land use. Uh, to do that, uh, we need to be able to do that on these elite soils with good water. Uh, if that's not available, the growth will stop or move elsewhere. Uh, we've got to continue 
with our purpose-built accommodation on site, and we've got to continue to increase capacity in our pack houses and cool store. Thank you. Oh my goodness, I mentioned our rock star uh, pip fruit and uh, viticulture and horticulture industries, and you've really shown that you know number one competitiveness rankings four years in a row, 7.5% compound growth. I can remember the trees coming out you know, 10, 15 years ago, and, and yet here you are, 12.5% value increase on 3.5% land area increase. Just fantastic. Uh, it really is an absolute tribute to an incredible industry and such an innovative one. Um, thank you for sharing those insights with us uh, as to the value of what we can sustain through our productive soils. Ross, again, a bottle of wine and a bar of chocolate. It's a small token, but uh, given with... Uh, I'll, make, I'll make sure Rachel gets the wine. <laughs> okay, that's it. She, she might leave you with the chocolate. Um, okay, and then the uh, last speaker for the third session is John Evans. John is manager and director of RJ Flowers, a family-owned and managed fruit operation in Twyford. The family ownership proudly dates back to the 1906, and a number of family members are actively involved. RJ Flowers grow 80 hectares of excuse me, apples, pears, and kiwi fruit, and have a pack house and cool store facility. Welcome, uh, please, John to the stage. Well, a, a very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as, as mentioned, um, my name's John, and I'm here to really share the story of, um, <clears throat> of fruit growing for us in, in Hawke's Bay. Um, it's a story of resilience and hard work. And um, we're based in Twyford. Um, as mentioned, we've been farming uh, some of our land since 1906. Um, I feel that we have a very strong connection with the land. Um, we've currently got four generations of our family living in Twyford. It's something I'm very proud of, and I'm also very aware, you know, the, the significance of it. Just of interest, these photos, my grandchildren uh, showing, showing the produce that we've picked. And then uh, that truck is, um, was my wife's grandfather's truck. He had a nine-acre orchard that he, he brought up his family of four on. So pretty, pretty privileged to have that. <clears throat> the Heratonga Plains, um, it's an incredibly rich resource. Um, obviously... It goes back a long, long way, and but in recent times, essentially, you know, it's floodplain, developed lands, uh, rich soils, alluvial soils, um, and of course, we've come along, and you know, the plains have been subdivided into to relatively small parcels of land, and um, I guess that's really the journey that we've come to at this point, um, and of course, there's some. There's some bounty, if you like, some fruits of our, of, you know, our, our toils. Um, and I'm really chuffed to show you that, um, you know, we grow <coughs> apples, pears and kiwi fruit. Um, and, you know, we're very pleased to have that diversity. It's, a, it's an incredibly important thing for us. I just would like to share some, some historical photos and, and land use in our operation um, this is my father-in-law, back start in the 60s, growing, growing onions. And um, he had to be very creative. Um, and so that equipment there, there, a lot of it is built, in, built by, by him. Uh, also, this, this shows a, quite a story. Um, the top left photo there is my great-grandfather. Apparently it was taken around 1910. And he was a dairy farmer in Twyford. Um, some other photos there, my grandfather, my dad, and then more, something more recent. So I'm really proud, you know, to, to have and be able to carry forward, um, 
you know, the legacy of our, of our family business. The Triford area, um, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've got an incredible, um, obviously, soil, amazing climate, and really good access to water. Those are three huge things for us. Um, you can see, as mentioned, that um, obviously drainage is an essential thing for us um, and it's something we're, we're sort of learning the hard way essentially, but fundamentally it's very, very important. Um, subsoils, um, we tend to have a fair bit of variability, but in essence um, we can work our way around that. Um, these are just some photos of our, of our orchard at home. Um, pear trees and flower, and some apple trees with some um, netting above. The varietal mix, as mentioned, we grow apples, pears, and kiwi fruit. Um, we, um, <coughs> we grow produce that goes to Wattie, so we've got Bruce down here. I've had a long relationship with Bruce and also um, the legacy of, of supplying fruit to Wattie's. We're with Turners and Growers, uh, Zespri, and fresh max, um, and some photos there of the produce and the jobs that we do in our orchard. Um, there's a lot goes into it, and um, you know, that's something that I'm you know forever aware that in the end, um, to get the best outcomes, you've really got to be very attentive. Um, detail is essential, you know. So, lots of learnings and. Um, you know, going forward, I think um, a really neat positive story. Uh, soil management, some shots there that can show um, things that we do in our orchard. Um, but basically, you know, we have predominantly a silt loam. Um, we have some gravel ridges, um, and these these take some challenges, but essentially there are tools to, to mitigate the risk. Um, we've uh, ventured into some post harvest facilities and here is um, some pictures of our operation a cool store and a pack house the, um, the cool store we've, we've been very fortunate to invest in CA technology and that's giving us some amazing outcomes which we're very very pleased to have uh, the people, the staff side of it, you can see there's a, there's a lot of people in that photo. Um, you know, New Zealand has a strong reputation for quality and food safety, and, um, you know, it's reliant on having good people, um, being able to do jobs on time and, and effectively. Um, there's been quite a shift, we feel. Um, it's obviously everyone's talking about the availability of staff, um, but it's becoming more and more difficult to secure staff, particularly staff that are prepared to work in the day outside in the elements. This is where the RSC uh, program has really been an amazing win-win for, for New Zealand, but also for the Pacific. Um, we... Uh, in 2020 built an accommodation facility uh, on our orchard and um, we could see prior to that, you know, it was like having a, a pack house and a cool store. If you didn't have them or didn't have access to them, you were very exposed. So it's been an amazing thing for us. These guys are just incredible people. They are just, you know, it, it, actually it's a privilege to have them, you know. Um, and so they treat this as their home away from home. It's a big thing for them to be away from home, um, but with strong support, pastoral care, and to live in a place that's warm and dry, you know, these guys appreciate just what, what's been done. And finally, um, I said this was quick. So, you know, we take, or I take, the responsibility of being um, a caretaker of the land, you know, very seriously. Um, literally, I'd like to think that someone in our family will, will pass or take that baton forward. Um, the soils are a, we really are the engine room of our, you know, our business. Um, 
Healthy soils is fundamental. So we're always thinking about, about our soils because in the end, um, without good healthy soil, what do we have? So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, and again for sharing these uh, stories which really bring the whole purpose of this conference to life. You were admirably brief. I will be as well. Could you just all join me in thanking uh, John for <laughs> After this next and most informative and indeed important session, uh, which I know our next presenter has spent a lot of time putting together uh, and with considerable um, experience and knowledge of his subject to, to, to back it. So as you walk back to your seats, can I introduce our next and final presenter before we'll have a, a brief panel uh, session with some questions, uh, maybe one or two from the floor. Uh, Philip Brown has over 30 years of experience in planning and resource management for the last decade as a consultant and formerly as a senior manager in the public sector. His broad experience covers all aspects of planning work including preparation of district plans and private plan changes and resource consent applications. Philip's current work and past experience includes a number of projects where the planning implications around highly productive soils have been a central issue. Philip is an experienced witness and regularly appears to present evidence at council planning hearings and appeal hearings in the Environment Court. He also acts as an independent uh, hearing uh, commissioner. So the topic for this session is framework for decision making. It's all about planning. Philip Brown, welcome to the stage. Please uh, join me in welcome. Thank you, man. Um, the graveyard shift. It's not quite sure what I did to deserve that, but. Uh, here we are. Uh, it'll be a bit like a game of two halves. Um, half my material has been taken by other people and half of you might fall asleep in the last session, but we'll see how we go. So this is going to be a, a planning perspective really, so um, probably a little different to some of the stuff we've heard so far. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of the national level stuff around protecting soils as a resource, the local context, uh, the decision-making processes that are important here, changes that are on the way, and then really wrap it up with some conclusions and observations from my perspective as a planner. So first, at sort of that higher level national context, um, some of the stuff you've seen before um, in terms of just providing a little bit of context. Um, one of the things I would say is it's no coincidence really that um, urban centres are establishing in the same pieces of land that are so highly valued for production because uh, it's got flat contour, a water source is available and uh, the, the, the productive nature of the land of course provides a resource that's available for um, the city. So just looking at uh, a few of the numbers, um, I don't want to dwell on this too much because uh, I, th I think the sort of issue has been uh, noted so far but what I would say is that, as well as just the, the growth of urban centres, um, one of the things I think is important is that last point around rural residential growth, so basically lifestyle blocks, which have doubled in the, uh, the seven year period from 2002 to 2009. And that's actually a really important thing as well. The other thing that's uh, in these numbers, which I think is a useful observation, is that the, the rate of land that's being gobbled up, if you like, for urban expansion is, is moving faster in the higher production, high productive, highly productive soils than it is in sort of agricultural land generally. So there's two main pressures I think. Um, firstly it's just urban expansion which is um, just taking land at you know, what's really quite an alarming rate and um, that sort of pressure on the fringes of the urban area um, mainly from lifestyle blocks, so you know within the rural land, but um, lifestyle land uses and uh, the reverse sensitivity issues that go along with that, which I'll cover. So the, the pressure is really being created by a, a chronic issues with housing accommodation and affordability, um, rapid pro population growth, particularly with um, immigration in the last sort of couple of decades, 
um, changes in housing choice for people. So um, a preference for lifestyle blocks in one sector of the market, a larger floor areas for houses. So um, the idea of the McMansions, which you may have heard, heard about, but New Zealand has one of the highest gross floor area averages in the world for housing. And uh, a really important issue here is the, the sort of government focus on enabling urban growth, which we've seen more recently. So just looking a little closer at some of those drivers at the national level, um, there's been changes to the RMA. So um, this, uh, the, the part here that I've identified is an amendment to the functions of district and regional councils, which now specifically talk about ensuring sufficient housing capacity um, in terms of housing and business. Uh, that's something that's been added in in 2017. And the government, as you, I'm sure you know, has produced um, national policy statements on urban development, um, one in 2016 and an updated version in 2020, which have explicit requirements for enabling urban growth and development capacity. Um, so the, the way national policy statements work, which is kind of important to understand, is that um, statutory plans, so regional plans and district plans, must give effect to national policy statements. There's no choice uh, there. And uh, when consent authorities are considering resource consent applications, they must have regard to those national policy statements. Um, the statutory plans, uh, there's, a, there's an ability in national policy statements to require statutory plans to be amended, and um, there's even a an ability for those to be amended without going through the normal plan change process. So it's a very directive. So um, I guess my observations in some of these, um, the way that this has contributed to a problem, um, I think at the RMA level there's a, a lack of clarity and direction. The legislation is really quite weak in protecting highly productive soils. There is no real national planning framework in the same way there are national policy statements dealing with urban development capacity. And because of those things, the scales have been tipped in favour of increasing urban areas rather than protecting highly productive soils in terms of the RMA and national policy statements. Um, it it isn't, hasn't always been like this. Uh, this is uh, an ep excerpt from the Town and Country Planning Act in 1977. And one of the matters of national importance specifically talked about the avoidance of encroachment of urban development on and the protection of um, land that has high actual and potential value for the production of food. So we've kind of dialed things back from, from back then. Um, the, the RMA does deal with it, but in quite a generalised way. So um, the purpose of the Act is to promote the sustainable management of natural and physical resources. It's not explicit about how that occurs. Um, it talks about managing the rate at which you use resources, um, protecting them for sort of the future. Uh, it does mention soil in terms of safeguarding life supporting capacity, but it's, it's quite, um, it's not a direct reference. It doesn't actually direct you to do anything particularly. These are the matters of national importance, um, or these are the, the things that national, that um, the RMA deals with in terms of what's called section six, so the matters of national importance and uh, protection of highly productive soils is not a matter of national importance in the RMA. Um, it, there's been a preference to move towards more of a sort of an effects-based approach to managing resources, which hasn't been particularly helpful, and as I've said, it really left, leaves us with a, a weaker legislative environment, which makes it harder to resist um, resource consent applications, really. So the, the, only, the only place it's kind of... Um, uh, alluded to probably more is in uh, section 7 which deals with other matters so it does talk about the efficient use and development of natural and physical resources and any finite characteristics of those but it, again it doesn't explicitly deal with the issue so just dropping down really to the um, the Heratonga Plains and more of the local context um, so you know it's, I think you're all pretty uh, uh, clear on the issues around the soils it's obviously a very highly productive landscape um, this is the, a diagram that was previously shown, but it just really illustrates uh, the darker green is the land use category one soils, and then all the way down to red, which is the, the least productive soils, and it's just a ring right around the Hastings area and Havelock North. Um, 
obviously in the um, Hastings example and using the district plan, these are some of the matters that are actually outlined as uh, an explanation of issues in the local area. Um, talks about the economy being so um, reliant on the soil and um, the, the climate and water availability obviously as well and that the, um, the resources of the district need to support uh, future generations because of that, that soil resource. Um, one of the things I was kind of fascinated with when I looked through the district plan was the definition of versatile land. Um, when I first looked at this, I thought, this is incredibly vague. You could drive a bus through this. But the more I thought about it and the more I looked at some of the case law, I thought, it's almost like accidental genius. Um, the only thing that really is the, like the meaning of the definition is the bit in red, which just talks about the, the Heratonga Plains, really. Um, then it goes on and say, well, what, the, what that does in terms of how it acts, and then the things that it are based on. And if you look at those list of um, matters that really are, are seen as sort of almost criteria for basing versatile land on, it does talk about the higher quality soils, but they're not directly part, in my view, of the definition. So what, what that does is it sort of elevates things to a policy level, and it means that when you're dealing with individual resource consent applications, um, you, you don't really have to, the, the policies will apply so long as it's part of the Heratonga Plains. It doesn't, re, you don't really have to get down to the level of detail about talking, well, what's the soil on a particular site? Um, these are some of the objectives and policies from the Hastings District Plan. Uh, I won't read these out, but there is a very consistent theme around protecting the soil resource, um, protecting it from ad hoc urban development, um, ensuring it's not compromised in any way or fragmented. Some of the other pressures that sort of go along with that, um, reverse sensitivity I think is a really big one that um, is always going to apply in situations like this when land is expanding into rural areas and also the need to provide for some of those supporting activities that we've heard about, uh, transport depots, cool stores, rural industries and their seasonal worker accommodation. A couple of the last speakers really talked about that in a lot of detail, which was helpful. So reverse sensitivity is a sort of a, a planning construct. I'm not sure how much people understand about that really, but um, it's about people moving into these rural areas and then complaining about the noise of tractors and frost fans and you know spray drift and other things, and the way that might constrain um, the sort of legitimate rural occupations um, and operations that occur. And obviously that can, it can constrain those activities. So there are some ways to address reverse sensitivity. Uh, Hastings has chosen this really kind of cool concept, I think, of the right to farm approach. And when I kind of think about that, it's really just like suck it up, is, is the way I sort of look at that. Um, and there's actually some, you know, quite clear uh, policies and descriptions in the district plan about how that would work uh, and you know the fact if you move into an area you, you can't really complain about it you just have to accept the normal operations that occur in those areas. Um, there, there are some sort of caveats to that I think. Uh, case law has really said well yeah we, we kind of accept that to a point um, and you know you can manage those activities that are coming in but it, also, you have to accept that um, you know, adverse effects of the activities themselves should be internalised as much as you possibly can. So it's not um, reverse, the right to farm idea is a way of dealing with reverse, sensi uh, reverse sensitivity, but it's not a, a total solution, I think. Um, just touching on the supporting activity, so again, the, the, plan, the Hastings District Plan does recognise and make provision for some of those industrial activities and seasonal worker accommodation. And there's a couple of um, excerpts from the plan. Um, that's, that's not universal across the country. A lot of other district plans don't do that. So it is, it is quite forward thinking, I think, in the way that um, that's drafted. The regional level um, just meshes in really nicely with the, the district level. So there are very similar um, policy framework in the regional policy statement and some of the regional plans that also um, recognise the soil resource and talk about uh, protecting it and uh, avoiding urban expansion on it. And it's, um, it's probably qualified a little bit, I think, where this, the top uh, policy talks about the retention as far as reasonably practical, which the district plan doesn't say. So um, slight difference, but, 
basically there's a very consistent theme running through the sort of the planning framework at a local level. Um, and, and one of the ways that's been given effect to in uh, the Heratonga Plains is the uh, sort of the uh, collaborative regional spatial planning approach. So um, the regional council, Napier and Hastings, have produced um, HPUDS, a you know, very glamorous name for the Heratonga Plains Urban Development Strategy. Uh, that's, you know, just basically a, a planning, a spatial planning approach to manage growth uh, across the, the area and protect the soils at the same time and it specifically identified some urban expansion areas, which I think is a really good way of dealing with things. So um, in my view on some of the solutions here, you, you really do need, I think, a strong local policy direction and an emphasis on strategic planning at the higher level, and I, I think that's in place. Um, you basically need a supporting, balanced and clear national policy framework, and that's not in place. There's a big void at that level. I think in terms of the way you would expand urban areas um, across the plains uh, would be to really look at um, focusing on some defendable urban boundaries. You don't want to give rise to greater pressure in the way you expand. So um, just hypothetically, just looking at how that might work, this is just an example um, of a you know, theoretical urban area and on the, the middle panel up there is where you might choose to sort of expand that urban area. And the sort of distinctive thing there is that you've only got a, a quite a small length of urban edge or new urban edge because there'll always be pressure to jump the fence and just expand those urban areas. The, the right-hand side example is an alternative area that you might expand into which has a much um, greater uh, urban edge and that just builds more and more pressure. I think as far as possible uh, you need to think quite carefully about the way you would expand urban areas. It's not just about picking you know, the, the quality of the soil as the only criteria and just going where the soil is poor. There's, there's much more nuance than that. And I think defendable urban edge is a, is a really key concept. So moving on to um, decision making and the things that are important. Uh, so uh, obviously with all planning processes in New Zealand, there is quite a, an emphasis on public participation and community involvement. So there are a number of ways that that can occur. Um, submissions on district and regional plans um, and on plan changes, which is kind of the you know, individual parts of those that are changing. Uh, feedback on draft strategic planning documents like HPUDs. Um, you can lodge submissions on resource consent applications. And I think in this whole area, uh, there is a really important place for lobby groups. They can be very effective because they're sort of speaking with a unified voice. So growers associations and industry groups. Um, it's getting a little detailed, but in terms of resource consent decision making, some of the factors that are important, um, you know, what's the application say, what sort of case is it putting forward, what do people say in submissions if there are any submissions, um, what are the adverse and, and, and positive effects, and can some of the adverse effects be mitigated in some way by, you know, mechanisms that the applicant is putting forward. Um, what do national policy statements say in, in this situation, you know, we, they don't say anything really about um, highly productive land, but they do say plenty about urban expansion. Um, there's the district and regional planning framework, which is important, and you know, are there sort of any particular circumstances of an application that are instructive? Uh, relevant case law, what I would say about case law is I don't think it's generally that helpful, um, unless it's within the same district, and the reason for that is that mainly case law interprets um, district plans, definitions, policies. So as soon as you transfer to a different district, you've got a whole different set of provisions, and so there, there's not a nice sort of clean um, break. Um, but, you know, if you do have consistent case law in an area, uh, that really can provide a lot of support for your policy base, and it can act as a deterrent as well. And I think, um, you know, from some of the evidence I've seen in terms of uh, the cases, that, that seems to be the, the situation here. So just really quickly on some of the case law, um, the Bunnings case from 2011. Um, one of the arguments put forward there was that the soils aren't versatile and therefore the policies don't apply, and I think that's where that definition comes in, um, is really handy. Um, the other thing I'd say here is that throughout all of this, the, the court decided that um, the effects in terms of the, the versatile soil resource were insignificant, 
and that's because you're only dealing with like five hectares of land. And you can make that argument every single time, and basically applicants are always making that argument, that each time it's just a drop in the bucket, you know, there's no real um, difference. Uh, and the, the Ensley Cottages one, which is another example, this is slightly different because it was lifestyle blocks um, rather than sort of a, you know, the Bunnings situation. But again, I think the key point here is that um, it was agreed, uh, the court said that, and it was agreed amongst the expert witnesses that the effects of the proposal were no more than minor in a, in a sort of, in the circumstances of the particular case. And that's just because you're only always dealing with a relatively small proportion of the overall soil resource. Um, so that's really where um, my next point is that the policies become key because if every application that comes forward, um, there's going to be, everyone's going to be agree that the individual effects uh, aren't significant and that's one of the issues you have in the resource management area that it's very effects based, then your policies are going to be pivotal because they are the thing that does deal with that cumulative effect over time. You know, if you lose 1% of your soil resource each year in 100 years, it's gone. And it's the policies that kind of take account of that, that moving forward and, and over time. Um, I think it, it's really important to place a lot of emphasis on, on the policies of a plan, and that is something that, it, in my, um, you know, my observation, is, this, is definitely the case down um, in the local area here. So uh, the other sort of decision making that um, people might get involved in is plan changes. That's different to the resource consent application level. It's much broader and much more robust. Um, the, the way that the system works is that council has to do an evaluation of costs and benefits um, under section 32 of the RMA, and that looks at a number of different options and the, um, you know, what are the costs and benefits of each, in, including um, the risk of acting and not acting and sort of all the economic parts of it. Um, it will consider any sort of national policy statements, but um, in this case there aren't really any of those, and whether it's sort of an efficient and effective provision. Uh, there'll also be always a consideration of effects and sort of like a quadruple bottom line of environmental and economic, social and cultural effects. So there's some other things as well. I've mentioned previously about section 30 and 31, which are the, the, the functions of regional and um, district councils and how those have been changed to really put an emphasis on urban growth. And um, there's also a need to consider any policies and objectives that are already in your plan, including some of the sort of non-statutory documents like the HPUDs. So just thinking about moving forward a bit um, and, and what's kind of next. Um, the good news is that there's some help on the way here really because there are some changes in the pipeline. Uh, there's RMA reform which is coming and there's the um, proposed national policy statement for highly productive soil, which is well overdue. So just uh, firstly on the RMA reform, um, the government intends to um, repeal the RMA and replace it with three separate pieces of legislation, Natural and Built Environments Act, Spatial Planning Act, and the Climate Adaptation Act. And the, the primary replacement for the RMA will be uh, the NBA, so the the National and Built Environments Act. It's the most significant sort of reform in the resource management space that we've had since the Act was um, brought in in 1991. So um, the RMA reform, and particularly the National, uh, the Natural and Built Environments Act, um, takes quite a different approach. So it's not really having the same emphasis on um, assessing effects and whether the effects are minor. It identifies, um, or it's trying to promote positive environmental outcomes and it identifies a number of environmental limits and it's looking to improve recognition of te ao Māori. Um, so in terms of timing, those, uh, those two, the MBA and the SPA, are proposed to be introduced into Parliament before the end of this year and then we'll go through the normal select committee processes uh, to be enacted next year um, before the election is the plan. Really interesting is that one of the um, environmental outcomes that's proposed in the, at least the draft um, Natural and Built Environments Act is uh, kind of back to the future, promoting the protection of highly productive land from inappropriate subdivision use and development. So much more directive uh, than we've seen under the RMA, which in my mind is a great thing. Uh, so just a, a little bit more, but I don't want to go into too much detail about these. There will be a national planning framework that the government will produce, which is trying to uh, identify how you sort of manage the tensions between 
the environmental outcomes. Um, so that's going to be particularly important in trying to manage the tension between um, protecting highly productive land and providing for growth of urban areas. Every region needs to have a natural built and environment plan and um, each region must also have a long-term spatial plan. So the, um, the national policy statement uh, in terms of its timing, it was, um, the, a draft came out, I think someone said a thousand days ago, so yeah, second half of 2019. And uh, it's, it's identified to come into, um, you know, come into effect in the latter half of this year. I've heard July, but we're already in July. Uh, it's been delayed, I think, through COVID and other priorities for the, for the government, but obviously it is, it's on their agenda and it's an important issue. Um, it has objectives about managing or recognising the benefits of highly productive land and managing its use. And um, I think it, it's going to be a particularly important in decision making around resource consent and obviously plan changes as well. So some of the things it does, it requires mapping by, um, of highly productive land by regional councils and the default position until that occurs is that class one, two and three will be protected. It's looking to, um, because any national policy statement, again, you must um, recognise the suitability of, you must recognise the, the national policy statement when you're dealing with plan changes and have regard to it when dealing with the resource consent applications. Um, some of the things it won't do, it won't look at highly productive land within existing urban areas and it won't look at highly productive land within areas that have been identified as future urban zones in district plans, so that's kind of an important carve out I think. Um, it, it looks at uh, so, some of the ways it is proposing to manage it is with setting minimum lot sizes and addressing the issue of reverse sensitivity. So uh, as a planner, my sort of observations and perspective, um, what I would say is it's just it is a really difficult area. Um, resolution's not easy. There's a, there's a really significant tension between urban growth and protecting land. Um, what I would really uh, sort of emphasise, and this is something the Minister for the Environment has said, is that the, um, the national policy statement isn't going to prohibit um, expansion or loss of um, expansion of urban areas onto highly productive land. It's going to be a little bit more um, detailed than that. So uh, I'd say that these changes that are coming, particularly the national policy statement and the changes to the RMA are going to be very helpful in this space. Um, it's interesting that we have gone full circle now between, um, you know, from a more directive legislative background previously through to um, the RMA, which was more effects based and now looking to go back to where we started, I suppose. Um, what I think the national policy statement for highly productive land will do will sort of provide a counterweight to the national policy statement um, for urban development and balance out those arguments a bit better. At the moment you've sort of got one that's just getting a lot of emphasis and one that's a bit of a void. I think that's going to be really helpful. Um, I've mentioned about the case law, I don't think it's that, that helpful really unless it's within the district in which case it's really helpful because it just you know provides a, a deterrent I think. Um, Applying some sort of qualifiers to your, your policies, again, I'm just generally thinking uh, that's not helpful because it brings the, the level of debate down to resource consent application level rather than where it should be at the sort of more robust and inclusive plan change stuff. And the, the right to farm uh, is something that's, again, useful but doesn't deal with the issue in its entirety. Uh, I think the strategic planning approach that has happened down here is, is a key tool and you know HPUDs or whatever's going to take over from that is actually really very useful. Uh, I like the idea of an evidence based approach um, with soil and constraint mapping which now the government is saying you, you have to do but basically it's been done here anyway and to a pretty high level. Uh, there's a need in my view to maintain those supporting activities for the efficiency of the sector so particularly the seasonal worker accommodation which is you know, COVID has made that seem very much more important than previously perhaps it was seen as, and all the, the things that allow the land to be productive, like um, those supporting industries. And uh, just on this part, I would say that my view, the, the current approach in Hastings is actually well aligned with the impending changes that are coming, and 
probably unsurprisingly, given how important the issue is here, is, is probably leading the country in many ways in the way these things have been addressed. Um, in terms of answers, I think at least partially the answer uh, to urban expansion is a much more aggressive approach to consolidating urban areas and um, having a sort of a more compact urban form. And, you know, there may well be some resistance from people in urban areas, but in a situation we've got in this location, then I just think you have to be a bit more aggressive about that perhaps. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, factors that are going to go into deciding where you expand. It's just more than just the soil. It's definitely more nuanced than that. Some of the things about urban boundaries that I've talked about, but a whole bunch of other factors that are important as well, including things like water and climate and other things. Um, and a point that I think is quite key is that your policies need to be very clear and very direct, and that the decision making that you have out of, you know, the decision makers councils should be consistent. And again, I think, you know, there is a history of uh, a number of different cases here that have been dealt with, with um, most of them coming out on the on the side of protecting soils. So this is my last slide, and um, it's kind of just like addressing the, I suppose, the overall tension and, and where, that, where that sits. And, you know, there, there is a really compelling case for exp expanding urban areas and providing more housing. And, you know, partly I heard one of the growers say, well, you know, obviously we need people to support these industries and markets for these industries. It's, it's, that's really important. Uh, but also the, um, you know, once lost, the highly productive land resource is gone forever. So again, it's really important to, to manage that too. So when you're looking at the balance, I would say that um, in the circumstances of the Heratonga Plains, you know, maybe there is a case for having, tipping the scales a little bit in favour of preserving the soils. You're going to need to deal with both, but it's um, a really key issue because the soils are so scarce on a national level and so important for the for the local economy. So. Thank you. It's me. Well, thank you, Philip. You've drawn a lot of threads together uh, very comprehensively and I think probably answered a lot of questions for people about how what we've heard today uh, from the growers and, and, and from the industry uh, and from the experts uh, you know, it does come together in, the, in that planning context and the way it gets addressed. What we're going to do now is we're going to have uh, something in the nature of a uh, panel discussion. Uh, one of the panel members, Dr Clothier, will be joining us virtually. Um, and uh, Philip, you're uh, here with me. Um, Dan, you are welcome to join us on the stage if you'd like. I might even tap on your shoulder from down there if one of the questions you feel free to answer. But come sit over here. Okay, so I've got a series of uh, questions here which I'm going to, uh, with a bit of licence, um, reduce, I think, to, to, to some of the core propositions. And I really want to, uh, I guess, cut to the chase here. There's two questions I'd like to ask, uh, and looking at all of the, the different planning frameworks, Philip, you're probably best placed to, to answer this one. We've heard about, uh, right from Nahiwi at the beginning, about heading for the hills. Um, there's going to be a new plan review, uh, a new uh, Kotahi plan coming out of the Regional uh, Council. Is it time within the versatile plains, uh, within the, the Heratonga plains, to ban housing development, to prohibit it? Do we need to go that far? Uh, that's a bit of a tough question. Um, I would say no is my answer. I just think you, you can't prohibit something so that it can never happen. I think it's, there's a lot more balance to it. There will always be circumstances on the plains, I think, where um, it might be appropriate to have some housing. Uh, it just needs to be very carefully thought out. Uh, the existing policy framework in the plan, and no doubt the plans to come, I think are going to place a great deal of primacy on preservation of soil, and I think that's appropriate. But I think an outright ban, like a prohibited activity, is probably a step too far. Um, the other thing I'd say about that is there's a kind of a social dimension to it as well, which I've seen in other areas that I've worked, that um, you, people would have grown up in a town over generations, 
and then to say to the next generation, sorry, we're closing the door, you can't live here anymore, um, you're going to need to move away somewhere else, I think is a really tough call. And that's something that you have to factor in in these, in these issues as well and reconciling them. So, Thank you. Just I'll, I'll go to Brent and Dan on that in a moment. Are there any other examples in New Zealand where um, a, a prohibition stance has been taken? I know you can prohibit activities under the RMA. The uni Auckland Unitary Plan talks about avoiding uh, encroachment onto elite soils, but it doesn't, as I understand, actually prohibit. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, just to say that, um, you know, the way I would look at that is that uh, avoid is kind of the strongest policy message you can send, but I would see that as being... Um, aligned with perhaps a non-complying activity, which means that you've got to pass through, as you will know, well know, um, a gateway test around effects on the environment and you know whether it's something that's contrary to the policies. I think as soon as you set it up in that way, then it's really hard for applications then to, to get over the line in terms of uh, effects on the environment, um, in, in terms of cumulative effects, but particularly the policy um, area because it's so, it's so clear in the plans that it, that would be really difficult. Um, these sort of debates about urban expansion uh, probably need to happen at the higher level in terms of district plan reviews. And so, you know, my, the ideal I think would be that you're not debating these things in terms of individual resource consent applications. They're dealt with through things like spatial planning over the region and then incorporated into the district plans about where it's appropriate to expand urban areas. Uh, Brent, are you uh, with us? Have you got any reflections on that question? Can you hear me? Yes. Did you hear uh, the question? Yes, I did. Kia ora. Sorry. Well, no, I'm, I'm not sorry. I can be with you. You're glad I'm not there. Um, um, I'm feeling fine, by the way. Uh, no, look, I don't have anything. I, I know there's a lot of work be, uh, gone on... Um, uh, up and up with the Auckland Council, uh, but not specific details. Dan, do you want to comment on this from your perspective? I don't want to make any comments from a planning legal point of view at all, but I would make a comment from a logic point of view, and that is that if you're going to do something sustainably, the qu first question has to be, if I'm going to carry on doing this, can I do it for a thousand years? And if you can't, then it's not sustainable. So I work with farms who have a strategic plan. Cornwall Horticulture, for example, have a, a strategic plan of 500 years. River Sun Nurseries in Gisborne has a strategic plan. They run everything through, can we do it for 1,000 years? Yet we seem to think in three-year cycles and hope like hell that we don't get done in the next six months. So logically, we can't keep expanding. So I think we're looking at the problem in the wrong way. All right. Of course, you see, the, the legal planning answer probably sounds to a whole lot of people like um, you know, loopholes and grey areas and fudge, but um, appreciating where you are coming from there, Phil, another question for you is um, you, you mentioned, I think, that New Zealand has one of the highest sort of square, you know, floor, square metre floor areas per, per dwelling in, in, I don't know if it was the OECD or what it was, um, and you also said that we need to be more aggressive in our approach to consolidating urban areas. A point I made earlier is if we're going to urbanise, let's do a decent job of it. Is it time to think, uh, is it time to get rid of minimum lot sizes? Have maximum lot sizes? Um, I'd, I'd certainly support getting rid of minimum lot sizes. I think um, density, the problem you have is if you have a minimum lot size, is everyone builds to that and then they build the biggest house they possibly can within that minimum lot size. I think a better approach is to get away from a, a density control in urban areas and just have um, a control that deals with the bulk of the building and then you can split that up into as many you know, dwelling units as you, as you can. What that does is that provides a better spread of housing stock, so you get like more smaller apartments uh, for different sectors of the market and then you're using your land more efficiently because smaller households, they can get a one bedroom apartment instead of having to have a three bedroom home on a larger site because that's all that's available. So yeah, I think um, definitely there's room for some changes in that area and I would also see that the, the design of buildings is really important if you're looking at intensification and there probably needs to be some design controls 
for a, lo a lot of the intensification that occurs if that's not already the case here. Thank you, Philip. Look, now the next question probably is more Brent and Dan's uh, territory. It's related to the script that I've got, which is this notion that I've heard uh, and uh, come across in my own practice, the idea that perhaps you can move soils um, so that you can develop in one area and, and, and put it somewhere else um, and, and you don't lose the, the net productive capacity. I have a question from the floor uh, where uh, one of the gentlemen with us today had been told that there was 100 feet of alluvial soil between the Nararoro and the Tutaikuri rivers. Uh, would there be any possibility of extracting that and spreading it over elsewhere on the plains to lift mediocre to good orchard land? So, translocatability or something. Dan, thoughts? That's like scraping your <coughs> bum off and sticking it on your face. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, that's yes. a great image there, Dan. Yeah. There's, there's a little bit more to soils than that, and they form in place, they form over a long period of time, and they're very, very complex things with different layers and different life and different things going on inside them. And when you dig them up and put them somewhere else, they're not really the same thing, and I think you want to be very, very careful about any such approach. All right, Brent, have you got a comment on that one? Yes, I have, and I fully agree with Dan on that one. Um, the other thing is that did crop up in the, very early on in the Bunnings trial because that was their plan. There was a slight hiccup in the fact that they'd forgot to apply for a consent, one, to excavate, two, to transport, and three, to deposit. So that fell off the case pretty quickly, but it was an element that they had proposed, and, and like Dan, I don't see that as its destruction of natural capital. All right. Um, the, the next question I've got, um, I guess, is related to uh, some of the points that we've, we've, been, we've been talking about spatial planning, Dan, um, uh, over the course of the day. And I mentioned, could you send your maps through? Now, on the idea that spatial planning is a sort of a constraints and opportunities maps, what are some of the constraints that we need to avoid from a uh, sustaining productive soils perspective? Um, and is your sense that there is a, an opportunity within some of the hill country uh, surrounding the Hirataunga Plains when you think of some of the constraints around soils that you're aware of? When you need to, you can do things in a lot of places. And the thing comes down to economics and time. So I've, I've had the privilege of being in Peru in the, the mountains and people are growing their staple crops on things that we would consider Mount Cook. But the production they get from it and the cost of doing that is pretty high. So yes, you can do things. You know, I would sooner stick my house on the hill because then I've got a view and leave my production, my food, on the flats where it's highly efficient. And so the Nahiwi's introduction gels with me in every context. All right. Brent, have you got any thoughts about that? Uh, no, no, I don't have any to, anything to add to Dan's comments there. Philip? Oh, I definitely think you need to look at all options. And, um, you know, in the hills, obviously the soil isn't going to be the same quality. And um, that may well be a good solution to avoid expanding the, you know, the towns over the plains. Um, it's probably just, you know, a, a bit more complex than just moving to the hills because there are other effects that go with that, but I definitely think it's an option that should be considered. I was just going to ask you a little bit about that. Perhaps you could do two things for me, Philip, here. One is just give me a 60-second summary of what spatial planning means to you, and then a 60-second answer on what are some of the other constraints uh, that we would be uh, up against in, in, say, a move towards the hills if, if that was... Um, sensible from a productive soils alone point? Well, in terms of spatial planning, um, it's basically just identifying across a, an area, a geographic area, what should go where, where your constraints and opportunities are. It's the very similar approach to what HPUDS has taken in terms of urban growth, but I think um, what we're thinking about here is something that goes into a bit more detail and looks at some of the other issues. Um, in terms of, you know, this, the sort of constraints in the hills, well, there's bound to be other things like landscape uh, impacts that will have to be considered. Um, there's the kind of, if you go further away from where your centres of urban development are now, then I guess there's the 
you know, the climate change issues around travelling to and from and, and so on and people being more isolated from families and other things. Um, and maybe there are issues around uh, wastewater and stormwater disposal and um, stability and other things. So, you know, a bunch of other constraints to look at, but uh, I think, as I said, uh, really on my last point in my presentation, you know, I think you, you have to look at the resource here in terms of the soil as being something that's, you know, really quite special and, and, and value that to the extent that it should get priority over other things. It's not, it can't be entirely that way, but I think it's, uh, you know, has primacy as an issue in this situation and other things, you know, you, you might go to other places or do things slightly differently here than you would elsewhere because of the importance of the soil resource. Great, well, look, I'm gonna take, thank you very much for those answers. I'm gonna take a bit of um, license here again and take a question from the floor. Uh, there's some very passionate members of our community who have made sure that this uh, I'm going to take one question, and I've already picked who it's from. I'm sorry. Very passionate members of our community who have ensured that the the debate around and the imperative towards protecting our soils uh, is absolutely front and centre for local body representatives. Um, Richard, could you uh, perhaps, if you've got a question, Richard Gatton, that you'd like to put to me, and I mean a question, you might want to share a thought before the question, um, and uh, we'll respond to it in, in, in due course. Just bear in mind, we're keeping everyone from drinks, so, concision. Uh, well, thank you, my name is Richard Gavin, and um, I'm here representing the sorry, uh, Fertile Soils Society. Um, I believe we're the only organised group in New Zealand that um, is making a stand for soils. Um, so we are passionate about um, what we stand for. Um, I, just before I move on, I'd just like to thank the, uh, the Hastings District Council, um, Sandra and Elwyn, for organising this, as well as Martin and the Regional Council. Um, uh, we believe that this symposium is probably 50 years too late, maybe it's 100 years too late, um, and maybe it's because of... Um, annoying, passionate people like us that have perhaps brought this to the fore. Um, we believe that there's really not enough um, thought given to the soils and hasn't been in the past. Um, there's been some bad decisions that all councils have made, not only in uh, the Hiratonga Plains, but all over New Zealand. It's a nationwide problem. And um, probably being a bit extreme, in some people's views, we would like to draw a line in the sand and say no more. And of course, that becomes particularly poignant when you see a map, an aerial shot of the map, uh, the soil maps, and you see Hastings planted right in the middle of the most fertile soils in the world. And um, when you consider that probably the Hastings district covers an area of five and a half thousand square kilometres, which is a big area, we seem to be insist on covering up our most fertile and valuable asset with concrete and asphalt. And we believe it's got to stop. And, you know, the time is up. Enough is enough. And as someone said today, we perhaps need to change planners' mindsets and because um, we believe that in the past planners have had little regard for the soils. Um, what would be a good idea is for every planner to have a soil map planted on their wall and perhaps give a bit more regard to the most amazing asset that we have rather than looking at a little bit here and a little bit there, year after year, which accumulates to a lot over, as Dan said, 100 years. So um, we need to pull our finger out and um, make some changes, not only for us, but for future generations. Thanks very much. Hey, well, thank you very much, Richard. Um, I think we heard the question in that loud and clear. Uh, it was in the nature of a challenge. Um, 
Come on, you planners, get on with it. And uh, I, I would just like to close, and have, before I hand over to, to Rick, um, uh, to send everyone on their way um, with this thought, that what we need, what our communities need, what our soils need, what our region needs, is certainty. We need to make choices, and then we need, having made those choices, to back them. We need to be deliberate about that. If we decide this region's going to have 250,000 people and we work out the sweet spot, the Goldilocks position for those people around all of those constraints and within the great many opportunities, embracing all of the innovation that we've heard about to sustain and protect uh, the versatile plains alongside all of the other resources uh, that uh, both constrain and enable us, then I think having made those deliberate choices, we need to be very firm and clear about it. So if we say to people, that is where you can go, that is where you should go, and then they then ask a planner, should I go over here? The answer, very firmly, must then be no. So um, I think on that note, uh, you've heard so much today. It's been a very rich and deep discussion. I do hope a lot of people who couldn't be here uh, get the chance to watch it. And I think we are all incredibly indebted uh, to the time, experience, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding uh, that has been brought to our attention through the many presenters, uh, our very clever um, uh, you know, coordinating committee have put together uh, for you to be treated to today. So with those words, um, it's been a privilege for me to be here. I'd like to hand over to my esteemed chair, uh, Rick Barker, to say farewell and thank you before a closing karakia from James Graham. Good koto and greetings to everybody. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, put down a couple of uh, data points from me. Uh, I haven't lived in uh, this area all my life, I've lived in other places, and I did own a house in Mahora. The fence was rickety, needed a new corner post, so I got out the shovel like a good uh, t t country boy would do and dug the corner post. I got to about four and a half, five feet, and I was still in black, loamy soil. I couldn't believe it. I'd never lived in a place like this. I kept digging and I put the corner post in. I came to appreciate firsthand that this was millions and millions of years of nature's work. I had never seen soil like it. I wondered, why is my house here? Why is the road on it? Why is it concrete? I could not believe it. The second data point is from Jared Diamond, who is a geographer and wrote such things as guns, germs and steel and collapse. And in his book on collapse, he examines five societies that have failed. And one of them uh, was in Rapa Nui, Easter Island. These were people who uh, James Cook was astounded to find Polynesians in the far-flung outskirts of the Pacific. He could not believe the quality of their navigation. But he realised that they were stranded. Later, anthropologists and others uh, worked out what had happened. Uh, the other society had obviously traded backwards and forwards as evidence of that uh, with their other Polynesian cousins, <clears throat> but it stopped. And in that process, they were building great moai. And to build these moai, for whatever purpose, they needed trees. And they chopped and they chopped, and eventually, all the trees were gone. They had no form of viticulture. And this was the reason for them being stuck, couldn't leave ever again. Diamond said the most interesting question he got was from his, one of his students when he asked, Professor, what do you think the man was thinking when he chopped down the last tree? Diamond said he couldn't explain that. And I think that is a really important point here. Bit by bit, piece by piece, we can justify every tree, justify every new house, and at the end, the head of Tonga Plains, unless we do something, will be covered in houses. Because we can all justify a little piece here. The, the human's ability 
to rationalise its own decisions is remarkable. We can rationalise anything. I'll give you an example. A man recently I met, very vocal farmer, protesting against trees being put on farms, sold out to trees. And he said, well, it wasn't about me. He said, I got an offer so great. He said, I couldn't turn it down for my kids. Really? See, private interest we can put above all else. And I am kind of in the camp that at some point you have to draw a line. But we have to have a philosophy. The, point, the problem we have is that we are making individual decisions about our own individual circumstance. And of course we all have people who want out there have got a block of land, want to chop it up and develop it. Spoke to someone the other day, disappointed the council turned them down. I secretly said, good. <clears throat> but if we continue with this, this is going to be the end of us. What we have to say is these are collective decisions that are important to all of us as a society. And this gift we have from nature of millions and millions of years of effort is something we need to hand on to future generations. And every future house, every road, everything else we put on those soils is less soils for them. And I just think you've got to have to say as a community here at Hawke's Bay, it's got to stop. Will it be the end? Look, you only have to go to places like Europe, Tuscany, where you see every knob and every hill has a village on the top of it and built intensely. Do you see all, of, all the sprawl down below? It's all in horticulture and farming and agriculture. Well, they figured it out. We have a lot of hills here, and uh, here we tomorrow it was exactly right. We have to head for the hills, and also we have to go up. For those who live in Hastings and want to come here generation after generation, we just have to say to them, well, sorry, your parents could afford to have a half acre section, as you did very often in Hastings. You can't afford that anymore because we've got to save the soils. We're going to have to go up. That's the answer. It's all very simple. And I just think we're all going to be very challenged about this. But I come back to it again. If we continue to make incremental decisions based on individual personal uh, 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 values and personal benefits, then we are done. If we're going to make a decision about a community as a society, what's the best for our long term, benefit of all ourselves, and more importantly, what is going to be our gift to future generations, then we'll come to a different decision. So with that, I hope you've all been challenged, I hope you've all been uplifted, and uh, let my view, the boxing match, start on this issue. We've got a long way to go on this, and we have to make a decision and get some finality to it. And I welcome the people who initiated the symposium. I think it's been thought-provoking, challenging, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you very much. And I'm now going to ask to hand over to James. Where's James? Oh, I've got one thing to do. Yes, Martin. It's so carried away. Martin, you've got to come here. <coughs> My thank you to Martin on behalf of all of you. He gets not one but two bottles of wine. and a, a bar of chocolate. And I want to say thank, uh, thank you to Martin. You cheered this really, really well. Uh, uh, I thought your comments were insightful, sharp and to the point, and uh, led everybody along. The only failure wasn't your making, it was everybody speaking too long. Oh. <laughs> so Enjoy your beer. Uh, kia ora tato, uh, ko tato uh, ngā mana wa titi. So um, don't be offended, I've just um, likened all of us to a bunch of uh, mutton birds, but um, <laughs> the, the saying is um, aligned with the idea that, you know, mutton birds from down south there are um, uh, shown to flow, fly annually up to 64,000 kilometres around the Pacific Rim, chasing the, uh, the summer. And so uh, Manawatiti is a reference to uh, endurance and stamina where you have um, uh, displayed that today being here right to the very end. So um, yeah, so we started off with karakia uh, this morning from um, Uncle Jerry Hapuku. And so it's uh, fitting that we close uh, with karakia too. And then in doing so in terms of the co the and the theme of the day in these uh, the Hiritonga Plains, the uh, versatile and precious soils is that, um, and as was shown this morning and reiterated throughout every presentation was the, uh, the connection 
between the land and the Y, uh, or the whenua, the placenta, the amniotic fluid that uh, sustains life um, under the earth and in our mum's wombs when we were all uh, there at one time or another. So just pay homage to the ceiling. If this is your first time in this room, kaupapa i hiritanga is the ma kiri kiri string. That's what that pattern and design is up in the ceiling there. Uh, the ma kiri kiri string flows underneath the town, uh, underneath the opera house, and pops up again over at uh, Windsor Park there where back in the day with these the uh, floods that we had in the 1860s, the 90s and the 20s and, and other man-made uh, obstacles, the Ma Kiri Kiri has forced its way underground. But um, we acknowledge that today here uh, as we acknowledge these versatile stories. So this karakia, just to wrap up, it acknowledges the environment, uh, you know, uh, the air, uh, the land and, and the water. So um, all you have to remember to uh, participate in this karakia at the end is just say, when I say home year, who are year, you say taiki e. Can you all say taiki e? Taiki e. Taiki e. That is like a saying, like when we say hip hip, what do we say? Yeah. So in Māori, when you hear that phrase, home e, hu e, it's a bit like hip hip, then there's the taiki e or the hooray. So, Noreira, um, thanks again to everyone. Uh, he hua nui, he hua ro ki te ao, o mai o ki tua, karongo ki te tai ao, o here taunga. Ko rangi nui e tū nei, ko papatū a nuku e takoto nei. Nau mai te ihi, nau mai te wana. Uhi, wero, tū mai te mauri. Hau mi e, hui e, tāi ki e. Kia ora tātou.